Hi, Council Chamber, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me, Bonnie? Council Chamber? Okay. Andrew, this could be where you come up. Hi, Terry, can you hear me? Kirsty, can you hear me? I heard you. I, I heard both of you. Can Kirstie, anyone hear me? I hear you, Bonnie. <laughs> Kirsty, can you hear me? I heard her a second ago. Hi, Councillor Kirby Young and Councillor Weeb. Can you hear us okay in the chamber? Yeah, I can hear you. And just to note, I'm having to do a computer restart, so I'm joining by phone, but I'll have to switch over shortly. Welcome to okay. TELUS Conferencing. To join the conference, and Same, I'm having trouble logging on my computer. Yeah, just, are you getting the same message I'm getting, Mike? Trouble accessing the, the web app? Kirsty, can you hear me? Hi, I can yeah. hear you, Terry. Great, we're in business. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, Mayor Stewart, it's it's the clerk in the chamber. Um, the technical issue with TELUS has been resolved. Hmm. 
Uh, good afternoon, and I'm going to call this reconvening public hearing of July 14th uh, to order, reconvening from June 28th, 29th, and 30th. <clears throat> this meeting is convened by electronic means, and as such, council members may participate in person or by electronic means. Um, <clears throat> for council members participating by electronic means, uh, please ensure your video is turned on and let the clerk know if you leave the meeting for the purposes of com confirming quorum. Council members are reminded that in accordance with section 14.13 in the bylaw, members must enable their video to confirm quorum. Any member whose video is disabled will be marked absent for that portion of the meeting. If you need help, uh, if you lose connection, uh, we'll get you back online shortly. Uh, we won't be getting to voting today, but uh, that assistance is there for you. <clears throat> Members of the public can view the proceedings via the live stream and YouTube link, which will be tweeted out on at Van City Clerk. We acknowledge we're on the unceded uh, traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Sable Tooth people. Thank them for their uh, generosity to all of us as we move forward building a true a city of reconciliation. Thanks so much to staff uh, for all the work they do. Talked to some uh, uh, street cleaning crews today to thank them for their hard work uh, through a, a, a very busy summer. And uh, I extend that thank you. We extend that thank you to all city employees. Uh, clerks, can we have uh, the roll call, please? Mayor Stewart in the chair, Councillor Carr. Councillor DeGenova. Present. Councillor Fry is on a leave of absence for civic business. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Weeb. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Dominato. Present. Councillor Bly. Councillor Kirby Young. Present. You have quorum, Mayor Stewart. Thanks very much. Um, just so the public know, you may participate by speaking over the phone, submitting written comments to council, or speaking in person. And uh, while speaking, we have five minutes to make your comments. Speakers should state whether you support or oppose the recommendations. Speakers may only speak once and should follow along on Twitter at Van City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting so you don't miss your turn to speak. Any comments and the agenda items can be submitted in writing through our online web forum at Vancouver ca forward slash public dash hearing dash comments. Uh, this link is also on Twitter. Council is committed to ensuring that all people who participate in Vancouver's public hearings are treated fairly and respectfully. The language we all use in public hearings should reflect respect for all residents. No form of discrimination is acceptable or tolerated. Discriminatory language includes attacks on groups of people and individuals. Vancouver's procedure bylaw prohibits council members from the use of words, tone, speech, or gestures that express a negative view of the character of any person or persons of people. Members of the public are, are expected not to engage in improper conduct, which includes the use of expressions that promote hatred or are defamatory. The creation of a safe and inclusive environment for the public, staff, and council to participate is all of our responsibility. Uh, members of council may call points of order if language used by another councillor during a meeting is not respectful. As chair, I will ask the speaker to modify uh, their speech to ensure that they are using respectful language. We also have a long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. So uh, we should address uh, speakers and staff uh, by avoiding using gendered honorifics and instead refer to the first person uh, people by their first and last names, roles, or title. This is a quasi-judicial body today and a public hearing, which means council is only to consider the merits of the zoning application or heritage designation. Council members may ask clarifying questions, but should save debate for after the close of the speaker's list. <clears throat> after the close uh, of the speaker's list, council will approve, a refuse, or refer the application to staff for further consideration. Um, with about 116 speakers on the list, it is anticipated that we will not complete hearing from speakers today during the number of registered speakers. Uh, and so the next reserve date to continue the public hearing is July 22nd. So I suggest the council consider a motion to continue this item on the reserve date of July 22nd, starting at 3 p.m. Would a member of council like to move a motion to this effect? Council so moved. I think I heard councilor. Weeb first, and was it Councillor Boyle second? I, oh. I okay. have information. 
Fair, I'm on the queue for a question. Wait, what, we have it moved and seconded, so we can move into debate now. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young uh, and then Councillor Hardwick. Yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted a, a point of information clarification, if I could. And when you say the 22nd, are you referring to the evening at 6 p.m.? Because I know that that is a Friday night and just three, confirming. 3, three p.m. 3 p.m. Okay, but with the indication that it could continue until 10 p.m. on a Friday night? Absolutely, yeah. 3 till 10. Um, I'm I'm going to speak in opposition uh, to that because um, I don't I, th I have I have not been um, supportive of us having public hearings on Thursday nights prior to a long weekend, which has happened a couple of times, including once recently. And I think that that um, diminishes public access and participation. And I think to do it on a Friday night in summer and any Friday evening is not a good best practice. And so I'm speaking in opposition to rescheduling on that date and time. OK, thank you. Councillor Hardwick? Yes, I'll also speak against it um, for several reasons, not the least of which is that uh, public meetings really need to be happening when the public are available. And that is after six o'clock, not three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, moreover, Friday at the Friday night in, a, in July in the summer, uh, it's just insult to injury. Uh, I, I think it's irresponsible of council to 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 do something like this uh, since it's the public that we're supposed to be listening to. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Councillor Boyle. Um, thanks, Mayor. I'm just wondering um, uh, if I could ask a point of information through you to um, to staff uh, to clarify um, what public what we're using the public hearing reserve on Thursday the twenty first for. Uh, I direct that to the clerks, I think, who are in charge of scheduling these meetings. Clerks, do you know what we're doing on the 21st? Uh, yes, uh, it's the clerk here, Mayor. Um, the July 21st uh, reserve is going to be used to reconvene from July 5th, um, item number six. Can you remind us what that is? Is that the Stainsbury Avenue? Don't we're just so. we're just checking the exact title. One moment, please. Okay. I believe it's three policy reports that we didn't get to. I, I believe that's what that is. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Mayor, um, it's uh, CD1 rezoning uh, 906 to 982 West 18th Avenue and 907 to 969 West 19th Avenue. And it's, it's being reconvened at 6 p.m. on Thursday, uh, July 21st for that public hearing. Is that good to Councillor Boyle? Uh, yes, can, can I um, ask a follow-up? question point of information which is probably also to the clerks which is if we weren't to reconvene on um friday the 22nd um to finish this meeting would the next date um be at 9 a.m or 3 p.m on monday the 25th i don't think so the next available date may be um october so we'll just have to Get the clerks to confirm this because we have a special council meeting called uh, for September, but that special council meeting uh, has a constrained agenda because of the nature of special council meetings. So, but I'll leave it to the clerks to verify uh, for us. It's it's the clerk here. Uh, so we do <clears throat> have a reserve date on July twenty fifth. That's the Monday from nine thirty a.m. to ten p.m. Okay, so um, could could we uh, resume if we don't finish tonight? Resume this meeting um, at nine thirty a.m. on Monday, the twenty fifth. The clerks, um, as per precedent, it'll probably be uh, three p.m. on the twenty fifth. Okay. 
Um, am I able, I know the the initial motion wasn't emailed in, am I able to amend the motion on the floor to yeah. In, yeah. instead suggest that we reconvene at 3 p.m. on Monday, July 25th? Okay, do we have a seconder for that amendment? Second. Second. I heard Councillor Weeb. Okay, so we're on the amendment queue now. The amendment is that we would, if we don't finish tonight, we would come back at 3 p.m. on Monday, uh, the 20, I believe the 25th of July. Uh, Councillor Hardwick? Yeah, um, point A is the three o'clock in the afternoon presents the same problem for the public. So that's on the no side. Um, on the yes side is it's a Monday uh, rather than a Friday. Um, so if there was a way to do this that would not be seen as precedent setting um, uh, for public ability to participate, then I'll support it. Councillor Dejanova? I too uh, will speak in support of the July 25th date, but I just have a point of information. Uh, to you, um, Mayor Stewart, I'm just wondering, did we not, because of the, um, the the prior motion that we passed that created it to be policy, that we have public hearings at 6 p.m., don't we have to suspend the procedure bylaws and the rules, which takes a two-third vote? I'm happy to do it in this case, but I just thought that that was what we had to do to suspend the rules that we've made. I, I just, my understanding is it would be uh, just... <clears throat> this this vote uh, would be sufficient to do that, but the clerks uh, clerks, is that correct? Um, we we don't have to suspend the rules in this case. Uh, the right. um, a reconvening. That's why it's yes, a reconvening. That's correct. Of, that's of, a, of a new hearing. That's why. Thank you for answering the question. Um, I. Uh, well, I do understand that there's challenges, especially uh, for people who work traditional uh, hours to uh, participate at 3 p.m. Uh, I'm concerned that if this doesn't pass, uh, that we will see this move forward on a Friday evening. And I also have raised concerns about that last term. In fact, we had public hearings on Saturdays and Sundays, Council. So, um, I, I mean, for some of the larger items that the I uh, came forward with more speakers, so I will support this and just um, in the interest of, of trying to make sure that um, we include as many people um, as as want to speak and uh, want to watch uh, this item and others in the future. Thank you. That's a lead. <clears throat> yeah, I will be supporting um, the three o'clock. I also recognize that if we have enough speakers, we could allow speakers that work um, to call in after six when we go through the list again. Um, I also believe that there are speakers that work um, the nighttime economy and don't get a chance to engage in public hearings. And I think that as we build the city for all, we need to make sure that we have time slots that allow um, all speakers to have a voice here at council. Thanks. Mr. Dominato. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Through you, a uh, question to staff and or the clerks. And it was just with respect to um, recognizing there's a various uh, council and public hearing reserves in our calendar. Um, I'm curious if staff had looked at Monday, July 18th, um, which would be sooner. Uh, and because obviously the Friday, the 22nd was being proposed, but I'm curious if that was ever contemplated. Clerks, any thoughts on the 18th, July? Uh, currently, there's nothing in the calendar as a reserve for that for the 18th of July. You mean we haven't uh, we haven't uh, allowed a reserve at that time? You mean there's not one scheduled, so we don't have it as an option? Okay, I'll, maybe I'll just note for future is that I think it's a consideration that um, that for going forward uh, that uh, certainly Mondays could be utilized. I know many councils around the province meet on Monday evenings. Actually, traditionally, I know we meet daytime on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, but um, I, I think that we've actually unnecessarily constrained our time uh, for meeting um, for certain items such as this. So I'm not going to move an amendment on it because I think it's going to become too complicated at this juncture. Um, so I will support Councillor Boyle's proposal. Thank you. Councillor Kirby Young? 
Yeah, I just want to say thank you to Council for responding to the concern. I don't think Friday night is a good um, precedent um, or practice, so appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, that's it. So, um, clerks, just to remind us, uh, we're moving to a vote, but the vote is an amendment to the uh, initial motion, and it is to. Could you remind us what the the, the text of the vote? Um, it would be to continue this public hearing starting at 3 p.m. on July 25th. Thank you. Okay, I'll call a vote on this. Councillor Bly is absent, I believe, clerks. Oh, Councillor Bly is abstaining. Councillor Boyle, has he marked his, there, uh, just, sorry, there we go. Okay, that has passed uh, with none in opposition. Great, thanks so much. Okay, uh, we're back to the main queue, so we do have an amended. Uh, clerks, do we have to vote on this again because it was an amendment? Uh, yes, we can do that. Okay, I do have a list of speakers, so I'm just going to go through it quickly. Councillor Boyle, are you satisfied? Do you need yeah, okay? Councillor anything else to say? Councillor Carr, anything else? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I actually am seeking a clarification, a point of information for you. As we were going over the options, um, I heard the clerk say that uh, July 21st, uh, we are reconvening um, for a public hearing item. Um, I have in my notes that we are also um, supposed to be reconvening um, items 7 to 9 from the July, July 5th um, agenda. So I'm just wondering what the order is of that and um, whether we're starting at 9.30 a.m. and going to 5 p.m. Mm -hmm. because we're reconvening the public hearing. And then I'm, I'm sorry, my notes are showing that. Yeah, perhaps I can get the... Uh uh, now that we've passed this, uh, maybe I can get the clerk to send around a um, just an updated schedule until the end of July, so everybody's clear on on what's happening when. Is that okay, Councilor Carr? Absolutely. I think I'd love to see it in written Great. form. Great. We'll make sure we get an email around to everybody with this change. Uh, Councilor Dominato, anything else? Uh, nothing further. Thank you. Councilor Kirby Young? No, hold over. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, then. So we'll, we can have a vote on uh, this amended amendment. Councillor Dejanova, there we go. Okay, that passes uh, unanimously. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, let's see now. Where are we at? We are, I'm just back on the script. We had the motion moved. It has passed. We're good there. So now we're going to move, um, continuing to hear from the public on um, the West 7th and West 8th uh, uh, rezoning application. Uh, there are some folks off of mute, so if you could just double check to make sure I'm mute. Uh, we, um, we uh, before hearing from the public, though, we have staff from Planning, Urban Design, and Sustainability available to at, provide information and clarification to questions based uh, previously received from Council. We have Yardley McNeil here and uh, Chi Chan to uh, provide information. So I am going to turn it over to staff now for their uh, for their overview, and then we will get right on to uh, hearing the public, uh, starting with uh, Speaker 118, uh, Peter Andresen. So over to you, staff. Good afternoon, Council. I'm Yardley McNeil, Assistant Director of Planning for the Rezoning Center. I've asked our staff team for this project to address some of the rezoning questions we've received from Council so far uh, for this application. We hope this will provide some clarity for Council and the public moving forward. A number of questions related to Council's authority with respect to the housing agreement and the operator's agreement, both of which would be developed post-public hearing and prior to enactment should Council approve the rezoning. We will provide a fulsome response on those questions via a memo uh, on these points next week and make that part of the public hearing materials so the public have access to it. Today, we will be providing a verbal response to the remaining questions 
And with that, I'll give you to Chi to provide that information. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Chi Chan. I am the rezoning planner for this uh, application. Uh, staff have received around 20 questions to date from Council and would like to take the opportunity to briefly address the questions verbally. I do note that a more fulsome set of staff responses to this Q&A uh, will be provided for Mayor and Council and made available to the public as well. Please note that Council will have an opportunity for a full round of Q&A with staff, but following the close of the speaker list. We've received questions regarding uh, what type of housing is being proposed, who will live in the building, and what kind of supports will be offered. Uh, tenanting in this building would be done through coordination of housing professionals from BC Housing, Vancouver Coastal Health, the city's outreach team, and the operator of, this, operator of the site, MPA. People from the local community would be prioritized for this housing, as is best practice, and all tenants must meet the income limits set by BC Housing. These units would serve individuals who need support services, as well as those who need deeply affordable housing and can live more independently. Trained support workers would partner with each resident to develop a customized plan to meet their personal and housing goals. Some supports offered inside this building, uh, while others are offered in the local community. Uh, these may include mental health and substance use help, meal services, laundry, health and wellness services, along with connections to education and training to address barriers to employment. The on-site support services will occur in a number of locations uh, in the building outside of the uh, studio units. There is approximately 10,000 square feet of pro proposed for multi-purpose rooms suitable for programs and gatherings, offices and consultation rooms for private conversations, and a communal dining room, laundry rooms, and kitchen. Should Council approve the rezoning, BC Housing and the operator, MPA, would negotiate and finalize an operator agreement with staffing details negotiated as part of that agreement. There would be 24-7 staffing in this building. By way of example, there are a minimum of two staff 24-7 in other similar buildings, and throughout the day, the number of staff increases as staff attend those buildings to provide on-site services and programs. With respect to questions about congregate housing or the concentration of people experiencing poverty or need of support in a single building, this rezoning proposes a residential rental building for social housing with 129 studio apartments. It's not an institutional building. These are self-contained studio units. They have a kitchen and a bathroom like any other rental building. People who will be living in this building could include young people, seniors, people with disabilities, and those struggling with the high cost of housing and substance use. There are a number of similar-sized residential support programs around the city, along with social housing buildings at a similar scale. Both BC Housing and city staff see this as a successful model to deliver this kind of housing. Questions have been asked about practices in other municipalities where restrictions have been applied to supportive housing. Staff can confirm that other cities have applied restrictions around the location and size of social and supportive housing developments. But in Vancouver, there are no council adopted land use policies or restrictions on the locations of housing for very low income individuals or those needing supports. In fact, council's housing policies support delivering social and supportive housing throughout the city in any area zoned for residential use. Questions have been asked about other supportive housing buildings that have worked well and the Marguerite Ford Apartments that have had a number of challenges over the year. There are processes in place with BC Housing, building operators, and the city to respond to specific building-related issues and opportunities, and there are opportunities through Community Advisory Committee and partnerships with other agencies. There has been a long track record of supportive housing buildings in this city that have successfully integrated 
into the community. Questions were asked regarding the, the process for soliciting and selecting an operator for this site. Uh, BC Housing executed a competitive RFP process to select the operator and operator, MPA, in December of 2020 and will enter into a formal contract with MPA subject to the approval of this rezoning application. A question was asked about the legal implications of the Ernst & Young study of, uh, on BC Housing and what they may be, if any implications, for the current public hearing. Staff can, conf can confirm that there are no legal implications generated by that study for this public hearing. Regarding tower massing and shadowing, as outlined in the referral report, the proposed tower does not cast any shadows on Delamont Park between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. between the equinoxes. Further, recommendations in Appendix B of that referral report seek to create a more slender tower and to reduce shadowing on the independent school ground. This makes the tower form more in line with expectations of the Broadway plan and residential towers across the city. As outlined in the referral report, this project is part of a memorandum of understanding for the Permanent Modular Supportive Housing Initiative to deliver 300 units of supportive housing across the city. The number of units on this site are part of the portfolio of projects to deliver these units. With regards to questions about setbacks, Condition 1.3C in Appendix B requires additional building setbacks on both 7th and 8th Avenues to provide enhanced landscape and an improved pedestrian experience. On Arbutus Street, site constraints, including a narrow site width towards the southern end, have resulted in narrow setbacks. However, there is a rezoning condition to expand the sidewalk uh, along Arbutus Street to a minimum of 10 feet. This is consistent with high-density areas around the city, which the Broadway plan anticipates this location next to a transit station to be. Several questions have been asked about traffic safety and the potential for increased traffic volumes related to this development. Social housing developments typically have minimal, minimal parking provided on site, and this development is no different. Future residents are not anticipated to own cars. As such, the site will generate very few vehicle trips and will have little impact on the existing transportation network. Any issues with traffic in the area would not be increased by this development. Engineering staff has also reviewed the operations and safety of the transportation network in the vicinity of the school and the new development on various occasions, as well as part of this rezoning review and in the context of the Broadway subway project. Results of those multiple reviews identified that the local roadway operations and safety have improved over time as a result of ongoing transportation improvements in the area. More information on this will be provided through closing comments by staff. This concludes the, inform uh, the information presentation. As mentioned at the outset, further information regarding the operating agreement and legal tools will be provided later. So thank you very much, Council, for listening. Thank you. And just a reminder, Council, uh, after we finish the speakers, there will be closing comments by staff, uh, closing comments by the applicant, as well as a round of questions from uh, council to staff. So there's plenty of opportunity if you want to send in more questions as you're listening today uh, to do so. Thanks so much. With that, uh, we're going to move on now to hear from the public. Um, just a reminder, the number to call in is 1-833-353-8610, code 106-1445-POUND. Uh, and uh, that number is on Twitter and on the live stream. We have speakers on the line to provide comments on this item. On June 30th, we ended with Speaker 116, so we'll continue now with uh, Speaker 118, uh, Peter and Drayson. Uh, Clerk, is Speaker 118 on the line? Speaker 118 is not on the line. Thank you, Clerks. Uh, just uh, a question. Are you going to keep track of this uh, for me as I go through the list, just in terms of who's been able to speak and who hasn't? Do my best to do it, but if you could, that would be great. Uh, speaker 119 has withdrawn. Speaker number 120 is Daryl Larson. Speaker number 120, Daryl Larson.
Uh, no, not on the line. Thank you. Uh, sticker 121 is Ed Furlan. Just a quick point of procedure, Mayor. Yes, uh, Councilor DeGenova. The public, um, and my apologies if I missed this, but for the public, but also for Council, are we breaking from 5 to 6 p.m.? Just wanted Mayor, to. Sorry, I didn't outline that yet. We'll break from 5 to 6, and then we'll come back from 6 to 10. I will take a brief break, say around 8.30, just to let everybody stretch. The clerks are kind of working flat out through this, so uh, that, that's the plan. Also, a reminder to speakers that if you've uh, missed your turn, uh, despite being called at the end of the meeting, I make three calls for speakers where anyone, even if you haven't registered, can speak. So uh, that is to allow everyone that uh, feels they're affected by this project to have their say. Thanks. Uh, Clerks 121, Ed Furlan. No, not on the line. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 122, Damian Kettlewell. Oh, good afternoon. Hi there. You have up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Uh, please go ahead. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, for having me. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for this uh, for this opportunity to speak and for the the process. Um, and thank you to those elected officials that uh, that uh, take a lot of personal sacrifice and professional sacrifices to uh, to make our city better. Um, it's a very public role and uh, I'm grateful for you for doing that. That said, I am a, a resident of Vancouver, have been for my whole life, uh, and I definitely support uh, helping those disenfranchised, those with addictions and women and children and, and men, of course, who are struggling with homelessness. And I want to see some uh, I want to see some solutions that work. Uh, unfortunately, I do not support this motion. And uh, in light of the news uh, with uh, BC Housing uh, and the uh, really the, the damning report for Ernst and Young, it's hard to understand how the city could uh, could really uh, proceed with a project that uh, where the whole board was just fired um, uh, last I believe it was last week right before the long weekend. So. Um, yeah, the lack of oversight at BC Housing, the lack of controls, uh, the the, you know, some of the conflicts in regards to management, the way decisions were made, uh, and really it just uh, you know, firing all the directors uh, late on a Friday afternoon, letting everybody know is this doesn't provide me one iota of confidence, unfortunately, in BC Housing. We know that their, uh, their budget has tripled uh, since uh, the current provincial government came into play uh, and um, you know really it's just the lack of confidence uh, in the in the provincial agency there has been some uh, some comments from some folks that the, uh, the that the federal funds to support uh, initiatives like this would go away but um, two members of Parliament Joyce Murray and Talib Nor Hamid have both said that, that that is not the case so I hope that our elected officials are not uh, intimidated by uh, potential threats from the federal government or potential allegations that this money might not be there. Uh, and so, really, um, I think it's a very unique. Uh, it's a very unique neighborhood, and it requires a unique uh, solutions. I do support uh, supportive housing that uh, that takes care of women and children, and uh, listens to the to the uh, to the local residents. So really, um, I would be incredibly disappointed if this motion was approved, uh, because uh, you would say as elected official that you um, that you can really um, support a provincial agency that arguably is one of the uh, largest. Uh, the provincial government has done a relatively good job in these difficult times, but this is one agency that is it's a bit of a dumpster fire uh, itself. So um, thank you for your time. I hope that uh, that you make the right decision. I know you will have confidence in you all. And thank you for all you do for Vancouver and for uh, and for bringing forward uh, supporting motions that really support women and children and support motions that uh, that really help us address the, uh, the homelessness crisis that we face in our city. Uh, but really we wanna solve problems for seven generations. We just don't want a Band-Aid solution which is what this is. It was thrown together uh, quickly without a lot of engagement. And the, unfortunately, BC Housing, uh, it has a whole new team. And I'm sure the next proposal that they bring to council will be much, much better. Thank you for your time. Have a great day.
Thanks so much. I, I don't see any questions for you, but uh, do thank you for calling in. I am going to move next to uh, speaker number 123, Jean uh, Chisholm. Jean Chisholm. Hi there. Thanks. Hi. Yeah, please go ahead up to five minutes. Yep. <laughs> sure. Sure. Thanks. Uh, this is my first time calling in, so um, I really appreciate um, being able to take the time to speak. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, Jean Chisholm, and my partner, Corey Wintemute. Uh, we have lived together in Kitsilano for 11 years now at Six and Cypress, just two blocks away from the proposed project. Uh, and we are here to voice our extremely strong support for the project. Um, I trust that Council is already well aware of the dire need for this kind of housing in Vancouver broadly and in Kitsilano specifically. We have people here in our neighborhood that need this housing right now. Um, I also want to mirror some of the other supportive comments on really what a reasonable, common sense proposal um, this is from MPA, um, and it really feels like a natural and necessary expansion of the services they already offer in Kitsilano at their 7th uh, and FUR headquarters just five blocks away from the proposed site. Um, this project also feels appropriately forward-looking and will offer much-needed safe, stable housing and services as the Broadway corridor continues to evolve and densify. Um, I did just want to respond to some of the comments uh, I've been hearing, both in these public hearings and in my neighborhood. Um, I'm particularly confused by some of the opposition statements that this project is not a good fit for this location under the guise that we live in a family neighborhood and therefore should not offer single unit homes or that we should prioritize women and children. Um, this is confounding to me, given the apartment building that I live in. Just two blocks away is vast majority one bedroom or bachelor suite, as are the four other buildings on my block. Uh, I'm not sure if my concerned neighbors are aware, but this block probably houses 100 single people or couples, and we are very much a part of this community. Um, and we also have families that we love to spend time with in our neighborhood. Uh, I'm in absolute agreement that we need more affordable family housing. We need more of every kind of housing, but to reject this project or limit this project because it will only house um, single people, um, again, feels absolutely confounding to me. And just one of the many bad faith arguments that we've had to listen to in this now 20 hour public hearing um, alongside outweighed concerns from shadows and its proximity to a fully gated and secure private school. I am disturbed at the troubling culture of exclusion and oppression that's being expressed in my community. Um, my building has been sent postcards opposing this project that has misleading and flawed information on them. I have been stopped multiple times uh, in the street by people petitioning me to oppose this project. And while I can respect everyone's right to express themselves and voice their concerns, um, I would just like to kindly ask my neighbors to uh, stop this behavior if they can, because it is quite simply annoying and makes our neighborhood unpleasant to live in. Um, but I would also like to ask City Council what your role and responsibility is in communicating to the public the need for these kinds of projects. It is part of your city mandate to address the housing and homelessness crisis in our city. And whenever common sense, well-considered neighborhood appropriate projects are proposed, projects that have funding and that are ready to go on an empty lot, no less, these projects face a wave of opposition and bad faith arguments. Uh, aporophobia is described as a strong apathy, aversion, or hatred towards people experiencing poverty. As the city claims to stand against discrimination and oppression, what is council actually doing to foster communities that practice care, empathy, and have a basic understanding of the structural causes of poverty? If this council is actually invested in addressing poverty and homelessness and providing support for those with addiction and mental health needs, there needs to be significant improvement in how these kinds of projects are communicated, how communities are educated, and how processes like this are managed. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Again, I would strongly ask council to support this project in addition to addressing a dire need. I truly believe it will actually make our neighborhood a better, more caring place. Um, and I also strongly ask Council to reflect on what their role is in creating the kind of culture where these life-saving projects can actually find support in their communities. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much for following in. I don't see any questions for you, so I am uh, going to move uh, to the next speaker, who is, uh, but thanks so much for your participation, uh, Speaker 120.
for Sean Nardi is next. Speaker number 124. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Council. You can hear me okay? Sure can. Up to five minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Sean Nardi. I live in Vancouver. I oppose the CD1 rezoning 2086 to 2098 West 7th Avenue and 2091 West 8th Avenue. I live a short distance from the site. I am a former parishioner of St. Augustine's Church. I have friends that teach at St. Augustine's School and friends who live in the neighborhood. So I'm familiar with the site, the neighborhood, and the proposal. While I strongly support recovery-oriented housing, I also support genuine, responsive public engagement that respects the wisdom and insights of neighbourhoods instead of dismissing them. I support good governance and decision-making that is based upon facts and data, not political expediency, and I support solutions that are based upon proven success and the best research available. This proposal and the process followed to achieve it observe none of these principles. I'm sure you've already heard plenty about the myriad fa failures of this proposal. It will create extensive shadows, not only over St. Augustine's Elementary Schoolyard, but also Delamont Park across 7th Avenue. I'm sure you, you all remember that the Broadway plan did propose loose plans to expand and renew Delamont Park, a popular play spot in this dense, human-scale neighbourhood. If you approve this rezoning, Delamont Park will find itself shaded by this building for most of the afternoon during our darkest days from October to March. Staff won't tell you that. Unfortunately, the flaccid solar access protections in the Broadway plan do nothing to protect St. Augustine's schoolyard nor Delamont Park during these darkest times of the year. And neither the city nor BC Housing has thoughtfully considered the concerns of Santa Maria House, which helps vulnerable women flee violence and recover from mental health and addiction issues, and which is located adjacent to the proposed development. Santa Maria has advised that none of the feedback it provided was contemplated in the proposal you are considering today. But most disheartening is the fact that contemporary research demonstrates that the model upon which this development is based won't help the very people it is intended to help. Dr. Julian Summers, a clinical psychologist and researcher at SFU, has performed extensive research into addiction and mental health issues, including the 20 years of success that Portugal has enjoyed in treating drug addiction. Over the past six months, I have learned that Dr. Summers' research shows that the costly and morally questionable segregation of mental health patients the drug addicted, and the homeless in this type of warehouse-style recovery-oriented housing creates a dangerous microcosm which reduces the rate of successful social reintegration and excludes marginalized people from opportunity, dignity, and happiness. This development will offer space for substance use and house not only people suffering with drug addiction but also those experiencing homelessness and mental health issues. However, the research shows that congregate housing for people with mental illnesses and addictions is not successful. It requires residents to be resilient to the erratic behavior and the drug use of others as they try to improve their lives, a strength they may not possess. High-quality research clearly demonstrates the desirability and effectiveness of providing independent, recovery-oriented housing that is scattered throughout neighborhoods and cities. Independent, recovery-oriented housing differs from congregate housing, in that it allows individuals suffering mental health and addictions to live independently as a small percent of building tenants. It is important to note that these research results were conveyed to Housing Minister David Eby by Dr. Summers over a year ago, which begs the question, why are we continuing down this perilous path? Where is the city's integrity, wisdom, and more importantly, where is its compassion? Are we more concerned with making meaningful progress or checking boxes? With our deepening and tragic drug, mental health, and homelessness crises, I don't understand how the city and province can afford to dismiss successful solutions. It is abundantly clear to me, in this rezoning, the city has not conducted genuine, responsive public engagement that respects the wisdom and insights of the neighbourhood, nor have the city and BC Housing provided you with all of the facts and data that you require to make a good decision on behalf of all of the residents of this city. Furthermore, and most disappointingly, there is a clinical model which has a higher rate of success than the one employed by this proposal. Why aren't we using it? This proposal is deeply flawed, and I ask you to reject it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for calling in. Uh, you do have a question from Councillor Boyle. Go ahead, Councillor Boyle, up to five minutes. Yes, um, thanks. I, I'm wondering, I'm looking at the Housing First study that Dr. Sumners was uh, one of the um, uh, 
academics on, and it says pretty clearly that Housing First in both congregate and scattered sites uh, achieved markedly superior housing stability compared to not providing housing uh, over that 24 month period. So I'm wondering if there's a different study that you are referring to? Uh, I've, uh, I, I, I can't specify the study. I'm, I'm referring simply to uh, Dr. Summer's body of work, but uh, sorry, Councillor Boyle, I'd like to ask clarity. You said, and I, and I think you're making a, an incorrect uh, sorry, comparison no, here. You said, yeah. you said as compared to, to uh, and not, uh, pro uh, not uh, providing uh, housing. Can I get clarity on your, your comment or your question? Uh, it, yeah. It's not, it, it, the format unfortunately isn't a, a discussion, um, but the, the um, study I have in front of me, and I, I can ask it as a question again, but the some, summer's study, the randomized uh, study has um, pretty clearly outlined the congregate and scattered sites uh, both perform better on a number of indicators than, um, you know, treatment as usual. Uh, uh, and and so I was wondering if there was a different study that you were referring to. Um, that's my question. But but if not, I, I, I can leave it at that. Thanks for your time. Well, I'm happy to address your question, Councillor, because a moment ago you said that the study compared uh, congregate and scattered housing to to not providing housing. And the work that I uh, reviewed of Dr. Summers didn't compare it to not providing housing. And that's not what I'm suggesting at all. I'm, I'm certainly suggesting that we need to do something here. What I'm saying is that according to the work of Dr. Summers and my actual uh, seminars of his that I have attended, uh, in which he has uh, shared with us the substance of his work, uh, it demonstrates very clearly that congregate housing is not as successful as independent recovery-oriented housing. And that's what he communicated to me. I'm sure if you have further questions, he'd be happy to address those to you directly. I will certainly ask him. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, that is it for questions. I very much appreciate you calling in today and expressing your uh, thoughts on this project. With that, I'm going to move to uh, speaker 125, Ginny Sim. 125, Ginny Sim. Hello. Hi there. You have Hello, up to Mr. five Mayor. minutes whenever you're... Hi there, up to five minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, hello, Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to, to our comments and concerns. My name is Ginny Sim and I'm a resident of Vancouver and I frequent the Kitsilano area with my four children. We love taking advantage of the amenities such as the community center, pool and parks. And we enjoy taking walks, especially with my 86-year-old father-in-law, who just lives a few blocks away from the proposed site. I am an elementary school teacher in the public school system, and I oppose the rezoning application of 2086 to 2098 West 7th Avenue and 2091 West 8th Avenue. <clears throat> As a public school teacher and mother, I'm naturally conditioned to think about safety first and foremost. It is my responsibility to think about the safety of my students and my children. I'm always thinking steps ahead when I plan lessons or activities for them. My children often walk through the neighborhood on their own. The location of this proposed building is close to many schools and a toddler park, which causes me concern for the surrounding area. I've also learned that this proposed building will be congregate housing for people who may have complex needs and am therefore concerned for the residents as well. As a classroom teacher, we make sure that students with more complex needs are integrated with the general population of students in a class in very small numbers. It is what works, and if students with more complex needs are placed together in a class, it is in very small numbers with adequate care and support. That is what is humane, safe, and manageable for everyone involved. The proposed building on West 7th and Arbutus is not a school, but will be a residence for a vulnerable population that needs supports, and therefore, as a resident of Vancouver, having a concern for supports is a valid concern. I was also surprised to learn that children will be prohibited from living in this proposed building. And why is that? It is because the residents will follow a harm reduction approach, and it worries me that such a large social housing development where children are prohibited from residing is proposed to be just built meters away from a toddler park and a school. In listening to the rezoning, um, the res responses from the rezoning applicant, there, 
clearly does not seem to be sufficient planning or response to ensure that the residents who live in the building will receive the in-house supports they need. <clears throat> this is city land and the city should ensure that residents are guaranteed supports and services. <clears throat> the city also needs to ensure that the family-friendly neighbourhood concerns are taken into consideration. We need to ensure that there are checks in place to reduce risks. It seems irresponsible to not require guaranteed supports for residents. Social housing could still be built on this site at a smaller scale, which would not need a rezoning application. This seems more appropriate for the neighbourhood. I ask that councillor, councillors please oppose this application for the following reasons. The scale and the size of the building is far too large and overwhelming for the neighbourhood. In-house supports and services need to be guaranteed and insured for residents. Thank you so much for listening to me this afternoon. Thank you for your time today. You do have a question from Councillor Dejanova. Go ahead to Councillor. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jenny, for um, for waiting <laughs> so many days to come back and speak. I'm just wondering, I'm trying to just clarify, um, and I want to make sure that, that I don't put words in your mouth, but if you could maybe um, provide a little more clarity on your comments about there not being any family housing, so chil you know children couldn't live in this building. That's something that was considered. So uh, in in your experience, not only as a resident but as a teacher, would that concern you if 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 for whatever reasons the proponents had excluded children for any reason? Um, the the building it so close to a school also would affect children, and that that should be considered. Yeah, so I, I'm just concerned because children are not, I've heard, is not, are they are not allowed to live in this building due to the harm, harm reduction approach because there will be allowed spaces for, um, for, I guess, drug usage. And so I know that children may be allowed to enter the building, but they are not allowed to live in the building. And so... For me, as a school teacher, if I if a child can't go into a building, it's not necessarily a safe place for a child. But okay. this building and, will be built right across from a school. Okay, so so you feel that if it's being built across from a school, this the same it should be inclusive of children. I would think so. Like I would want that to be the case. Thank you so much for clarifying. Um, my questions or answering my questions and providing that clarity. Thank you. Uh, that is it for uh, questions from Council for you speakers. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing your views and thanks for your dedication to uh, kids. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're off to uh, speaker number 126, Kim Page, speaker 126. Hi, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Can you hear me? Sure can, up to five minutes, please. Um, my name is Kim, and I am the daughter of a retired Vancouver police officer, and my husband works in psychiatry with Vancouver Coastal Health. I have worked in Vancouver for 30 years and have lived in both Kitsilano and downtown for almost 15 years. We also have a child that attends school and kids. Both my husband and I are active members of the community. We volunteer our time and have done significant fundraising over the last 30 years to help those in shelters and transitional housing. We are passionate about supporting and helping those in need. My husband has dedicated his career to helping patients, or as he would say, his clients with mental health and addictions. I'm sharing all these personal details as I want to make it clear that we are not NIMBYs, we do not own a home or drive a fancy car, which is your average working family trying to sustain a life in Vancouver. Although we strongly support social housing and understand it is desperately needed throughout the city, including Kitsilano, we are not in favour of this development in its current form and urge you to oppose it. If not only for the sake of those being housed, but for the neighbours and children who will significantly be impacted by the tower in its current form. I wish this hearing was taking place during the busy school year so you could be at Delamont Park and witness the already heavy congestion in the area. The bus loop and subway will make it even more so. Both my husband and I have spent a lot of time reviewing the proposed project, corresponding with numerous community members, BC Housing, the Vancouver Police, along with many others. 
The lack of planning to build this sustainable living environment is negligent. I ask you to seriously consider those already in the immediate neighbourhood who are vulnerable. Almost 500 elementary school children and a daycare less than 20 metres away. A very busy playground that's, you know, very much for the toddlers. And it is right adjacent to the proposed building site. And an alcohol and detox recovery home for women is just around the corner. To not properly take into consideration the proximity the proximity to those already vulnerable in the immediate neighbourhood is harmful. There are significant safety issues that still need to be addressed, and I'm not going to repeat the numerous concerns that you've heard to date. I do, however, though, recall a counsellor questioning whether shadowing would outweigh housing, and I felt the exact same way as they did. And I did some further reading and looked at the studies and learned that shadowing can affect people's mental health. And another important factor is that during winter, ice forms in shaded areas more quickly, and this will affect those living, working, and playing in the area. There are associated risks that should be considered. But going back, especially troubling, these plans will also be harming the most vulnerable, those that require more than just a roof over their head. The individuals you are trying to help require complex care, and by not setting up adequate care and mandating resources to support them, you are doing a great disservice to not only them, but the greater community that will be negatively affected. I can assure you that the mental health professionals are not lying when they have reached out to you and BC Housing to express their concerns and share fact-based statistics. You will be harming many people. The City and BC Housing have a fiduciary responsibility to the people. Accountability needs to occur now, not when Ernest and Young files a report. You have a tremendous amount of public concern on multiple issues which needs to be adequately addressed and planned for. Your decision has a significant impact on the community and the incoming residents. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I hope you make the right decision and do not approve this project in its current form. We can do better and we must do better. To simply put a roof over someone's head and provide undefined support services is not enough. You have a greater responsibility to the community and in particular the vulnerable individuals, those that are desperate for housing and those that are already vulnerable in the community. Please do not approve this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You do have questions. Uh, Councillor Hardwick, up to five minutes, please. Uh, it's, it's less of a question, more of a, a request. Would you please send in your remarks if you haven't done so already? It has yes, an email I would be to happy to. Thank you very yes, much. I would be happy to. Thank You're you. welcome. Thanks so much. That's it for questions. I appreciate you uh, sharing your views. Thank you so much. And I'll move over to uh, Barbara May, uh, Speaker 127. Barbara May. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. This is Barbara May. I'm a resident of Vancouver. I'm speaking today in opposition to the social housing project proposed for 7th, 8th, and Arbutus. To quote Judge Gove, um, a well-known um, provincial judge who um, started drug court and community court in downtown Eastside, the 13-story housing proposal in this location is the wrong model, the wrong size, and in the wrong place. I'd like to start with what is missing from the housing model that is being proposed. The four pillars approach, which has seen a dramatic reduction of the number of street users consuming drugs, a significant drop in overdose death, and a reduction in HIV and hepatitis infection rates in various countries in Europe that have used this model. Vancouver has only implemented harm reduction and on-site injection sites, but has not offered the other three pillars in a consistent and successful manner. One thing successful models must include is quality support for individuals and a solid plan for social reintegration back into the community. A building this size does not do that. Currently, SROs and supportive housing are primarily located in the downtown east side. It is my understanding that some individuals living in these facilities have been robbed, attacked, assaulted, and murdered, and often prefer to live on the streets where they feel safer. Drug dealers often come set up shop close to these facilities as they know they will have a steady stream of clients. In an effort to improve the situation for those living in the downtown east side, the provincial government has set up supportive housing in different facilities in Vancouver, such as the Biltmore Hotel. 
The neighbors there have had to deal with drug dealing, crime, and constant sirens, day and night, and more. The Marguerite Apartments at Olympic Village, a low-barrier housing project for a hard-to-house homeless population, is a similar model to the one proposed for this particular site. According to a police FOI requested by the Kitsilano Coalition, before the Marguerite Apartments opened, the number of 9 calls the police received from that area numbered 55 in two years. Two years after it has been in operation, the 9 calls have increased to 972 representing a 1,700% increase. Since then, the number of calls have hardly diminished. The proposed residents at 7th, 8th Avenue in Arbutus put vulnerable children at risk. There are approximately 500 children who attend St. Augustine Elementary School located across the street, and Delmont Park to the north is frequented by young families with children. Daycare workers often take to this park as well. In my opinion, low barrier housing is not suitable for this location, although high barrier with a small number of people might be. Also vulnerable in the neighborhood, as you've already heard, are in low-income, independent seniors, individuals with disabilities, and the Women's Supportive Recovery Program. These women are trying to get away from uh, using drugs and having um, a low-barrier program next door really jeopardizes their progress. There is clear evidence that low-barrier supportive housing does not work for those with addictions and mental health issues without other supports in place, which should include the Four Pillars Drug Strategy based on four principles, which include harm reduction, prevention, treatment, and enforcement. A groundbreaking study entitled At Home Chez Soi by the Canadian Mental Health Commission is changing the way homelessness for people with severe mental health is viewed. The study reveals that when those with mental health and substance abuse issues are provided with housing and wraparound services, the crime rate goes down as does their substance abuse. Key to the success of this program is housing people in scattered housing units across the city with no more than 20% of these individuals living in any particular residence with the other 80% being mainstream. This gives the opportunity for the more vulnerable residents to uh, integrate into mainstream society. In Kelowna Radio interview on December 2021, Mr. Minister David Eby acknowledged that there are people with serious mental health and substance abuse issues who are very hard to house, which cause a disproportionate number of problems, and that the current shelter and supportive housing models are not working for them. He talked about complex care models that is groundbreaking program being developed in the Lower Mainland to address the needs of individuals who have overlapping mental health challenges, substance abuse issues, acquired brain trauma injuries who are often left to experience homelessness. We definitely need to help these people, but we need to have the proper resources in place for them to be able to turn their lives around. And that would be... um, That is the point. My time's up. Yes, it is. Appreciate you very much calling in and sharing your perspectives. Uh, I am going to move to the next speaker. Thank Mayor, you so much. I have a, this is Councillor Boyle. I have a point, point of um, order before we move on to the next speaker, which okay. is, uh, I'm just hoping uh, you can remind speakers um, that within the bounds of the public hearing, it's appropriate to talk about services, but not to suggest that possible tenants to this building would be a safety threat. Um, uh, because we're not speaking about um, future tenants specifically. Yeah, I, I am looking, listening carefully, uh, Council Boyle, and I will uh, uh, I will try to keep people within boundaries. I, again, under the uh, procedural bylaws, I do have the authority under uh, 4.4 to uh, maintain decorum. Uh, at this point, uh, because we've had a wide range, I. I do let people go into the gray area. If it continues there, I I will uh, pull them back. Uh, but at this so, but uh, okay. that in terms of point of procedure, Councilor Kirby Young, you have another. Uh, point? Yeah, I, yeah, and I appreciate Councilor Ball raising that. I also wanted to follow up on four point four because um, getting notes from the public requesting that that be equally applied, um, re- uh, relating to the one speaker we had who characterized residents in the neighborhood as filled with hatred, and uh, people are asking that. That be applied equally for both sides. Yep. Perspective it's on kind it. of a two strikes policy on this thing because these are not professional speakers; they are members of the public. So, 
if uh, people slide uh, past the 4.4 line, uh, I, I kind of give folks one unless it's completely egregious. So just so you know, both sides uh, and, and trying to, um, you, you know, uh, keep keep everybody on track. But I do understand these are very difficult conversations and everybody's trying their best. Uh, but yes, thank you for those. Uh, I will move on to um, Claudine Blair, who is speaker 128. Hi, hi. Can you hear me okay? Sure can. Up to uh, five minutes, please. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Claudine Blair, and I am the resident of Vancouver, and I live in Arbutus Ridge. I'm in the Kitts neighborhood on an almost everyday basis. I am opposed to the rezoning application because it takes a harm reduction approach right next door to a school and a playground. The city knows that kids are vulnerable to exposure to drug paraphernalia and to interactions with substances use and those suffering from untreated mental illness. The proposed building has no restrictions on drug use, which is incompatible with kids. The city needs to look at a model of housing for the homeless that takes into account children in this family-friendly neighborhood. I asked City Council to come to the neighborhood and work together on a new model of housing for the homeless in Kitts. Thank you. Thanks so much for your uh, input there. I don't see any questions for you, so I will move to the next speaker, who is uh, ALM. Speaker 129, ALM. No, not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Next is Bradley Blair, speaker number 130, Bradley Blair. Uh, no. Thanks. We have uh, Miriam uh, Kapmeyer, uh, speaker number 131. Hello. Hi there. You have up to uh, five minutes whenever you're ready, please. Um, Hello, well, Miriam. Uh, hi there. Yeah, Go ahead. Yes. Hello. Okay. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, good afternoon. Thank you so much. My name is Miriam. I'm living in Kitsilano, and I oppose the planned housing project in its current form. Like many others, I've written and rewritten my speech several times, and as many others have mentioned already, this model is flawed on so many levels. One point I want to bring up again, however, is the fact that it won't be possible to adjust the building at a later point to different needs. The applicant has specifically only mentioned adults in individual studio units, even in a family setting. So this building is meant as a permanent housing solution for its occupants. It will be there for decades and won't be suitable nor adjustable for couples, families, or other future needs. So how can this be sustainable? A previous speaker had spoken out in support of the building and mentioned in his last sentence that he and his school-aged daughter could move there. The thing is, his daughter would not be able to move there. He would have to give her up, possibly into care. So people won't be able to keep their children, and it also won't be suitable to support family reunification, something that is desperately needed, especially for indigenous residents who are overrepresented, both in homeless population as well as in children in care. So how can BC Housing claim this model contributes to reconciliation when it perpetuates the continued separation of Indigenous children from their parents? I haven't heard anything that indicates they have consulted with the Indigenous community on this project. And it's quite an audacity to use reconciliation as a buzzword. I mentioned before were also kind of liability issues that the city might have to face. The traffic and emergency access have come up a few times impact on the local homeless population who does not mix well with the one from the downtown east side. And um, yeah, one point that I would like to bring up is also that there is no green space plant around the building. A report from the World Health, World Health Organization from 2016 had outlined the positive effect on mental and physical public health and social cohesion integration. Um, originally, I want to bring a quote, but that would become too long. Um, to the purpose of the building, there is no question about that we need social housing, and I'm in support of that. And I'm saying this as a neighbor to the proposed site. But we need a concept and a model that the community can carry and that integrates well with the neighborhood. So when I moved to Kitsilano a few years ago, I wasn't even aware that the buildings around me are supportive of social housing. And we need more of that kind of model. It's less stigmatizing. 
a smaller building with green space around it that allows for a diverse occupancy of families with children and single people, men or women, and seniors would be a much better fit. In regards to the project, um, yeah, we all, you and we, have all been filled with evasive, non-committing, and at times misleading answers. Um, as we have learned in the initial hearing, not only does BC Housing not follow its own guidelines, it also doesn't commit to best practices. And the recent damning report by Ernest and Young also shows they don't, um, I quote, have no formal evaluation criteria exists for supporting supportive housing funds and the women's transitioning housing funds proposal. And I also quote, interviews have confirmed that the performance of the development team is primarily driven by unit count, not how sustainable a project is. The provider themselves have admitted they don't, <coughs> excuse me, so the provider themselves have admitted they don't have the experience in dealing with a project of such a magnitude. So why should you as a council make such a far-reaching decision for this project based on we will see promises? That can't be good enough for you. It's also appalling that BC Housing tries to blackmail the council on the funding. David Eby has confirmed on Tuesday in an interview with CBC, BC Housing has $2 billion at their disposal and is acting more like a loan bank at this point, and even more funding is to be expected. Additionally, BC Housing is behind building women's transitioning housing, so only 155 units from promised 1,500 are built. BC Housing is more pressed to find land to fulfill all their projects than the other way around. They have more funding at their hands to give out than projects to give it to. So instead of setting this up for failure, you have the chance to make the choice to turn this into a success story. So please, send this project back to the drawing board to develop a model that actually will work, a model that will help their occupants and give them a real chance to turn their life around and would also allow the surrounding community to help. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I am going to move to the next speaker. But thanks again thank for you participating. Very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, speaker number 132 is withdrawn council. Speaker 133 is Andrew Powell. Andrew Powell, Speaker 133. I'm not on the line. Thank you, uh, clerks. Our next speaker is uh, 134, Giovanna Dallofonso. Hello, can you hear me? Sure can, yes, Hello. up to uh, Hi. Hi, up, high up to five minutes, whenever you're ready. Okay, dear mayor and members of council, my name is Giovanna D'Alfonso. I am a professional in the healthcare sector, a mother of two, and a neighbor of this site. I am opposed to the rezoning of our beauties for single room only congregate housing. With this decision, you can directly impact the future and well being of many vulnerable people. Did you know that women in Vancouver will opt out of single room occupancy buildings? and would rather sleep precariously on couches or on the street to escape, to avoid violence, harassment, and to avoid being separated from their young children. Effectively, this project's design in itself acts as a barrier to entry for many, including the vulnerable, hidden homeless, fleeing violence, women-led families, and those who don't wish to be separated from their children or companions. I recognize and appreciate the complexity of the task but humbly urge you to consider the difference you can make in the lives of these. In addition, all this and more pertaining to the failings of this large-scale congregate single-room-only housing format has been presented in great thoughtful detail along with quality research by clinical psychologists, social workers, and nonprofit housing operators to city planners and to BC Housing Vail, and they proceeded with planning for the site before listening to key stakeholders. The Minister of Housing, David Eby, was quoted as saying the project was a done deal prior to any or all consultation. I urge you to send this project back to city staff and planners so that our neighborhood and others across Vancouver from now on be provided rezoning applications and project plans that will be successful from the start and do not act in themselves as a barrier to entry for a large number of the vulnerable, including women-led families. Thank you for listening and for keeping an open mind to what is possible. 
Thank you so much. Uh, there are no questions for you, uh, but do uh, very much appreciate you uh, calling in, taking the time today. I am going to move to the next speaker, uh, speaker number, thank you, uh, speaker 135, Diana Lee. Hi there. Hi there, up to Hello? five minutes, please. Hi there, up Hi. to five minutes. Great. My name is Diana Lee. I am a resident of Vancouver and I am, uh, I am opposed to this rezoning. There are multiple problems with the project, but in the interest of time, I will only focus on a few points. First, the applicants decline to confirm what staffing and services will be offered at the proposed building, but it seems there will be no complex care on site and there are no clinical supports for mental health and substance use in the neighborhood. Second, the safety and well-being of all Vancouver residents should be considered, including that of vulnerable children in the neighborhood. As others have pointed out, the proposed building is only 18 meters away from a preschool, elementary school, and toddler park. How is a building that does not allow children to live in it appropriate for a child-centered block of the city? Third, this week, I heard David Eby interviewed on CBC Radio. During the interview, Minister Eby said, BC Housing was over its target for supportive and affordable rental housing with almost 7,000 units coming online. He also acknowledged that BC Housing was not meeting its target for women's transition housing. The government had promised to build 1,500 of these units, but had only built and opened 155 units to date. In light of this, why is BC Housing trying to push a huge supportive housing project that the applicant said would target older single men at Arbutus and West 7th? This site would be much better suited to women's transition housing, given the vulnerable populations coexisting at the site, like the Women's Supportive Recovery Home next door. All of you have spent many hours listening to concerned members of the community. I hope you can look back on these days and know that you made the right choice for our city, because you have been put in place to do that. Please vote no to this rezoning application. That is the only way we'll see the applicants resubmit a proposal that will best serve the tenants of the building and the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, thanks for your participation. I don't see any questions for you from council, so I will move to the next speaker, uh, but thanks again for calling in. Uh, council, we have speaker 136, Dustin Huff up next. 136, Dustin Huff. Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Up to five minutes. Uh, please go ahead. All right. I'll, I'll make it quick and simple. Uh, basically, I'm opposed to the housing. Um, and I can state everything that everybody else has been stating, but I'll just make, I'll just, uh, sorry, I will simplify it. Basically, it's not appropriate housing for the location. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much. Do <laughs> you have anything else to say? No, no, that's it. Okay. Thank you so much for calling in. Um, I am going to move to the next speaker, but uh, thanks for participating in this uh, public hearing. And I'm going to move on to uh, speaker number 137, who's uh, Christina uh, Dojadiak. Hope I got that right. It's actually Dojadiak, but good trying. Okay, thanks. Up to, uh, sorry about that, up to five minutes, please. Not a problem. All right, I'm a first time buyer. I live in the Kitsilano area for the last 14 years, and I'm opposed as a first time buyer as well as an early child educator in the field. I believe that park should be more, be made more adapted for more age appropriate and for kids, like making more of a playground for birth to the age of five because sometimes if a parent has a disability of some kind, such as an example being in a wheelchair and, they, and it's a struggle going down that hill onto our beautiful or you to Kids Beach for the park, have something more simple, something close, and that easy access from the subway to a park that is age appropriate for kids that are like from birth to five. 
And that way it's inclusive, it's close, and that way they can also, if the child goes to that daycare that's nearby, then they can go there afterwards if they're enrolled in there. Or if they go to that school, then it's easy access. And that way the parent is not struggling. Instead of having something that is going to be disturbing a lot of parents that live, that have the view of the kids, but they don't know who else is watching them. Okay, uh, um, let, let's just keep it to the uh, the parameters here, which is the kind of uh, structure of the building. Um, that's a little bit uh, outside the lines, the speaker. So um, appreciate your comments, but let's uh, try to stick to just the, the, the form and, yeah. and location. I'm of the against building. it. Com I'm completely against it. Okay. I'd rather see something put else there. Pardon me? I'd rather see something else there. Okay. Thank you so much for your uh, time today and your uh, uh, your comments. And uh, we are going to move on to the next speaker. But uh, do thank you so much for your uh, for your thoughts. Uh, the next speaker is one thirty eight, Alexander Suka. Speaker one thirty eight, Alexander Suka. Hello. Hi there. You have up to uh, five minutes whenever you're ready. Okay, so my name is Alexander Sukas. I don't know why there was no S in my name on that form, but it's spelled with an S. Uh, anyway, sorry, I was that. born and raised in Kit. Sorry? I'm sorry, uh, my apologies for that. I just have Suka on my sheet. No, 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 so... no, 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 no. Okay. Anyway, so um, I oppose the uh, rezoning application today, and I'm going to talk about why. Okay. So I was born and raised in Kitsilano. I just graduated from high school. Um, I grew up playing in Delamont Park since I was old enough to walk. Um, my parents and also the daycare center I went to would bring me to the park several times each week, and I had many happy times there. Small home daycares also take their three- and four-year-old kids to Delamont Park to play, all holding hands as they walk from the daycare. The doors to the supportive housing building will face Delamont Park. Why is the building designed so that its residents and people visiting them, who will include drug dealers since this building allows drug use, have to pass by the park to get in and out of the building? Delamont Park has little hills all around the outside of it, which means that the view into the park from Arbutus and 7th is mostly obstructed. This will make the park appealing to the people who live in the project and their visitors as a place to hang out with some privacy. Nobody is going to bring their little kids to Delamont Park anymore if there is a drug use in the park, or even if there are adults who don't have kids hang around in the park. Needles and other drug suppliers are going to be left in and around the park because it is right across a two-lane street from the doors of the project. The park will end up only being used by adults from the tower. Counselors should come to the park to see how busy it is all the time. Where are the little kids going to play if there is no longer safe to use the park? Most people around Delamont Park live in apartments and have no outdoor space. Parents will go crazy if they can't let their kids burn off some steam running around outside. Walking all the way and to and from Kitts Beach involves a, lot, a very long, steep hill that is too much for little kids who are too big for strollers. I would know. Please vote no to the rezoning and ask BC Housing to plan a project for 7th and Arbutus that will give people... Um, with low incomes, a place to live, but it will not ruin the Delmont Park for the kids who have been playing there for generations, such as myself. It is a good location for low-income families with kids who could take advantage of Delmont Park being right outside their front door. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you uh, calling in. That is it for, uh, there are no questions, so I am going to move to the next speaker. Uh, speaker 139 just has one name, Carlos. Speaker 139. Hello, Major. My name is Carlos Estrada, and I have built, and I have lived two blocks away from the proposed development for over 10 years. To begin, I will say that I completely oppose to the rezoning discussed today for seven and abuses. But also, I want to be clear, I'm in favor of social housing. So is my family, my neighbors, and my friends. As it is not one or the other, as several presenters have been interpreting this opposition, even earlier today disrespectfully and with not fundamentally calling it poor phobia. Social housing is necessary and helps people when it is correctly planned and implemented. And this rezoning proposal clearly lacks planning. By the way, the planner, 
the planner, Mr. Chen, in his presentation at the opening of the discussion several days ago, made numerous unsupported asseverations, half truth, and, un and used assumptions that in theory sounded fantastic. He also mentioned in several occasions, and from my point of view, unnecessarily, the term independent when referring to the school across the street, as if 500 kids attending this independent school had a lower value than other kids. But, well, this is just my perception, and he's just doing his job. Even he looks a lot more like a lobbyist to the project or pursuing someone's political oh, oh, agenda uh, rather than a civic uh, planner with neutral uh, position. Speaker, speaker, However, speaker. Uh, yes. Speaker, I, I'm yes. going to give you a warning. Yes. Uh, you okay. know, we're we're not going to uh, we're not going to talk about uh, people's um, you know motivations or uh, you know slander folks, uh, especially our our very valuable planning staff here. So I'd ask you to confine your comments uh, to the facts of the case. Thank you. Oh, sure. He, he sure looks valuable. Thank you. However, the job of elected officials is to represent us, and Mr. Shen was not elected, and you, councillors, you were. How could the developers talk about assessing community safety and concerns for this rezoning request? If so far, most of the answers we have received from all of them, all of them are prefabricated arguments and vague or no responses to our concerns, like... That information is not available yet. We don't know if there will be people with a history of violence living in the development. By the way, three days ago, there was a random attack in the area, according to police, might be related to mental health issues. Oh, they, they also mentioned there are cases of success. We don't have them with us now, but there sure are. We will get back to you on that, and we're still waiting for this. MPA society has wide experience. Oh, yes, but nothing this size. There is the possibility of having 130 people with drug abuse or mental health problems at the same time, but we will determine that support model later. They are considering a square footage for the laundry and kitchen for uncommon areas under the support model. Some people even express over these 139 hearings that the city ignored or ghosted them when they were approaching him. Another inexplicable note when MPA Society was asked about a scientific study that established that people with drug abuse and mental health problems do not, in, do not improve when living together unsupported, Mr. Nick Blackman answered, my 50 years of experience is that we have provided support and that is what I was contracted for. That is his answer. Your experience, Mr. Blackman, your experience is yours and the proposed model has been proof of low to no benefit for individuals in need of help to overcome drug abuse and mental health problems. And, uh, and when presenting the profile of supportive tenancy, the answer from BC Housing was, the uniqueness of tenancy is thought through a thoughtful process, a process where we as a community won't have anything to do or say, and the proposal do not have, and I'm quoting, the granular details yet. So, down the line, if approved as is, only MPA, Mr. Blackman and his experience, along with BC Housing, will decide who is going to be living there. So, approving the proposal, even when it, it is only a rezoning proposal, will be like shooting a gun and finding out later. And you know, the devil is in the details. And in this case, the granular details are still missing. It is Amazing how BC Housing and MPA try to minimize the community concerns by calling them operational issues to be determined. This is just unbelievable. In other notes, uh, I'm not sure you all have been watching the news, and when the proposal is presented, they make it look like we are opposing social housing, and this is just not true. This is just politicians trying to put pressure to deliver commitments following their own agenda. Last week, last week, the mayor was in the news and he mentioned a case with over 200 speakers that he was not even going to mention. Well, these 200 speakers were not taken into consideration in the planning process, which is responsibility of the city. And it is not only you, mayor, respectfully, who have better things to do. As he, as he, uh, it is all here that wanted to make us here now after the planning was, we were not considered. To finalize, thank you. During so, you, you, are several... your, you are at your five minutes, uh, so I will uh, thank okay, you for thank your you. presentation. Uh, but Councillor Hardwick has uh, a question for you. Councillor Hardwick? I just wondered, uh, your name was just listed as Carlos. Could you 
Estrada. I introduced myself at the beginning. Sure. Carlos Estrada. I just, how do you spell that, please? E-S-T-R-A-D-A. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for calling in today, speaker. Really appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. And you're hearing your perspectives. Thank you. Um, next speaker, 140, is uh, Stacy uh, Bodnarek. Bodnarek. Speaker 140. Not on the line. Thank you. We have uh, Kelly McPhee next, speaker 141. Kelly McPhee. Not on the line. Thank you. Speaker number 143 is Mike Chandler. Mike Chandler, speaker 143. Uh, Mayor, this is the clerk. Uh, speaker 142 yep. is on the line. Uh, Rebecca. Okay. Uh, speaker 142, Rebecca Cordemanche. Oh, hi. Yeah, that's the correct pronunciation. Oh, wow. Okay, thanks. Uh, first go. Uh, go ahead, please, up to five minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I oppose the rezoning application. I live within a block of the proposed site. I go to Delaware Park nearly every day with my new baby. And my biggest concern is this building will compromise the safety of the park and the surrounding area. Sorry, um, it's very morally and ethically distressing for council to have to choose between providing housing for those who are homeless and potentially compromising the safety of children. The selection of this particular site is putting two vulnerable groups at odds with each other. That's not right, and for that reason alone, the proposal should be revised or rejected. The needs and challenges of the homeless individuals being housed should not negatively impact children. It's been stated that housing is a human right, but what about the child's right to safe education? Well, I doubt anyone is against providing a home for those who don't have one. The details of this specific proposal are what matter. This application is focused on persons who are hardest to house. These individuals come with their personal trauma, and it's inevitable this will spill over into the community with the closest areas being most affected. The local community resources are not equipped to manage the complex care of this population. These individuals require informed medical specialists, not a neighborhood advisory board. I would be curious to know what a medical specialist would say about housing these individuals with each other. I believe other speakers have mentioned this, but this is not an appropriate model of care, and logically that makes sense to me and many others. So I think it'd be wise for BZ Housing to consult with experts in the field of addictions and mental health. The proposed housing is too close to the toddler park and elementary school. There's a lack of guidance for the operational aspects of the housing model. What is best practice? This terminology is far too vague, and that's not appropriate. Where is the published guidance? If no guidance exists in Canada, surely there are models from other countries that can be followed. Previous speakers have stated other parts of the world have successfully implemented low-rise, high-density scattered housing. Why are we not applying this successful strategy in Vancouver? More importantly, why is BC Housing not aware of this model? Or if they are, why are they not um, appropriately discussing it? The Marguerite building has resulted in discarded needles and drugs in the surrounding area. That's a public health concern. It is not being managed. How will that be handled here at Delamont Park and the surrounding area? When a child or someone else gets injured, how will they be compensated? Who is at fault? How will emergency vehicles access the building efficiently, given the school traffic crosswalks and multiple traffic calming initiatives? BC Housing mentioned homeless families are one of their priorities. Sorry, mentioned homeless families are one of their priorities and kits with a high concentration of young families and supports for families. Why aren't young families being considered as part of the housing model? The application mentions the phrase integration into the community several times in their presentation. How does an elementary school in Taller Park jive with the persons that they're interested in housing? The single occupancy design of the proposed housing model excludes families. This doesn't seem fit with their aim of inclusive housing, nor does it seem fair to exclude families the opportunity to live in a family-oriented area. When the details of this application are considered with the specific local area, there are too many things that just don't seem to logically fit together. 
It's not ethical to weigh children's safety against providing homes for the homeless. Supporting one vulnerable group should not compromise another vulnerable group. There must be an alternative. My suggestions are, one, find a different location for this building to house individuals, or two, change the design and the occupant demographics of this building to allow for families and a much smaller number of individuals with mental health and drug use disorders. I would encourage the applicants to preserve as much green space and trees as possible. We all know green space and tall trees are positively associated with an individual's well-being. My last question is, what is the threshold at which there's enough neighborhood opposition and concerns for council to either reject or ask the applicants for a revised proposal? My understanding is over a thousand people have already indicated they oppose this proposal, and an earlier speaker mentioned over 90% of local businesses oppose this proposal. Thanks for your time. Thank you for your time. Uh, I actually don't see any questions on the queue for you, so I am going to move to Speaker 143, uh, Mike Chandler. Mike Chandler, Speaker Hello. 143. Hi there. You have up Hello. to five minutes, please. This is Mike. Hi. Yep, go right ahead. Uh, yeah, my name's, um, my name's uh, Mike Chandler. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, Kitsilano. Uh, I've been so for 12 years, and I live less than 500 metres from the proposed site of the rezoning. Uh, I'm strongly opposed to the rezoning proposal. Uh, I have a number of concerns about it. Uh, these include the well-being of the proposed tenants, uh, as well as the dimensions of the building. Uh, these have been addressed by earlier speakers, many of whom have already made detailed and well-grounded explanations as to why this application fails on both these counts. My chief concern, though, is the safety of local children. I'm a local father of two young girls who frequently spend their time in the same block as this proposed development including Delamont Park. This is supportive housing, it's only for single adults and could be 100% low barrier, meaning many of the individuals could have mental health and addiction issues. The proposed site for this is directly adjacent to a playground, a daycare, an elementary school, a women's abstinence-based supportive recovery home, and many seniors' residences. This is not a typical residential city block, as there are an, un there are an unusually high number of young children within a line of sight of this development. If this goes ahead, potentially 129 individuals who are more than likely to have unpredictable behavior will be in close proximity point to a large order. number of young children. All right, Speaker, I do have a uh, point of order. Uh, what uh, number is your point of order, uh, Councillor Swanson? 6.1B. Okay, uh, 6.1B. Reflecting negatively on the character of person or group of persons. Okay, and what would you like me to... Um, Caution the speaker not to generalize about future okay. tenants. Thank you. Uh, speaker, we are um, we're really looking at the form and location of this building. I do understand there's a lot of issues that are attached to it otherwise. Uh, but at this, the, those decisions are made at a later date. We are discussing them uh in in a kind of uh broad way today but not but we uh we shouldn't be talking about a a group of uh people in any particular way uh that would be at all disparaging so just to keep that in mind as you continue along thank you okay i'll continue yeah um yeah i, I have serious fears uh, about the safety of, of these kids in the local area especially given two of them and my two my two daughters uh, and from what i've seen and heard uh, there is not enough information provided to mitigate my fears, and it seems that this application hasn't even considered the potential impact. Schools everywhere are restricted zones for many things, whether it's speed of traffic or access to drugs and alcohol. This is because the safety of the city's children is, and should be, absolutely paramount. For this proposal to lo locate this building less than 20 metres from an elementary school should have initiated a much larger discussion about what needs to be done to guarantee the safety of local kids. This should have been the first consideration and the onus should be on the applicants to proactively inform the public as to what's being done in this regard. However, there has not been nearly enough information to assess where the children's safety has been addressed and I just cannot accept this. I recognize the serious and worsening problem of homelessness in the city and that there are too many people in dire need of shelter. But if the plan is to meet the city's priorities of helping those most in need, the proposed site needs to have a mix of tenants that can make better use of and feel at home with the facilities nearby. For example, families living together in one unit, recovering women, 
people with disabilities and seniors. It also needs to be much smaller so the level of care provided is sufficient and so that these new tenants feel part of the local community and not more isolated. If this isn't done, it will fail those it's intending to help as well as impact the local community, especially the children who call this place home. Kitsilano is home to thousands of units of social and supportive housing that work for the tenants and neighbours because they are the right size and model and blend into the neighbourhood. This project does not. My request to the city as a voter and as a concerned father is to reconsider this proposal and come up with a supportive housing plan that has seriously considered and mitigated the impact on the safety of local kids and other vulnerable individuals. I urge the council to vote against this. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks so much for your uh, time today on this item. I don't see any uh, questions for you, Speaker. Um, so I am going to move to the next speaker. Uh, Council, we're at quarter to five, so I'll try to get uh, two more speakers in, uh, possibly three, depending on who are here. Uh, we have uh, Noreen Donnelly, Speaker 144. Noreen Donnelly, Speaker 144. Not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Uh, how about DJ Cold, 145, DJ Cold. No, not on the line. Thank you. Uh, speaker 146, Bernie Hensel. Speaker 146, Bernie Hensel. No, not on the line. 147, Speaker 147, Manjeet uh, Arnija. No, not on the line. Thank you. A 148, Barinder Arnija. Yes. Barinder Arnija? Yes. Please go ahead, up to five minutes. Sure. My name is Beer and I'm opposed to this proposed development at uh, Arbutus and 8th Avenue. Not only do I have two grandkids who attend the school right across the street, but I have a business that has been running for over 40 years, just a few blocks away from the location. I'm deeply concerned about how this will impact crime in the neighborhood and how my grandkids will be safe and protected when they are at school. You are proposing a monster tower. I worry my grandkids will see things their eyes, young eyes should not see. I worry people will not want to come to my business because there will be drug use so close to my shop. I really okay, think uh, that... Speaker, I, I do just want to caution you about not to comment on the nature of the people who may uh, eventually live in the building. There is a wide range, as it was explained by staff. So please just comment on the form and location of the building. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Sorry. And I, no, I really fun. like that if, if there's a better solution to move this tower somewhere that isn't so close to the children. It's not right. And it, in all my years of living here, I've never been disappointed with our mayor or the council. And I really appreciate that you're listening to all of us. And, um, and there are thousands of people who are opposing this. And because of the nature of the um, uh, proposed tower or the location of the tower, it's so close to the school and so close to all the other businesses. Anyways, thank you very much. I really appreciate you listening to me. Thank you for your time this evening and, and sharing your uh, perspectives and, of course, your uh, contribution to the city uh, through your business. Appreciate it very much. And uh, we will uh, move on at 4.48 to the next speaker, uh, 1.49, speaker 1.49, Fran uh, Francesco uh, Castrillo. Yes. Uh, good Hi evening. There. And I think it is not... Hello? Hi there. Up to Hello? five minutes. May you? Yeah. Yep, go okay, ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, for giving the possibility to uh, to come into council and um, you know and, and sharing sharing what what we feel about uh, uh, about what could be the future of uh, of one of the most important neighbor 
for us in the community of Kitsilano. Uh, again, as you said, my name is Francesco Castrillo. Uh, it, I think it, well, you'll, you'll, you'll like it for names, uh, Mr. May. And um, I am a resident of Vancouver. Uh, my, my point uh, that, that I wanted to share is, is actually all the points that have been shared so far. Uh, I'm opposing to the, to the project, to, to the rezoning, uh, but for all the reasons that have been already said, uh, for uh, it, the building is, is really, it's too big. Uh, the number of units, 129, they imply a support of logistics that really, uh, I think, hasn't been considered yet. Um, we have 129 persons that will live there that they will need. What they will need, they will need to eat, they will need to drink, they, they will need uh, to move, they will need uh, assistance, and then there will be people that will work around the building to the logistic support of the building. Uh, I, I heard in the past, uh, in the past talks, in the past, uh, from the past speakers, that there's no parking mentioned, and. Uh, I, I I could see eventually a little bit of, of traffic going through the through the uh, Arbutus corridor. I mean the, the whole logistics are um, are are not being taken in consideration, um, and the logistics also of the uh, I wouldn't call it substance because we are not allowed to talk about the nature of the guests. But my my questioning would be. If there is a, a site that will be allowed to save uh, to save consumption, and then those drugs need to get there. So uh, that, that would be a, a point of question, right? It's how can I, if I would be responsible for the logistics, how can I have those substances in a way that could be licit if we're talking about these drugs, right? It, there's a whole lot of factors that I really think that that, that that haven't been taken in consideration. Besides of of the fact that oh, the shadow, yes, shadow is, is important. All the points that have been expressed are all extremely important. I do understand for the community. I, I live a few blocks away from the um, from the site uh, and. and I struggle with something. As, as a Catholic, we want to help. We are called to help. And now we're put in a position where we have to say no to something that could be marvelous. Uh, there are plans. There are, there are scientists that they have already developed and present a possible plan for a future of no homelessness. And we are deciding to just, just not, not to follow through it. So, I, you know, it, it, it's all about vision. What vision do we have? I have a vision of living in a world where my kids can, you know, feel uh, inspired and, and, and go and help. But also, you need to have the logistics to help. If there is such a monumental construction, how much help can be offered from the community? So it's... It's, it's this conundrum, right? How we are, we are feel that we feel that that we need to help. I feel that I need to help. At the same time, how can I help more? I've been in mission. I've I've, I've been in the logistics in, in the military, and and I've been in places where where really they needed your water. But if there is too much of a crowd, you cannot help. I I felt powerless. In those in, in those moments, and I, I think that I share. I I can understand what the Kitsilano community is uh, is uh, is experiencing. This willingness to keep helping, but the, the the logistics impediment because of the number and the and the volume and the, yeah yeah basically that's it. Thank you so much for uh, for the opportunity to talk. It, it really Thank it you really. For your makes a difference. Thank you for your time today uh, and for your service. Uh, that is it for, uh, there are no questions for you. So I will just thank you so much um, and move on to the next speaker. Uh, Council, it is uh, 4.55, uh, so um, perhaps we can try one more speaker and uh, 
and then break for for dinner. Patricia Legg, speaker 150. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi there. My name Go is ahead. Patricia Legg. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Legg. I am not a resident of Vancouver. Um, I live in your neighbor, Burnaby, but I am a parishioner of St. Augustine's and the grandparent of two of the school attendees. I support social housing, but find how is it possible for 65 individuals with mental health and addiction issues to even begin the road to reintegration into society when placed under the same roof and with scant support? And what of the other 64 uh, poor individuals that have to be exposed to, um, to these problems? Where does concern and compassion not enter into this equation? The site for this project is incredibly ill thought out. How is it possible that you would even consider, let alone go for rezoning, a site of this nature across from a playground which is as busy as can be and full of joyful children, as well as in the middle of an entry elementary school campus. The children use the block from 7th to Maple, up to 8th Street, and back to Arbutus for track and field, and for runs like the Terry Fox Run and school events at the church. It is well documented that one of the key challenges for supportive housing buildings is that they attract guests and, sadly, drug dealers. This is mentioned by uh, Judge uh, Fu. Excuse me, Speaker. Okay, I, I, I am okay, going to... And uh, other people. Speaker, I, this is mentioned by Judge Gove in a press release today opposing this model of housing. Mr. Eby must surely be in conflict of interest. And furthermore, okay, uh, in offering uh, to make speaker, changes. Speaker, okay, speaker, I will, you okay. are speaker, okay. you are uh, you are uh, you know uh, slightly defaming people here, so I would be very careful with that. I'll okay. allow you to continue, though. Okay, thank you. Um, so, in offering to make changes within the running of a facility, should things not go according to plan. May I remind you all that politicians remain at the vote, at the whim of the voter, so there is no guarantee that he who has promised he will make changes can fulfill the statement perhaps because perhaps he will not be um, re-elected. All I say is your first responsibility, Mayor and Council, is to the residents of Vancouver that elected you. I would ask you to please reconsider this ill-advised plan thought up by BC Housing and take a leaf from Premier Horgan's book where he had the courage to cancel the BC Museum renovation at listening to his electorate. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I will just thank you for uh, your participation tonight. And at Council, we are at 4.59. We will return at 6 o'clock uh, with uh, speaker number 151, John Legg. Thanks, Council, and we'll see you in an hour.
Welcome to TELUS Conferencing. To join the conference, Hey, Christy, can you hear me? Hi, Terry, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Beautiful. Thank you. Great. Thanks.
they're keeping track of attendance, I hope, and we'll just uh, have to let people know uh, at the end when what they've missed and what they haven't. So that's uh, that's great. So I'm going to call the uh, meeting back to order, and I'm going to uh, go to speaker 151, John Leg. 151, John Lake. Good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to my concerns, Mr. Mayor and Council. I oppose Thanks. the proposal for many reasons. It is a wrong model for any area as reliable research shows that housing many people with mental health and addictions in one building is not going to help them rehabilitate and integrate into society. Being near a SkyTrain station allows easy access, but it also allows escape to anyone who may wish to take advantage of the large number of vulnerable residents in this building. Okay, uh, Speaker, I, I am going to cautious, uh, caution you here to, to not uh, cast any aspersions on potential residents of this building, and that's drifting into that territory. So, Okay, sorry about you. that. Uh, I think that such a building is too close to other vulnerable people, namely young ch school children at St. Augustine School, young children at the nearby playground, and women at the Santa Maria Recovery Home uh, right next door. Therefore, I think that um, I don't believe this is the best that you can do for these people uh, in this building with your taxpayers' money. Thank you for uh, listening to my concerns. I think uh, Judge Gove will uh, have, or if he hasn't already spoken, will have issues that I could concur with. So he has written a recent article which uh, summarizes a lot of my concerns as well, and I think you have that, so I won't go into that in detail. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't see any questions for you, so I will move on to... Uh, the next speaker, Speaker 152, David Butcher, uh, is uh, listed here as being in person. Clerks? Uh, I'm on the telephone. Okay, great. Up to five minutes, please. Five minutes. Uh, I live in a townhouse on Fifth Avenue between Maple and Cypress, about four blocks away from the proposed project. I'm not a member of any organized group, but join with the majority of speakers from the community who have appeared before you who oppose this project. I've been a lawyer in the criminal justice system in this city for 36 years. I've been a prosecutor at Main Street, a criminal defense lawyer, and I've had some involvement with police cases uh, in recent years. Before becoming a lawyer, I was a ministry social worker for five years, including two years in the interior and three years at Vancouver Emergency Services. I've dealt with the social and legal consequences that flow from addiction, mental health, and homelessness on a weekly basis since 1980. I'm not an urban planner or a social scientist, uh, but those who have uh, supported this project don't have my experience either. My opposition to the project is based on its size and the uncertainties about the proposed demographics. In my experience as a criminal lawyer, congregating large numbers of people together who face challenges exacerbates rather than mitigates their challenges. When we put people in prison, the risk of recidivism is high. When we impose probation conditions that require offenders to live away from other offenders, we enjoy great success in rehabilitating those people. Simply put, gathering any large group of people encourages rather than discourages negative human behavior. It applies equally to Stanley Cup rioters or January the 6th Trump supporters or any collection of people who are similarly disposed. Large uh, numbers speaker, of people... I, I am going to caution you about comparing residents to January the 6th rioters in Capitol Hill. I think that's entirely inappropriate, so I just caution you there. Uh, it, it, well, it's a function of uh, how groups work together, and it's important that you should... It's not tradable. I, I, am, I am cautioning you. I'm cautioning you. Uh, my views, uh, I am, think my views would be shared by many of my peers in my profession. But today, a leader of that profession, Thomas, just Judge Thomas Gove, has spoken out more eloquently than I can, saying exactly the same thing. Our common professional experience leads us to a common opposition to this proposal. 
He said simply, the building and number of units proposed is simply too big to be anything more than a serious problem for the people living in the building and the people living in the neighborhood. You cannot ignore someone with his experience to do so would be utter folly. Uh, I recognize um, whether this is uh, acceptable or not, that it's politically expedient uh, to publicize a purported success uh, in, housing, in solving some of our social issues. The city owns the land and has, been, uh, uh, and has the very legitimate objective of housing uh, more than, or creating more than 300 units. It's simply too easy to say, bingo, here's a way to achieve a significant success without uh, incurring any land costs. The problem is that too much, uh, there's too much uh, emphasis being placed on short-term gain and success uh, without any realist, realistic assessment of uh, medium or long-term success. And that t brings me to my last point, which is uh, a serious concern about BC housing. Um, the report uh, prepared by Ernst & Young is particularly critical of their program design. And uh, at page 34 of the report, they say, Ernst & Young have said this, the gaps included included formal definition and agreement on program outcomes and how success will be measured and reported on. The net new resources, skills, and jurisdictional knowledge required to successfully deliver the programs. Impacts of existing programs on strategic priorities, such as sustainability and climate challenges. It goes on and on and on, but simply concludes the program frame frameworks uh, developed by BC Housing without sufficient guidance and information uh, from the government simply aren't uh, being done. Council cannot be in a position where it accepts any proposal or any aspect of any proposal from BC Housing when this report is facing you and being entirely or very critical of uh, its program assessment. You need to go back to square one and start again and move to the, the, project, the projects that everyone seems to be recommending, smaller, distributed throughout the city, fully supported units that will work in the long run and help the disadvantage in our community for the rest thank of their lives. I have lives. to say thank you very much, Eric, right there's five minutes. But you do have, you, you. you are done with time, but you do have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Yes, I, I just wanted to confirm that, that your speaker 152, David Butcher, did you say that you were a lawyer? Yes, I've been a lawyer for 36 years. I'm just looking, did, were you, uh, appointed Queen's Council in 2010? I was. Thank you very much. I'd be interested if you if you haven't done so already, if you would uh, send your detailed comments to Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, that's it for questions from Council speaker. Uh, thanks for coming in and sharing your views. I'm going to move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Speaker 153, Constance Lim. Hello. Hi there. Up Hi. to five minutes, I, please. Okay. I live in Kitsilano and oppose the rezoning of the above site because of the size of the building that's being proposed. I am a retired social worker. I am not an expert on housing. I'm not an expert on trauma or mental health or addictions, but I do know what my own experience in working with individuals with challenges has been over my 35-year career. As a social worker, I worked with many, many individuals, many parents with addictions and mental health needs, and providing support to them was a major part of my work. A majority of my clients had traumatic childhoods and life circumstances. Um, Unfortunately, many of my clients were not able to parent even. I tried very hard to promote a relationship between parents and their children. Some of my clients experiencing addictions and mental health issues were sheltered in SROs, and, be and some became homeless. From my experience, a common theme I heard from clients that led to their drug alcohol dependency was being influenced by what they said was the, being around a bad crowd, uh, at the same time as experiencing some form of trauma. Often, unfortunately, childhood abuse. So 
So the kinds of supports needed to make a positive impact on the person experiencing trauma, mental health, and addictions, issues is, uh, I know it's multifaceted. Many individuals I worked with had an involvement with the community mental health team, but when a person is experiencing crisis at any given time, that person needs emotional support right then and there. Uh, have you ever tried talking to someone with mental health issues who's in crisis when the whole world is falling apart and there's no end in sight to the problem they're facing? It often takes hours in one day. I have spoken to people and have taken hours of my day to talk to one person because they're experiencing a very challenging day. And then I speak to them consecutive days, listening to them, supporting them. It, it's very, it's a lot, it's challenging work. Um, I found that due to their fragile emotional states, it doesn't take much to trigger a crisis. So housing 64 residents needing support in one building, to me, is a recipe for disaster. Some residents will be referred to the mental health team or professionals for ongoing help, as I said, but it's the assistance that's required in the moment at any given time when something triggers a reaction or behavior, that's the kind of support they need on site. That's why I feel having 64 residents who may need immediate help at any given time is too many to be housed in one location, and their needs are far greater than what a two-person on-site operator can provide. Um, a smaller building, perhaps 50% smaller or even less, that re requires supports is a much more viable option for success as seen in the scattered housing models. Council has voted in to keep neighborhoods safe, and I do not feel this is a safe plan for the residents who will be living in this proposed building, nor for the staff, and not for people in the neighborhood who, neighborhood who may get in the way of someone experiencing crises. Thank you. Thanks for your time tonight. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, but do appreciate you calling in. Uh, next is um, uh, Speaker 154, Dangul Charter, Chandler, sorry. Chandler, Dangul Chandler. Chandler yep. can you hear me? Sure can, okay. up to five minutes, Hi. please. Okay, thank you. Um, I apologize if I'm not able to uh, pronounce all words. I just had a root canal about half a, an hour ago, but I will do my best. Um, so hello, city councillors and the mayor. Thank you for this opportunity to voice my opinion. I'm Dangwali Chandler. I'm a mom of two young girls. Um, they're under age of eight. I moved to Canada 12 years ago. I'm a Canadian citizen and a resident of Kitsilano. Both my girls went to daycare that is located at the Kitsilano neighborhood house, that we, and we live exactly at the 500 meters mark from the proposed building. A working mom um, who four years ago volunteered many hours to be rebuild uh, the Little Wings daycare on the Sea Island. This project was successful due to the fact that was supported by the daycare parents, local businesses, neighbors, and the government. I have a lot of concerns about this project. I oppose it, and I ask you all to vote against it. I oppose for many reasons, and within the next uh, couple of minutes, I will list most of them. First of all, the site cannot support such a tall building. It's too small. It won't be integrated into the neighborhood, and it just won't work. It was already explained by the expert why this type of building won't work. This building won't work not only for the neighbors, but for the proposed 129 tenants that would occupy those units. Number two, tenants. We do not know about the tenants that will live there, and I don't think it is fair for you to make this decision with not knowing what type of project this is. I would say please consult the future tenants and their future neighbors. I read the article called uh, Homelessness is the Least Interesting Thing About Them, written by Chelsea Minhas, who lives in Langley. She's a social worker and the associate director of the Covenant House, Vancouver. She explains the reasons why people end up on streets. Some are foster care, some experience mental health challenges, diagnosed and not diagnosed. Some experience abuse and fleeing to streets um, seems like a safe option. 
we should take a proactive, not reactive approach here and create programs and support system for them. They should have a safe place to share their fears and worries, obtain education. What you told us, this will be studio apartments and families will not be living together. They will be living in two separate units. How many of you live in two separate units and pay rent or choose to pay two mortgages? That doesn't make any sense to me. Number three, it's wrong location. This is an inappropriate location for this type of project. You demolished a non-for-profit daycare. How useful would have been to have working moms drop off their children and be equal contributors towards the family? Within 500 meters, you have um, daycares, Kitsilano Child Care Society, 260 meters, Montessori Daycare Society, 300 meters, Bumble Bear, 500 meters, Reach for the Stars, 80 meters. You have elementary schools, Lord Tennyson, 450 meters, Madrona, 240 meters, St. Augustine School, 80 meters, St. John's School, 450 meters. You also have before and after school programs in the area, as well as at least um, other, I think, two or three private schools that educate children of various ages. Number four, I'm concerned about the reasons and lack of logic of this project. I address to you all, you should be taking a proactive, again, not reactive approach towards homelessness. And the fact that families with two working adults cannot live in Vancouver, it's not a local problem. There are many reasons people are homeless in Canada. Based on what I heard, I'm concerned that this is not a well thought out project. I'm asking you to vote against it. Go back to the beginning and reassess the site and select a suitable project for this location. Please utilize your positional power wisely with care for the city's residents. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any questions for you, so I do thank you for calling in tonight. Uh, next, we have John Kettlewell, Speaker 155. Number 50, 155 is not on the line. Thanks. Uh, speaker 156 is Marina Abraham. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you. I'm Marina Abraham, and I'm a resident of Vancouver. I'm here to strongly oppose this BC housing proposal, which is on Arbutus between West 7th and West 8th. I'm not against subsidized housing, but as a project manager, I cannot support a project lacking as much details as this proposal. I did not see anywhere and did not hear in any of the sessions that any risk analysis occurred. To the opposite, there is a denial that any risk exists, and accordingly, there has been no risk mitigation planning, and there aren't any qualitative, and I repeat qualitative, success qualifiers for this project. All what I heard from the discussion with the project officials and supporters that occurs over the last few sessions and even today, approve, and we will figure out details later. I find this astonishing. The tenant's composition is at the heart of the application. The proposal did say up to 100% low barrier congregate. It's not the public that brought up the tenant's topic, but the applicants themselves. You find me shocked that we are asked to provide our support without discussing the terms of the project. One fact, however, that there will be an on-site injection facility less than 20 meters away from an elementary school and children's park and many other schools my previous, the previous speaker has mentioned. And, and yet, it's incomprehensible to me, I have to say, that we are still considering this proposal. The association did say that they would ensure that the mix of tenants is right, it was repeated today, and it will change over time according to best practices. However, no details were provided, and when a member of the council explicitly asked about best practices in previous session, they could not answer. How can we approve a proposal without preventative and reactive action plans for reducing the likelihood of risk? Are we going to wait for the problem or for someone to get stabbed with a needle like it happened downtown, but this time would be a child? 
The applicants also mentioned that the tenants are chosen depending on the care provided in the facility. The proposal, however, includes minimum support, very vaguely described, and yet it already decided that it will be a minimum of 65 units and up to 129 units low barrier congregate. I find that very contradicting. We cannot approve a proposal without having a long-term vision and just leave the details to chance. As multiple speakers mentioned from experience, when a project is complete and problems do arise, there is no response to resolve issues. Another argument mentioned that if this proposal is not accepted, the funds will be redirected to another community. What's wrong with that? I asked the esteemed council. If the risks we are raising do realize, who will answer for the misuse of funds in millions? Why not put this funding into rehabilitation centers and providing work opportunities or other uh, better composition of tenants so that we eliminate the problem from its roots? And we heard from multiple insiders during these sessions that low barrier congregate housing are not successful. I have to say, I heard many discriminatory comments from some of the project officials and supporters stating, quote unquote, independent schools, private schools. Does this make the children attending less valuable? For your info, I have no children, but I was appalled by these insinuations. Approving this proposal as it is clearly declares that these privileged children, quote unquote, are really not important. The building, finally, the building is massive and many people, and we had an engineer on the session. We, I heard him. I saw his presentation. It's already uploaded. It's massive. It's very dense. 13 floors on three very narrow streets does not follow any standards. And by the way, that's not a Broadway. I have a couple more facts related and answer questions, but I'm not sure how I'm doing with the timing, so I'll skip those. You've In some 20, 20 the seconds size left. of the building. Sorry? Just 20 seconds left. Thanks. So in summary, the size of the building and the risks associated with this proposal outweigh the hypothetical good it claims it will bring. And therefore, I urge you to vote no for this application. However, I do recommend VC Housing to come back with a complete proposal for a reasonable size building that provides residents to low-income families, single parents, seniors, and maybe a portion for a rehabilitation center. I thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I will uh, just move to the next speaker, uh, who is 158, Ar Arizo uh, Zarabian. Zarabian. Hi, my name is Arizo Zarabian, and I'm here today as a resident that lives within blocks of this proposed site, a parent of a preschooler who attends preschool one block away from the site, a wife of a small business owner who runs his business within a few blocks of the site. Before anyone on this council or mayor think of my motives, I have set them out at the forefront. I will be living with your decision as an active member in this community and have every right to present my opposition to the development proposal. As a resident, I was never sent any information on regarding this proposal. I would like to bring attention, like many citizens did before me, that no consultation via mail, phone, or neighborhood canvassing was done appropriately. I thought I may have missed something about this when speaking to my neighbors. It seems there's a difference of opinion of what actual consultation was done in our neighborhood. I do not agree with the narrative that has been portrayed of NIMBYism when addressing this issue as BC Housing and the City of Vancouver have not been upfront with the details of what the residents will have made available for services. People who have been reading and educating themselves with the housing models have learned that simply warehousing individuals does not address the issues many residents are dealing with. I ask with the movement of residents into this proposed 13-story building, what services will be provided? Will there be an actual guarantee that an OPS site will not be added in the future? From what I have heard, we are not allowed to ask these questions or have any guarantees. Let's also address what happened to the neighborhoods that have single room occupancy type housing without the proper services offered. As seen through an FOI request, calls in the neighborhood drastically increase, street disorder increases, and so too does public disorder. I would also like to address that as much as the city keeps saying the development will not be SROs, 
I would like to know how they explain that young families who are barely making rent can't move in and couples cannot cohabitate together. And it was used as an example that if there are couples, they would occupy two different units, as mentioned the first evening of the hearing by the city planner. I understand housing and affordability are key issues in the city of Vancouver. I also understand that there are a vast group of young citizens working minimum wage jobs or struggling families on over a decade-long wait list for suitable housing. Why can we not offer this development for these groups? Or we develop this to include the services needed for the homeless population the city is targeting. Offering to two caretakers to manage the building as in the structure, but not the residents, does not do anything to aid the residents that need proper care and services. If we really want to address homelessness, it is not just providing homes, but offering wraparound services, not to mention addressing the mental health crisis we have been long ignoring. In conclusion, I strongly ask that you oppose this plan. This model is not going to be successful and is purely demonstrative in other neighborhoods around the city. 7,000 residents will be affected by this proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, calling in this evening. I don't see any uh, questions for you. So I will move on to the uh, next speaker who is 159 Eva uh, Voldona. Hello, can you hear there, me? Up to five. Yeah, sure can, up to five minutes, please. Okay, hello, my name is Eva Wadon. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on the proposed rezoning. Given my long career and practical experience with social housing, I strongly oppose this proposal. I'm a retired professional planner, management consultant, and seniors advocate who served three terms on the city seniors advisory committee. I was also on the board of Entre Nous Femme, Family Housing, and managed the seniors and disabled housing at Maple Crest Apartments at 7th and Arbutus. We all want our city to be livable, healthy, safe, age-friendly, inclusive, and ready for climate change. But we must work together to accomplish that. For me, the most egregious fault of this application is that it is unprofessional and unethical. It omits the city's own research on zoning, which clearly stated that demand for social housing is 7,900 units versus 4,100 for supportive housing. It also falsely claims broad support for this proposal, despite even initial feedback indicating 9 of those opposed versus 2 of 8 supporting. This hearing process is showing many more citizens, I would say 90%, being against it. Also, planning department, BC Housing, and Minister of Housing are misleading and confusing the public by equating to very distinct types of housing, social and supportive. There have been no assessment of public health implications in regard of the consequences of squeezing unhealthy residents into crowded congregate housing conditions, like those in nursing homes which we know accelerated the spread and dying of viruses like COVID. Also, no assessment by the VPD of the impact on the proposed operation of 120Y residents known to require frequent interventions in addition to need for more policing of the subway terminal, a bus station, and the liquor store, all a block away. Now you know the rezoning and proposed buildings are not welcome. And with all the negative publicity, the residents of the proposed building will be stigmatized and will lack anonymity, exactly what was to be avoided. You now have an opportunity to make a truly positive decision. Keep the zoning as is and ask BC Housing to resubmit a project proposal to provide social housing for women, single mothers and seniors. Why? As we see, the world is turning against women, from the Taliban, the U.S. Supreme Court, various state governments. Let Vancouver offer meaningful support for women, knowing they will be welcome and would integrate easily and contribute positively into this diverse community of families and senior citizens. BC Housing, the proponent here, has assumed the lot will be automatically rezoned, or as Minister E.B. said, it is done deal. As you can see, it isn't and it cannot be. Surely, we still have an independent council and public input-based planning process. 
We don't live in a totalitarian system where a senior government can dictate to a freely elected local government what they must approve or threaten them with financial and legal consequences if they don't. I was shocked to hear the Minister of Housing say he plans to dismantle Vancouver distinct neighborhoods and local public participation and instead bring people from outside Vancouver in front of council to support his preferred project. I'd like to ask Mr. Mayor and all council members, please withstand that political pressure and act independently according to your educated personal wisdom and advice from so many of your constituents. Your Vancouver residents will be grateful. And we will remember in October election how you voted on that rezoning. Thank you. Thank you. You do have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. I, I just like to clarify again that it was Speaker 159, Eva Widolna. Yes. Is that correct? I just it's wasn't correct. sure of the spelling of your surname. And you said that you served on our seniors committee for the city? It is seniors advisory committee and I served three terms. And I was chairing the housing subcommittee and transportation subcommittee. And I was involved Roughly. with Steve Manor project, which also dealt with issues of uh, senior housing and mixing people of different, very different backgrounds to detriment of seniors. And your academic and professional background? It's, it's planning, business, gerontology. Very good. Thank you very much for answering my questions. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for questions. Thank you. I will move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Speaker 160, Brian Hunt. 160, Hi. Brian Hunt. Hello, Hi, up to five minutes, please. Yeah, go ahead, okay, up to five minutes. Uh, Mayor Stewart, councillors, uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Brian, and I'm a longtime resident of Vancouver. I am for social housing, but in strong opposition of this proposed development between 7th and 8th and Arbutus. As residents, we're not allowed to talk about the potential residents for this building. We're expected to sign a blank check and take whatever BC Housing gives us. So with that in mind, I will talk about a similar model building, Marguerite Ford. It was opposition to the building of Marguerite Ford and BC Housing in the city told the neighborhood, don't worry, everything will settle down within six months of the residents moving in. It's been nine years and crime in the Olympic Village has gone way up. EPD data shows nine years on, Marguerite Ford averages 900 calls to the building per year. That's roughly three times per day. Many councillors have asked speakers if they would be willing to be part of a CAC, a community advisory committee. This suggests councillors know the building will bring problems to the neighbourhood. CACs are not needed for most buildings. I would ask any councillor who votes for this project to join the CAC to solve the problems of this building. I'm going to quote from the November 9th, 2021 Community Advisory Committee meeting for Marguerite Ford. Community member, there's a large number of people asking what to do about discarded needles on the streets, alleys, and sidewalks. He gets calls about piles of hundreds of needles scattered across the alley, and hours later, they're still there. Sharps containers readily available nearby. How can we get people to use them so others in the neighborhood feel safe accessing their neighborhoods? There's been a similar issue with human feces and the unwillingness of the city to clean it up. Community member, there seems to be a lot of ambulances and fire trucks around. Are the number of emergency calls increasing year over year? Response, usually that's the number VPD reports on. We're in the midst of a drug poisoning epidemic, so people are dying from poison drugs. That is probably what you're witnessing. I'm sure you've seen on the news the health authorities and the coroners reporting on the numbers. The CAC report goes on and talks a lot about break-ins all over the neighborhood and the need to put up gates outside residence. It's been nine years in BC housing and the city can't fix Marguerite Ford. And now they want to bring the same broken roller coaster into the kids and plant it right in between a school and a recovery home. This just seems like a very, very bad idea. Many councillors have implied that if they don't vote in favor of this development, funding from BC housing will go away. This is a false argument because if BC Housing doesn't fund this project, it will fund another housing project somewhere else, which will house low-income people or those at risk of losing their homes. BC Housing's whole purpose is to fund these projects. 
You're not going to use the funds to go buy something else. In closing, clearly by the amount of opposition to this project, it's very controversial. For somebody to vote in favor, they must have a lot of conviction that everything is going to work out well. I would suggest anyone who votes yes should be willing to have their name put on the building. So if Mayor Stewart votes for this, he should be willing to have the building called the Kennedy Stewart Building, and this will be his legacy. If everything works out, it'll be a good legacy. If it doesn't work out, then he might not want to have his name on the building. If you are not prepared to put your name on this building, your gut is telling you there's something wrong with this project in its current form, and you wouldn't want it to be your legacy. Again, I ask for reason and common sense to pose this current proposal and go back to the drawing board so a better option can be found. Thank you. Thanks for your call tonight. I uh, don't see any questions for you, so I will move to the next speaker, speaker number 161, Yvette Liu. Speaker 161 and 162 have both withdrawn. Thank you, clerks. Uh, just to remind council, uh, we are now on 163 of 284 uh, registered speakers. Uh, and that would be, sorry, clerks, it's 162 and 163 have withdrawn. Speaker 161 and 162. Great, thanks. We're on speaker 163 then, who is uh, Cheryl, Cheryl Picardo. Not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Speaker 164, Patrick Cleary. Hello, this is Patrick. Can you hear me? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, Mayor and Councillors, as you know, my name is Patrick, <laughs> and I'm a resident of Vancouver. I oppose the rezoning application. I share the concerns of the eloquent and passionate residents of Vancouver that you've already heard from in opposition to this project, but I will not repeat those concerns. Instead, I will use my five minutes to outline the funding model for this project, the operating agreement, and the operating agreement and why this should matter to you, particularly as mayor and also as council, both in considering this rezoning application and in the face of the upcoming fall election. On repeated occasions throughout this hearing, we have heard and the suggestion has been made that if council does not approve this rezoning for this site, funding could be lost and allocated to different areas for different support services in this province. <clears throat> I submit that this is a red herring. Funding for this project has been specifically set aside for supportive housing located anywhere in the city of Vancouver. In May 2020, which is an important date to note, May 2020, Council approved in camera the draft terms of a Memorandum of Understanding, an MOU, between the city BC Housing, and CMHC for the Permanent Supportive Housing Initiative. And later, on July 28, 2020, the Vancouver Affordable Housing Association issued a preliminary site approval recommendation for this specific site under the initiative. And that recommendation confirmed that BC Housing, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC are entering into an MOU, which, as we know, was approved in May to deliver more than 300 units of supported housing across the city of Vancouver. BC Housing will fully fund the capital and operating costs of the projects, as well as manage construction. CMHC will contribute to the capital costs, and the city will provide the site via nominal ground lease. So what we know from that is that the MOU was approved in principle by council prior to the recommendation that the Arbutus site was suitable for the proposed building. Any suggestion that funding would be lost if this particular site is not approved for rezoning is at best inaccurate and at worst misleading. The second point I wanted to talk about is the operating agreement. Which there is a sample agreement for the BC Building BC Supportive Housing Fund and Operating Agreement, and it's closely related to the topic of funding. This agreement will have the single biggest impact on the success or failure of this building if it is approved. We have been told that the operating agreement is negotiated between BC Housing and the operator, and its terms are not yet known. Because this is city-owned land, the truth is Council can and should impact the terms of the operating agreement. 
It can do so by mandating require provisions in the housing agreement and the lease to BC housing to minimize risks. And these conditions ought to include, at a minimum, a divert, uh, six, six points, a diversity of unit types. Secondly, minimum staffing levels. Thirdly, on-premises recovery-based health services. Four, criminal record checks. Five, measures to minimize shadowing on the school playground and park. And six, measures to minimize traffic risks. If council does not have sufficient information right now to implement these conditions, such as like optimal levels of staffing, a question that BC Housing itself is unable to answer, this rezoning application must be rejected. Clarity is needed before council can discharge its duty to the public to make this decision. So at this point, you may be wondering why you should do anything other than rubber stamp this application. Your mandate is to tackle a homelessness crisis that is getting worse year over year. But how does council meaningfully tackle a homelessness crisis? It can start by forcing BC Housing's hand to get better results for the proposed residents and neighbors. We know the funds will not disappear. Neighbors and the community are more than willing to engage in a meaningful dialogue to support a building that is compatible with this unique location and the shared goal of getting folks off the street and guaranteeing them the supports they need. You are brave enough to run for public office and I ask you to be brave enough to reject this rezoning application so a solution with the community can be created, something better for everyone. Thank you. Councillor Hardwick has uh, questions for you, Councillor Hardwick. Yes, uh, thank you, and very briefly, did you FOI this uh, material yourself? Uh, there was a group that did, yes. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate. That's it, just wanted to know where it came from. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to <clears throat> speaker 165. Darcy Rattle it. Speaker 165. Hello, can you hear me? Sure can. Can you hear me? Good. Yes, we can. Please go Mayor ahead. Mayor and Council. Thank you. My name is Darcy Radlett, and I'm a resident of Vancouver, though not Kitsilano. I was born in Vancouver and have lived here all my life. I registered as opposed to the application, but I believe I've listened with an open mind thus far. I watched the presentations by the applicant team on June 28th and then reviewed the available presentation material. I believe I'm at least as aware of the significant homelessness problems that Vancouver has as most in our city and have observed the gradual increase over several decades leading up to where we are now. Last year, for example, we had a significant collection of derelict campers and vans and number of cars parked long term just up our street. Their occupants were all doing the best they could in their circumstances. The need for dignified, safe and affordable homes is very clear. The humanity of the proposed project seems laudable, and it appears, at least on the surface, to significantly address the needs of many vulnerable persons in our city. But what I heard from the applicant team on June 28th was unsettling, and more so what they failed to say. In a nutshell, I heard that the tower is designed to the maximum height allowed according to the recent Broadway corridor restrictions in order to house the maximum number of in-need persons. What this seems to mean is that if more floors could be built, that is exactly what would be done. Maximum persons housed in one place appears to be the principal objective. And it's a shame, really, because this project could have been a slam dunk, a home run. But instead of carefully balancing the true needs of the one vulnerable population against the cost to another vulnerable population, really the elementary age children in the school, for instance, and the neighborhood children who use the park, the singular goal of maximum persons on minimum land in order to fulfill quota has won out. I also heard that the proposed operator of the project doesn't have particular experience with this scale of housing project. And instead of explaining how they'll address the many valid concerns that were expressed, they maintain that they'll simply figure it out when the time comes. I heard them refer several times to their self-declared decades of experience with small projects or smaller projects but little else of substance for a project of this scale, and it's important. Finally, if the applicant team was sincerely interested in making this project a success for the whole neighborhood, they would have first gathered support from at least the school and the nearby church, as well as the surrounding homes, Sanct Maria House, and the several private daycares in the area. 
I didn't hear that they even tried, so I'm left to understand that they didn't bother. I guess the project isn't really intended to be a success for the neighborhood at all. So I'm left with a clear impression that the applicant team is not really motivated by social justice, but is actually on balance, insincere and cynical, and above all, politically calculating, simply gathering up as many people as possible at one time and relocating them to give the impression of progress on a truly grave social concern. Many, many years ago, I hear, it was sadly not uncommon for police in one city to gather up police living on, or people rather, living on street on streets for one reason or another and give them a bus ticket to another province. Dreadful, right? The applicant team, in my view, is doing a little better, massing people who are indeed in real need of help into a centralized monolith of a structure and, from what I heard, likely leaving them to manage for themselves. And if the building could legally be 10 floors taller and twice as packed with in-need tenants, it would appear the applicant team would have proposed that this is in the very best interest of all those people and would have present, presented that solution instead. I'm now strongly opposed to this proposal, and I'm asking council to send the applicant team back to the drawing board. And quickly, because time is of the essence, they should have brought a feasible and broadly supportable solution to council to begin with. That's all I have to say at this time. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, uh, Mayor, this is the clerk. I think you're on mute. Hi, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Speaker, for coming in <clears throat> and speaking. I don't see any questions for you. Um, and I am just going to, uh, just before I go to the next speaker, I'm just going to check something quickly with the clerks. Thank you. Hey, Council, I'll just uh, remind again at this time that uh, we, we do have to keep cameras on in order to maintain a uh, quorum. If you are online, I believe the clerk said we have just seven people uh, here this evening, so we just have to be careful. Uh, with that, I will um, move to the next speaker, who is uh, Heidi Battiston, Speaker 166. Hello? Hi there. Please me? go ahead. Up. Yep, up to five minutes, please. Okay. okay, thanks so much. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Heidi Battiston. I am a resident of Vancouver. I have previously lived in Kitsilano, currently work in Kitsilano, and know the neighborhood very, very well. Initially, my concerns about this proposal pertained to how the project would affect the community, specifically the children, seniors, and other vulnerable populations who live, work, and play in the area. However, as I have educated myself about this project, I have also developed a deeper concern for the homeless population and those who may potentially reside within the proposed building. My opposition to this application primarily revolves around the lack of adequate communication, uh, sorry, community consultation, the design and physical size of the building, traffic management and safety surrounding the project, and the lack of clear information regarding really important details, such as the supportive services provided to those individuals living in the building. No one can deny that there is a serious housing and homeless problem in Vancouver. This is not a new issue and has, in fact, been a problem which has not been properly addressed for decades. It is unfortunate that at this late date, the residents of Vancouver, particularly Kitsilano, only have the opportunity to either voice their support 
or opposition to this proposal. If nothing else, the passion shown by the residents of Kitsilano is laudable, whether for or against the proposal at hand. However, the consultation and engagement of these residents and key partners was not adequate. So now at this late date, the opportunity to create positive, affordable, and supportive recovery housing on city-owned property has now become a divisive issue. The city has owned this land and left it empty for many years. Why was supportive housing of appropriate size and scope not previously built? Urgency should not dictate that a congregate housing situation for 129 people is the only appropriate proposal for this site. This site should not be developed this way at all costs. I would hope that any residents living in the building would be afforded the dignity and respect that they deserve. Without mandating significant wraparound supports and services, I believe that these residents will struggle to be successful and community integration will be more difficult in a building of this type and size. A well-qualified architect who called in earlier showed that this building is simply too big for the size of the land owned by the city. It has no green space and cannot be altered. Coupled with the fact that there will be a transit hub directly beside the proposed building, this project in this particular location is just too much, too big in terms of height and density with too many questions and it is my belief that it will compromise the success of the potential residents and the neighbourhood as a whole. There is only so much that a community can absorb without safety becoming an issue. This proposal discounts the fact that the site is more suitable for a smaller scale housing option that would be more in keeping with the housing best practices and the neighborhood as a whole. Large scale projects of this kind are intended for larger arterial routes where the density can be absorbed into the streetscape. Already traffic safety is sketchy at best. Along our beautiful between 7th and 8th Avenue, there's only one lane in each direction and frequently at the end of the school day, the area is overly congested. Soon this problem will only be increased with the addition of the Broadway subway line and adjacent bus loop. Having a building with no laneway access for emergency vehicles will only add to this problem and I fear that those needing emergency services, be they children, neighbours or residents of the proposed building, will not receive the urgent services that they may need in a timely manner. It is disheartening that when questions have been raised regarding building composition, supports and operating budgets, complete and, sorry, complete and adequate answers have not been given. Without critical questions being answered, I do not know how you as Mayor and Council can approve this application. If BC, houses, if BC Housing is allowed to move forward with this proposal in one neighbourhood, when there are still so many questions to be answered, this can also happen in any other neighbourhood in Vancouver. In conclusion, Vancouver needs affordable and supportive recovery housing. However, I am given no other choice other than to oppose this rezoning application. This application on this site is not the appropriate urban design response to housing problems that are faced by the City of Vancouver. There will be no victory in building this project if the building residents are not successful. There will be no victory in building this project if the Kitsilano community is compromised. Your victory will be in a truly collaborative approach in which all can thrive. Please listen to all those people who you represent at City Hall, including children. Oppose this proposal and send it back to the applicant. Thank you so much for your time and for your service. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I will uh, move on to the uh, next speaker. Uh, but thanks again for calling in. Uh, speaker 167. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Barbara Stefanaska is speaker number 167. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, the University of British uh, Columbia. I'm a teacher and uh, a scientist. Uh, I'm currently actually in Europe and uh, it's 4 a.m. for me. I stayed up all night uh, to talk to you, which also shows you how important uh, this uh, meeting is for me. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, Vancouver and uh, Kitsilano uh, area. Uh, I'm concerned uh, about this uh, rezoning application and uh, I'm opposing uh, this application. Uh, I won't repeat what I submitted in my written uh, comments. 
uh, and I won't also repeat what other uh, people very nicely um, discussed. Uh, I only want to um, emphasize one thing. So I'm fully uh, uh, for building supportive housing. And it's very important in uh, current situation um, in Vancouver and in many other large cities. Uh, and I know that we do all this for vulnerable population. Uh, but I want you to think uh, also about the community and especially children uh, that will be uh, affected uh, by this building. The building will be in proximity to many uh, schools, daycares, playgrounds. And we need to think about children. Children are also a vulnerable population. And we adults are responsible for creating a proper environment for them. And having a building like this in a very close proximity to uh, schools, playgrounds, daycares, and it's, it's not appropriate uh, for, for many, many reasons. And again, I won't list all of them. So I just want you to reconsider uh, this application and, uh, and this uh, location can be used in a much uh, better way uh, by building, for example, a supporting housing for single mothers or seniors who will integrate into the community in a much smoother uh, way and uh, the project will benefit both uh, sides. So thank you uh, again for uh, listening and uh, I also ask you not to um, uh, let the political pressure uh, affect you uh, and just uh, consider all the uh, pros and cons and in my view and in view of all the people you heard today and in uh, previous days, uh, there are much more cons. So I really trust your uh, judgment and uh, uh, I really hope that uh, the outcome of this meeting will benefit everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, there are no questions for you, so I think you can finally turn in. Thank you so much for uh, calling in this evening. Uh, Council, we uh, will move on to 168. Uh, Ian uh, Migakovsky. Hello. Hi there, up to five minutes, Hello. please. Hi. Well, thank you very much for listening to me, hearing me, giving me the opportunity. Um, I appreciate the time and energy and patience that Council uh, spends. And um, thank you again. Um, and I want to uh, acknowledge that I am on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Um, I live on the same block as the proposed um, application for the slot rezoning development for uh, 2086 to 2098 West 7th Avenue and Arbutus, at Arbutus. Um, I will try today to stick to the topic of form and location that you request we stick to. Um, although I do uh, appreciate the other people that are opposed to this and have spoken to, spoken to other issues. Um, I am directly affected by this proposed development. This building is too big. This building is too tall. It doesn't fit into any of the zoning. Currently, even the really lenient and flexible zoning of the Broadway plan, which was recently passed, I think that's correct. Um, so I know that other 
speakers before me have talked to this issue. I'm more knowledgeable. I know engineers, architects have talked about how it is too large, too big, and too tall, um, and that the setbacks are correct and that the sidewalks are too small. Now, I did hear uh, for a minute, anyways, trying to follow all this um, today. Um, I did hear the uh, city planner who is responsible for this particular development um, talk about, I think he mentioned that um, they acknowledge that uh, the setbacks are correct, building is uh, taller than it should be for the space that it's on, etc., and that um, therefore they were going to have uh, expand the sidewalk width on Arbutus. I think it's 10 feet. Now, Arbutus is not a high street. It's not a wide street at all. Uh, you're going to have a 10 foot wide sidewalk. I'm not sure I heard that correct. Um, we already have emergency vehicles coming into the corner of um, East 7th and Arbutus and uh, Southeast 7th and Arbutus. Um, right across from the park, right across from the school. Uh, 7th is a uh, active bike route. Um, Arbutus doesn't really have the width for this. Um, emergency vehicles, which there probably will be a lot of first responders, could be, uh, due to the nature of the building, which I can't talk about for some reason, even though it has a safe injection site on it. So. Who knows what what will happen, right? But there could be more. Uh, there could be a lot of uh, emergency vehicles, including uh, first responder fire trucks that show up. Um, I believe that is a really uh, risky, unsafe, and uh, issue, and maybe a liability uh, that you would need to consider. I think you've heard that before from a lawyer. I think um, as well. This whole corner and this whole area already um, has driver overload. I believe Christine Doyle spoke to that. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, there is a um, our Butte's Greenway, which already, which I think is great, you know. I cycle, I walk, I don't drive. I don't have, I, once in a while I get to drive. Um, I don't have a car. Most of the people in my neighborhood don't have cars. And we've chosen to live very lightly on the earth. Uh, we're already uh, living in dense situations. And uh, anyway, so safety of the children, I think, is a stake. Safety of my neighbor, uh, I'm a senior. Yeah. Speaker, I have I have let you go over the time, uh, so I'm I'm just going to oh, stop you there. Oh, one minute warning. Yeah, did I just say one more thing, please? Then uh, you're you're actually well over. You're almost a minute over, so I'm I'm just going to cut it there. And uh, I don't see any questions for you, but do thank you so much for calling in. Oh, please uh, don't take our sunlight away. Thank you. Uh, speaker one sixty nine is next. Uh, Mateo Estrada. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're a little faint, so if you could just make sure to speak directly into your micro, uh, your receiver, that would be great. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's okay. I'll just let you know if it, if it gets any worse. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Matteo Estrada. I'm 16 years old and currently a grade 10 student and a graduate of St. Augustine's class of 2019. After listening to both flip sides and based on my personal experiences, I'm here to speak my mind on why I don't agree with this plan. When I look at the location of this planned out building, I see a preschool, a playground, an elementary school, and a house filled with women who have overcome their own struggles with addiction. It is, in my opinion, a very poor spot to put a building. 
with this building. I do not know. Sorry, you are you are breaking. Line. You're breaking up Just a little bit. Piece of land. Oh, can you hear me? You are breaking up a little bit, so I'll just uh, ask you. Yes, you are breaking up a little bit, so I'll just uh, uh, try to keep going. I do. Um, can you hear me? Yep, I just keep going, but it's it's not a great reception. Okay, I do not know whether the building is being planned just because it is a piece of land owned by the city and because it must be used for something just for the sake of doing something with it, or because you feel this is truly the right thing to do for everyone. But I think it is time that everyone is listened to. I don't disagree that these buildings are necessary in the city, as there are huge amounts of people needing homes and opportunities. However, the way we are going about this in this size of the building and the plans on how, we've com- of how we are planning to accomplish this are worryingly vague. One of the smaller problems is the shade and how other places this building will be. This will be fun right, look, speaker, we are we are we're having a, a difficult time calling you. What I would suggest is that, that perhaps you call back on a on a different line, um, uh, because you are fading in and out, and uh, we can't we can't really make out what you're saying. So so perhaps if you call back on a different line, uh, just let the just let the clerks know, and uh, um, and we'll 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 let you back in. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move to speaker number 170, Joseph Valentinizi. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe, and I'm a grandfather who is strongly opposed to the proposal that is before you today. As a senior, you reach a point in your life where you can no longer be silent when you see something as broken as this proposal. The city's mental health and addiction crisis has not gotten any better. It has only gotten worse. I am am saddened to see that this city has failed the vulnerable and suffering, and now they're also failing an even more vulnerable group, our children. This proposal is a desperate attempt at what some believe to be a solution, But but what we have in reality before us is not only discriminatory to those this planned housing, but but will also have direct implications on neighbors who want to help. You are being tabled a proposal that has many implications seen and unseen. Congregate congregate housing does not work. I imagine imagine you are an, an individual with mental health and addiction issues, and each and every day you are surrounded by up to 129 other residents who struggle with the same issues and challenges. How is this supposed to promote recovery, health, and community integration? Even if support services and other programs were available, the residents of this large institutional tower would not be provided with the clinical supports on site. A building of the scale of hard-to-house residents will only serve to enable and perpetuate their decline. You also have to ask yourself, has BC Housing and Planners confirmed any form of supports? The answer is no. And any questions you, as counselors, have asked have gone unanswered from these groups. What kind of sound proposal is that? No one wants a project that would facilitate drug use within the building. BC Housing acknowledges it would never place families with children in a project like this but they think nothing of having this development less than 20 meters from an elementary school, a daycare, a toddler park, and a women's recovery home. As a grandfather of three young grandsons who attend school in the area, I ask why would the city even consider this location? The the individuals you are trying to help require complex care, and by approving this, you would be setting them up for inadequate inadequate care and a lack of resources to support them. This would be a great disservice, not only to them, but the school children in the area and greater community that will be negatively affected. It is totally unacceptable to the surrounding residences, but more so a grandfather that the 450 school children across the street 
and other 1,500 children within a three-block radius have been ignored and have not been thought of. Spillover effects are inevitable, and this is not acceptable to the concerned grandparent. Most of you are younger than I am, but you learn with age to look at everything in front of you before making a decision. If your gut tells you this is wrong, then there should be no hesitation. The answer to this proposal should be a resounding no. I am speaking on behalf and in support of my three grandsons, age seven, five, and two, the most vulnerable. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I don't see any questions for you, but do uh, thank you very much for calling in tonight. Uh, I'm going to go for Brian Poston, speaker number 171. Brian Poston. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Brian Poston. I've been a resident of Kitsilano for nearly 20 years. My wife and I have been raising two boys in the neighborhood, and we live in the immediate vicinity of the proposed housing project. I oppose the rezoning, and I urge all councillors and His Worship to vote against the proposed rezoning. I have a few comments to make, which I hope will resonate with you. First, the Urban Design Panel acknowledged in November 2021 that the design of the building does not incorporate any balcony space, in part because it believes the composition of the proposed tenants are at risk of jumping. This was not mentioned in the main <laughs> referral report. Oh, no. The proposed project will still have windows, yet knowing this risk, the project would stand the height of 18 stories directly across the street from a daycare and an elementary school. The operator stated at the November 2021 meeting that the future residents did not want a public life or to interact with the public. Yet the proposal is to place low stimulus residents behind, pardon me, beside a popular greenway, across the street from a public park, and next to a terminus station with 3,500 people passing through per hour. This makes no sense and flies in the face of Mr. Forsythe's comments that the residents will become part of the community. Second, there is no opportunity for family reintegration. <laughs> City staff stating that couples are, can be reintegrated by each having their own single unit is not reintegration. Rather, it's segregation within the same permanent container that is to be supplied by Nexi, of which our former mayor, Gregor Robertson, is a principal. An on-site premise injection site is not appropriate with 450 children 18 meters away. The proposal would allow for residents to inject illicit drugs 18 meters from an elementary school, yet legalized marijuana cannot be sold to adults within 300 meters of that same school. That would be an absurd result. Dr. Summers has written extensively about homelessness and addiction and provided 12 years of data to the NDP government. That valuable data he collected was obviously inconvenient to the NDP government as he was asked to destroy it and sanitize all media storage devices. This was an attempt to, de to deliberately destroy knowledge and is akin to attempted book burning. The incompetency... Uh, speaker, yes. I, I understand this is an uh, important topic for you, but if you can just, uh, you know, a bit of the hyperbole, if he just reduce that a little bit, that would be great. Thank all you. Right. The incompetency of BC Housing was exposed on June 30th. That incompetency is also reflected in this housing proposal. This past Tuesday afternoon, when interviewed by Gloria Makarenko, Minister Ebby said he was not surprised by the findings of Ernst de Young. He fired the Board of Commissioners at 6.30 p.m. last Friday because apparently BC Housing was using Excel spreadsheets and recording decisions by writing them down on something. The truth is, Ernst & Young exposed BC Housing to be a $2 billion funded dumpster fire under Minister Eby's watch. The BC, BC Housing proposal at 7th and Arbutus is one spark away from being yet another dumpster fire. Approval of this rezoning is that spark. I was particularly insulted and embarrassed by the comments made by city staff about how this proposal is consistent with the city's commitment to reconciliation. It is not consistent with any process of reconciliation. The assessment report reflects nothing that promotes the restoration of social 
and cultural power to Indigenous communities with respect to housing. On page six of the referral report, there is a reference to City of Reconciliation. It states, the city commits to form a sustained relationship of mutual respect and understanding with local First Nations and the urban Indigenous community. Reconciliation is a process. It is a two-way street. The two-way street requires consultation and a mutual exchange of experience and knowledge. There can be no mutual respect and understanding of Indigenous housing needs in a cultural context if there is no consultation. Section 7 of the referral report reflects no engagement with the local Indigenous community. Without such engagement, the assessment report reflects what city staff and housing thinks is best for our, our Indigenous hosts. Reconciliation is not is reconciliation is not reconciliation because we say it is. It is much more than that. It is not. We know what's best for you. That attitude Sorry, resulted in the passing your, of the Indian Act 155 years ago. You are at your five minutes, but uh, Councillor Carr has a question for you. Councillor Carr, go ahead. Um, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, I do have a question for you. Um, thanks for being here in person. Um, and uh, that you made a statement early on that I have. I have not heard anyone else make, and I don't know where you got it from, but I'm interested in your source. You said that uh, there was uh, some evidence that there would be uh, no balconies in the building because of uh, the risk of the tenants jumping. Wh where did you get that information from? That was um, stated at the two th November two 2021 uh, Urban Planning Design Panel meeting. The city's urban design panel. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate knowing that information. Thank you, uh, Councillor Carr. That's it for questions. Thank you so much for coming in tonight and sharing your views. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thanks. We're going to move on to Speaker uh, 172. Uh, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor um, it's the clerk yeah. here. Uh, speaker no number 169 is back on the line. Okay, great. Let's go for uh, Mateo Estrada. Speaker 169. Hello, Mayor. Can you hear me now? It, it still is a little uh, <laughs> choppy, but let, let's see what happens. Okay, sorry about that. Um, hello, my name is Mateo Estrada. I'm 16 years old and currently a grade 10 student and a graduate of the 2019 class. When I look at this location of this kind of building, I see a preschool, a playground, an elementary school, and a house in which we become our own struggle with the building. It is in my yeah, opinion speaker, a very first spot. Speaker, speaker here, still, you, you are still cutting out. Uh, we're missing like every second sentence. So um, I'm going to have to try to get you to call back in again. I, I really appreciate your diligence here. So and understand this isn't a regular thing for you. So uh, we will make an exception here and, and just give you another chance to, to call back in. But I am going to move uh, to to another a speaker who has a, a clearer line, uh, and that would be 172 uh, M. Wickham. Okay. Speaker 172 M. Wickham. One moment, uh, Mayor Stewart, it's the clerk here. We're just checking on that caller. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Mayor, would you, would you call the speaker again? They've been unmuted. Great. Do we have uh, M. Wickham, speaker number 172? M. Wickham, speaker 172. Um, Mayor, it's the clerk. Uh, the caller has disconnected. Okay, great. We'll go for 173. Uh, Laura de Munane, 
Give me name. Thank you. Speaker one. Hi, Hi there. Hi there. Uh, th thank Hi you, there, Council, please. for the opportunity. Thank you, Council, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm a resident of Vancouver, born here and raised in East Van. I am strongly opposed to the rezoning application. Today's city rezoning planner, Chi Chan, told you that there were no traffic concerns. I'm here to tell you that he is absolutely wrong. Earlier this year, my seven-year-old was almost hit by a car as we crossed 8th at Arbuta, an unmarked crosswalk. Traffic congestion and chaos. A frustrated driver drove in front of us as we crossed. The car stalled, blocking sight of oncoming traffic. My son hopped behind the vehicle to get around. Our car traveling in the other direction almost hit him. Terrified, I told him, Finley, if you are not vigilant at all times when you cross, you will be dead. No one cares about you but you and me. Words of sheer panic and also a prophetic statement. Traffic congestion, vehicular confusion, and driver frustration in the area places everyone at risk, not just Finley. Big construction projects, a school, a daycare, 500 children being picked up and dropped off daily, high-density neighborhoods, very narrow roadways and sidewalks, ads, a subway terminus, diesel bus loops, buses navigating on a too small site, a tower for the hardest to house, now add emergency vehicles, ambulances, paramedics and police, no laneway access, foreseeable risk, what a reasonable person would expect to be the harmful results of their actions or inactions. What has the city done to address this foreseeable risk? Not enough. Where are the speed bumps? Where are the raised sidewalks? Where is a pedestrian flashing sign at 7th and Arbutus? Today, Chi Tan tells you that there are no traffic issues. How traffic has been dealt with today is how I fear the tower will be dealt with in the future. I am in favor of supportive housing but not the congregate model proposed. Why is it tower or nothing? 18 meters from an elementary school and preschool, that's not near, that's next. No background check, no screening for violent history, why? There's no human right violation, there's no breach of privacy, why? Housing is a human right, yes it is. And safety and security is another human right and you shouldn't have one without the other. Foreseeable risk, what a reasonable person would expect to be the harmful result of their actions or inactions. Florence Nightingale Elementary School, two blocks from the Biltmore Hotel supportive housing, daily sweeps for needles and other items. The following is taken from our local press. December 2020, Biltmore Hotel, resident fatally stabbed. March 2021, Arco Hotel, downtown Eastside, supportive housing. Resident shot dead, caught in the crossfire of a dispute between two drug dealers who were also residents. From 2020 to 2021, Gastown Hotel, supportive housing. Two residents murdered, one stabbed. February 2020, residents stabbed at Nora Hendricks Place, downtown supportive housing. Both men involved were residents. July 2020, Howard Johnson Hotel, supportive housing in Yelltown, increased crime, fight, drug dealing, open drug use, public spaces used as toilets. November 2020, McBride Elementary School in East Van, in lockdown, stranger enters a classroom, refuses to leave, eventually apprehended under the Mental Health Act. Marguerite Ford Social Housing Project, 729 police calls in the first 16 months, fight, drugs, Weapons, threats, break-ins, stolen property. Quoting then city manager, too many homeless people with mental health and addiction issues were moved into Marguerite Ford too quickly and didn't get the support they needed. There is foreseeable risk in what you are proposing to the other vulnerable population, the children next door, to the neighbors, to the community and to the very future residents that you are trying to protect, there is real risk. What is proposed does not include any mitigants to address foreseeable risk. No commitments for essential support. Say no to tower or nothing and say yes to successful, effective, supportive housing. Consult with the community. Take into consideration all competing needs and reach a reasonable balance. Build the right supportive housing. Commit to screening for violent history. Commit to complex care. 
commit to having a mandated minimal number of support staff on site at all times. Don't leave the hard decisions for later. Set mandatory terms to protect everyone. Be courageous Thank and you. make the right decision. Thank you. Uh, that is five minutes, and you don't have any questions. Appreciate you phoning in, and I hope your son's okay. Um, we're going to go to speaker 174 on uh, Mich uh, Michael Naidu. Michael Naidu? Hello? Hi there. You have up to five minutes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm a resident of Kitsilano, and I'm speaking in opposition to this proposed rezoning. Uh, for eight years, and until quite recently, I lived um, across the street from the proposed project site. I was in, actually involved in some of the early uh, consultation meetings with BC Housing. Um, you can't see me, but I'm putting consultation uh, in air quotes um, because it's clear that uh, they were not listening to neighborhood feedback and basically the, the meetings, the virtual open houses they were having were nothing more than uh, checking a box for their rezoning application. And after all of their, quote, consultation, the height of the building remains the same, the building design is the same, and the proposed residents are the same. There are many good reasons to oppose this project, many of which have been raised by the 173 speakers who've come before me, and no doubt many more will be raised by the 100 plus speakers who will come after me. For the most part, I'm gonna focus on one. The building from a design standpoint alone is completely out of context with the character of the neighborhood. There is a neighborhood, uh, this is a neighborhood that's made up almost entirely of low rise uh, rental and strata properties. And if you walk around the neighborhood within many blocks, you will not see anything resembling the scale or appearance of this proposed building. And I don't mean that in a good way. There have been comments made about the fact that uh, we all need to be careful about saying things that will stigmatize future residents of the building, and I completely agree with that. The problem is the scale and appearance of this building will stigmatize residents all by itself. There is no chance it will ever blend in with the surrounding area. Even with the likely increase in density around Broadway based on the recently passed Broadway plan, that is not going to do anything to integrate this building with the neighborhood. The building is going to tower over a one-story subway station and bus loop, a toddler park, a low-rise elementary school that was recently rebuilt, so it's not going anywhere, and other townhouses and rental buildings that are low-rise. It's going to stick out like a sore thumb for years to come. Uh, there's been discussion and argument as part of these hearings as to whether comments should be restricted to building design or whether building operations and proposed uh, tenants should also be considered. I say why restrict discussion of either? Both are clearly relevant. I mean, they're so relevant, they were discussed at the city's urban design panel meeting that took place last November. It was stated during that meeting that while uh, while the design panel's goal is to assess urban design and architectural quality, um, it was also noted, quote, we'd like to imagine the kind of people that will live in these sorts of places. Well, so do the people who live, work, and go to school in this neighborhood, and council should care too. Concerns were raised by participants at the urban design panel meeting with respect to the lack of outdoor space for residents of the building, as well as the lack of translucent windows, balconies, and other common uh, facilities, common amenities outdoors. Um, typically, these are the kinds of things you would see in a new residential building. Comments were raised as to why these common uh, building elements were not being uh, put into this particular design. And what they were told was, quote, our operator has actually been really clear that the kinds of residents who they anticipate in this sort of building just don't want that kind of public interaction. So the design itself takes into account the occupants and specific concerns with respect to housing those occupants. The building is in effect designed to isolate the occupants for the neighborhood and frankly, likely vice versa. Not exactly something I would call fitting in with the community. In light of this fact, it begs the question as to why the construction of a monolithic facility that is so out of character with the surrounding neighborhood is being proposed for this area at all. And furthermore, why it would be constructed across the street from an elementary school and toddler park. It makes no sense. No reasonable attempt has been made to construct a housing project that fits in with this neighborhood. And if it's built in this current location in its current form, there's little doubt it's gonna be a failure for both residents and neighbors. So I urge you all to vote against the rezoning for this project. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for calling in. I don't see any questions for you, so 
I will move uh, to Speaker 175. Uh, Council, after the speaker, I am going to um, have a uh, just call a 10 minute break. We've been going since uh, six o'clock, so I do think it's just good for us to stretch and give the clerks a little breather, too. Uh, so, Speaker 175 is Mark Stockbrooks. Sorry, and Mike Stockbrooks. The 10 minute break, so. Um. Hello, are you there? Speaker 175, Mark Stockbrooks. Mayor, this is the clerk. Um, speaker, yeah. speaker 172, who was disconnected earlier, has been uh, is now back on the line. And so it may, it, it may be 170, Speaker 172. M. Uh, okay. Wickham. It's not Speaker 169. Uh, it's Speaker 172, you're saying. Correct. Okay, so is Speaker 172, uh, M. Wickham. Hi, I, I was on the line before, but it didn't seem to, to work out for me. Can okay, you hear me well, now? you're here now. Yep, can you have up to five okay. minutes? All right, okay. I have slides. Okay, I'll just make sure uh, we stop your clock here until the uh, clerks get the slides up. It's the clerk here. The slides are up. Great. Okay. Speaker, please go ahead. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. I'm Marlene from Vancouver, and I oppose this rezoning. I oppose the disrespect and political manipulation shown to the West 8th and Arbutus area by government entities and activists that have no attachment to or understanding of this neighbourhood. I oppose the absence of neighbourhood-related consultation and objectives for this proposed project. This is not con surprising considering BC housing siloed thinking, focus on unit numbers rather than outcome measures, and lack of data governance, as stated in the Ernst & Young report. Mayor and councillors, this is a divisive public hearing with long-term implications. You should not be tasked to clean up a mess created by others. These problems can only be resolved with a clear rejection of this rezoning and actual consultation with the neighbourhood using a mediator. Much change is being forced onto the small neighborhood. A terminal subway station and bus loop is being built here of all places, a quiet residential area, to create an unresolvable transit bottleneck, in the words of Lon LeClaire. This bus loop and subway station will introduce inner city problems into West 8th and Arbutus, and we are defenseless for it. This area is full of children, both from the school and nearby Delamont Park, people with disabilities, seniors, and an abstinence-based women's recovery house. Nobody wants street culture here. Placing this oversized building with a harm reduction focus right beside the bus loop doesn't contribute to safety of the area. This location isn't even good for the NPA clientele. Slide two, please. Two local residents and speakers at this hearing stated that the bus loop traffic, the future streetcar on the Greenway, and the heavy foot pedestrian foot traffic will be noisy and overstimulating for people with mental illness and head injuries. They need a quiet area with green space. With many pedestrians, there is a greater chance of an adverse encounter. People with mental illness are more likely to be victims of violence. When you look at the building, it's a fortress covering the two lots. Even the courtyard is inside. There's one entrance on West 7th. It's like you want to keep the residents inside and everyone else outside, an island excluding the neighborhood. Slide three, please. In fact, architect Bruce Hayden at the November 10th UDP meeting said, these are residents that do not want to, to live a public life. They don't want. They are actually very, very clear about this. One of the primary considerations, or rather of the residents, is to provide them with privacy. In response to a UDP member's question about outdoor seating near the Greenway, Bruce Hayden said, for outdoor space, the courtyard, our operator has been really clear. The kinds of residents who they anticipate in this building just don't want that type of interaction. Even the architect and the operator realize that this location has serious limitations for MPA clientele. So why force them into this busy, noisy location. Slide four, please. Why hasn't the local homeless population been consulted on what kind of building they'd like to live in? Only one speaker at this hearing who knew the local homeless was a social justice worker at St. Augustine Church. The homeless like to sleep rough, tend towards alcohol use, and don't like to associate with the downtown homeless that use injection drugs. The building fortifies itself, but doesn't protect the neighborhood surrounding the bus loop, especially not at night. This is not a design issue to be deferred to the development permit stage. Natural surveillance is typically used in SEPTED, crime prevention through environmental design. The building windows are obstructed and there are no balconies to sit in. 
The south end has recycling and a stairwell. The north end has a small window overlooking the park. Slide five, please. The sheer size of the building obstructs sight lines to the greenway, to the schoolyard, and to Delamont Park. And because it has no access or surveillance from the south side, the building can't help anyone in trouble at the bus loop or in the greenway. Second generation SEPTED uses social activation for neighborhood safety. The Park Sport has done this with the Kafka Coffee House in the new park downtown. The existing schoolyard, park, seniors housing, recovery house, and subway station can't offer that. Neither can a 100% social housing building. So it shouldn't be a 100% social housing building. The lower levels of the building need to be activated with extended hours businesses, like a 24-hour gym and daycare. This can increase safety for everyone in the neighborhood. Slide six. Conclusions. Housing units can be built here, but the design and intended clientele are wrong. This particular location needs to be a mixed-use building to help with neighborhood safety. The building needs to target people that are part of the same neighborhood culture and want to maintain that. The building dimensions need to be determined by an independent modeler and an immediate neighborhood committee so that it is respectful to all involved. This is an important outcome measure. The building needs to have different unit sizes for different needs and not based on a cheaper bulk buy of one modular size. These problems can't be fixed at the development permit stage. This building is expected to last for a 60-year lease. There is one chance to do it right. This isn't it. Please reject this rezoning. Thank you for your time. I would be happy to answer questions even about Julian Summers' 2017 paper. Thanks so much. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, but do thank you for your presentation and, and precision and timing. Um, Council, we are now going to take a um, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, it is 738. We'll come back at 748 uh, and we'll pick it up with uh, speaker 175. Thanks so much. We'll see you in 10 minutes.
Let's wait for folks to get their cameras on. Thanks so much. I will go to, um, we we're going to go back to, was it speaker 169, Mateo Estrada? I think so. Mateo Estrada, speaker number 169. One spe uh, speaker 169 <laughs> has not been successful in calling back in. Okay, thanks. We'll go to 175, Mark Stockbrocks. Speaker 175, Mark Stockbrocks. Mayor, just, hi, hi, Mayor. We're just checking on uh, Speaker 165. It does appear he's on the line, so we're just checking. One moment. 175 or 165? 175. 175. Yeah, great, thanks. Great. All right. Uh, can you hear me there? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Oh, great. Okay. Super. Thanks for hearing me, Mayor Council. I am, uh, I'm a triplegic stroke survivor. I had a stroke uh, two right. weeks ago. Uh, can you hear me there? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Oh, great. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. I'm a triplegic stroke survivor. I, I had a stroke two weeks after completing firefighter training with the Métis Nation of BC, and uh, I am strongly opposed to this pro this project. Uh, as a result of my stroke, I, I live life with one arm and I rely on a wheelchair for mobility. I live in a building designated specifically for people living with some of the most extremely debilitating conditions that a person can have. And so add that to the list of vulnerable populations within the vicinity. I'm two blocks away from this proposed site. Uh, I object to some of the language regarding nimbyism and discrimination. I personally, I personally um, meet and speak Sorry, with local speaker. people in the homeless community, uh, people with addictions. I speak with them. So that's not the issue. The issue is the sheer scale of this building. Well, speaker, we, we, we are hearing an echo. I, I know this is uh, probably complicated, uh, but can, do you think you could turn off your computer so um, we don't get the echo, or at least turn the volume down? We, we are hearing an echo. I know this is uh, probably complicated, uh, but do you think you can turn off your computer so um, we don't get the echo. I'm on a cell phone. Yes, but you have your computer on in the background. Oh, okay. Okay, one sec. 
Okay, thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Is, how's, how's this now? Perfect. Is that Please better? Continue. Okay, awesome. Super. Okay, yeah, so I'm a triplegic stroke survivor. I had a stroke two weeks after completing firefighter training with the Métis Nation BC's training program, and I'm strongly opposed to this building proposal. As a result of my stroke, I live my life with, with just one arm, and I rely on a power wheelchair full-time for mobility. And I live in a building that's designated specifically for people with some of the most extremely debilitating conditions that you can have. Um, I, I know from, from the people in my building, whether uh, perceived or real, they do have concerns regarding safety in this neighborhood now. And um, so that's, I add that to the list of we've gone over and over the other groups that are concerned with this. Um, my, my issue is not with the, the population that will be there. It is the issue with the, um, the scale and the scope of this project and whether it can be a success or not. I, I mix and mingle with the homeless and addicted population in my direct vicinity steps away from my entrance. And um, so that's not the issue. The issue is the scale of it and um, the lack of experience and proof that the um, provider can actually assist the population within the building. And as many have said, it's just far too large um, to handle traffic issues, emergency services issues in that traffic situation. Um, I'm all for helping people, absolutely, but this is a, not the best idea. I think a decentralized model, and it's been proven, um, you've heard from professionals stating this, that there's far better outcomes for people if you decentralize and they'll integrate into the community. I fully agree. That's also the word on the street, literally steps from my entrance. Um, yeah, so I, I'm strongly opposed, and many of the people in my building are, as well as seniors groups. My mother lives nearby. She's 75. Um, so that's my two pieces. I just want to say strongly opposed to this and take it back to the drawing board. Maybe you re rethink this and there's no issue with having people experiencing homelessness and addiction issues. It's just the model is, is way off, and we need to take it back to the drawing board. Have a good night, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so much for your time and, uh, and uh, contribution here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. And we Thank are going so to much. move to All the right. next. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, speaker 176, Andrew Henniger. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Andrew Henniger. I'm a resident of 8th Avenue in Vancouver, three blocks from the proposed project, and Mayor Stewart, on a personal note, a fellow native son of Wolfville. I've listened to all the previous submissions on this topic over the previous uh, three nights and today, and candidly, I don't have a whole lot of new material to add to the considerations. So instead, I thought I'd do my best Wolf Blitzer impression to recap where we are at this hour. There's broad support for supportive housing across Vancouver. BC Housing has designed a building that is too big for the lot on which it is proposed to be built. BC Housing has designed a building that does not comply with the city's Broadway plan guidelines. BC Housing did not engage in a bona fide consultation in the planning of this project that resulted in any meaningful modifications to address neighborhood concerns. BC Housing did not consult the VPD in the design and planning of this project. How on earth was that step missed? Was VFD consulted? It feels unlikely. BC Housing designed a building that supposes emergency access from either Arbutus Street between two crosswalks on a block where rush hour traffic borders on impassable, or from 7th Avenue, which can only be accessed in one direction off of Arbutus, or from a half block of 8th Avenue that backs onto a bus loop for North America's busiest bus line. BC Housing has hired an operator for this building that has admitted no experience managing a project of this size. BC Housing told us in their opening comments that, quote, the services are key to the success of this type of development. Yet this application doesn't offer a single assurance as to what those services will be, aside from laundry, which we've heard about numerous times. 
When asked in these hearings, BC Housing was unable to answer the question of how much space would be available in the structure to provide services, which naturally begs the question, they couldn't answer that question, which naturally begs the question of how they can be so confident those services can scale as necessary to meet tenant needs, which may change over time. BC Housing plans to build this structure less than 20 meters, the width of a two-lane street from an elementary school. BC Housing claims that they have many supporting, supported, supportive housing units 500 meters from schools. 500 meters from St. Augustine School is the western edge of Burrard Street, fully three city blocks away. Are we seriously going to pretend that 20 meters and 500 meters are the same thing? BC Housing was not responsive to email requests for information regarding this project, nor to invitations to meet to discuss alternative proposals for the site, even when introduced directly by both the Minister of Housing and members of this Council. If Council approves this rezoning, decisions on services and budget are out of its hands to be negotiated between BC Housing and the operator, not Council, not the public. If Council approves this rezoning and there are issues once the project is built, the City has no recourse to cause BC Housing or the operator to correct them. BC Housing notes they're committed to a form of community advisory board, but why should we think advice offered after construction will be received and actioned in a manner any different from the manner in which advice and feedback on this project has been ignored to date? BC Housing has made thinly veiled threats that the funding will go somewhere else if Council doesn't approve this rezoning application. In addition to the contractual inaccuracies of this position pointed out earlier tonight, in this, the year in which our federal government has published what's being called a housing budget, and in the middle of a period of a $7 billion increase in funding to BC Housing, let's not let ourselves be gaslit into believing that funding for affordable housing is going to disappear if not put to work in this proposal. The gem of this whole proposal is the land. That land belongs to the city, so let's demand suitors for its use meet our neighborhood expectations. City staff reiterated tonight that the city does not put restrictions on where supportive housing may be built, which illogically seems to equate that lack of restrictions with the notion that supportive housing should be put just anywhere without considering its appropriateness. Advocates of this project are passionate about the need for affordable housing, but that advocacy is rooted in normative virtue signaling statements about change, reconciliation, and proclaimed human rights, not empirical evidence or even actual examples of success that speak to the articulated concerns with this proposal in this location. Those opposed to this proposal are nearly universally on board with a properly won, truly collaborative process to design a proposal that works for this neighborhood. In light of all this, what are we still talking about? The bottom line is BC Housing engaged in a flawed initiative from the outset, ran a facade of community engagement, was not responsive to community concerns, and ultimately blew it. After release of the E&Y report, we now have some insight into why BC Housing failed in this proposal. You are at your five minutes. Proposal, uh, I you are at your five reject minutes. this proposal and let's get to work on something that works. Thanks. You do have a question from Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Again, less of a question. Um, Andrew, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the Wolf Blitzer. Uh, would you kindly share your, uh, circulate your, your speaking notes to Council? Thank you. Thanks sure. so much. Are you related to Troy and uh, Matthew and Jay? I'm not a uh, son, son of Dale and Karen who uh, attend church ah. with your mom, though. Oh, OK. Well, say hi, to everybody back there. Will do. Thanks a lot. See ya. OK, Council, we're uh, on to 177, Andre Co. Hello, my name is Andre. Can you hear me? Sure can. Up to five minutes, please. Good evening, Chair and Council. My name is Andre, and I oppose this project in the current form. I've been a resident of Vancouver for almost 30 years. My parents are refugees in the country I was born in. My mother and father were made refugees at the ages of 2 and 10, respectively, by the precursor of today's Russian army, the Soviet army. Slide one, please. I'm sorry, oh, okay. 
In Vancouver, once our kids were school-aged, we set our sight on a school in this neighborhood. That is slide one. Thank you. It is a well-functioning school with energetic and confident people who are easy to talk to. We felt lucky when they selected us. Once school started, we felt welcome. The future looked bright. Slide two, please. In the first half of 2021, we've discovered that BC Housing made an application for the current project in our neighborhood. In quick succession, a community dialogue process was announced and under the pretext of the pandemic, the only way to submit feedback to the applicant was through a form on the website called Let's Talk Housing BC. Although many questions were asked, the replies were always impersonal, scripted, repetitive cliches. There was controlled access, controlled language, controlled results. It reminded me of what I grew up in. Slide three, please. David Eby, announcing a done deal before any consultation, reminds me of politicians I thought I'd left behind. Recent articles by the province at the Globe and Mail provide coverage biased towards activists, nonprofits, and developers. I'm sure you're familiar with names like Pravda and Izvestia. From the recent event by Vancouver Sun, sponsored by Polygon, featuring David Eby, Joy McPhail, and Bob Rennie, I've heard more statements from government-related elites that I thought I'd left behind, including promises of a plan designed by lots of voices of people that want to live in the city, but none by ones already living there and have no more public hearings. This alarms me to the core. My parents' home country had Soviets inserted to break social cohesion. Now, this project is imposed here. Supporters redefine the neighborhood by mentioning community only after the project they want is built and only according to their rules. Potential for culture cleansing is right under our eyes. Slide four, please. An activist with no local knowledge of the neighborhood is quoted in the Globe and Mail. We don't care if there are shadows. Try telling that to Tracy Reimer, Speaker 15 in this hearing, longtime resident in social housing and neighbors, uh, and her neighbors who took shelter right under the tree canopy on site from the last summer seed. Now, I'm an optimist. If I wouldn't be, probably I would not be here. I know that things around this project don't have to be the way they are, and that a better solution is always possible. Please allow the time for this solution to emerge while encouraging stakeholders to meaningful dialogue. Some might say it's too late for this, but I'd like to remind you that it's always too early to impose, impose a bad choice for the next 60 years. A recent example of a better outcome was the rental project in Shaughnessy, initially sent back, then accepted. I am asking you to prioritize input from residents and parents of the elementary schools in the immediate vicinity of this project. Dear Chair and Councillors, in closing, I'd like to ask you, if this neighborhood is not being heard, when are we going to be heard? What do we have to do to be heard if you will be approving the project regardless of its faults? Slide five, please. Regardless of choice, you will be remembered. It is never a good idea to try to erase history, and long term, it never works. How do you want to be remembered for the next 60 years? Please send this project back to staff and engage in good faith. Thank you for your time and service. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. You do have questions from Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Hardwick, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you if you had circulated your slides to Council, have you? I have not, Councillor, but I can, uh, it would be my pleasure to do this. And I'm I'm assuming that uh, that you have come as an immigrant from Russia? Uh, I'm coming from a proud Central European country with a capital closer to Paris than it is to Russia. Okay. 
Well, thank you. I thought, I thought that provided some very interesting context. I appreciate your remarks. Thank you. Culture thank cleaning. You. We are, I'm very thank afraid you. of that. Thank you so much. Uh, that is it for questions. Appreciate you coming in tonight. And I am going to uh, move to the next speaker, speaker 178, Kent Hawkins. Speaker 178 is not on the line. Thanks very much. 179, uh, Jane Kerrigan Galis. Hello, can you hear me? Sure can, up to five minutes, please. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, my name is Jane Kerrigan Galis, and I'm opposed to the proposal for the current project on our beautiful between 7th and 8th Avenues. I want to, though, preface my comments, like a lot of people before me, by saying I'm not opposed to social housing or even social housing on this site. But what I am opposed to is this massive size and scope of this project. This is a project that would simply seem to warehouse people to get them off the streets. And it doesn't seem like we've heard anything about supports and services to help many of the people, some who would have addictions and mental health issues, on this site, other than laundry. And that, to me, is just ridiculous. We need to help people. We need to get them off the streets. But this building in this place on this tiny sliver of land, across from an elementary school, a preschool, a children's playground, a small park, and very close by a women's recovery center, is too big and too much. It is flawed in many, many ways. Thirteen stories would dwarf almost every building in that neighborhood. 129 units with very little supports and services. It would not only dominate this area, the size of this building, shadowing the school, shadowing Little Delamont Park, but bordered by Arbutus, uh, the Arbutus line on the rear, and then now a proposed, or what's going to happen, obviously, bus loop and subway station, is going to make for an incredibly busy, congested, and dangerous area. The traffic issues in this area alone are frightening without adding such a massive building with people who need serious help. We've heard from the experts over and over again uh, who study supportive housing, who know how it can work in a smaller scale, in a mixed scale, and warehousing and ghettoizing people in situations like this isn't the answer. We do so well. I'm a member of the community. I don't live in the neighborhood anymore, but my son goes to St. Augustine, and I sit on parish council at the church. We help women in the recovery center, and we know it works because they're in a small housing situation. They're in a home-like setting, and they're in an area where they don't stand out, where they're welcomed in. And I think we need to think about this sliver of land and this massive project and how we can make it fit into the community, be something that the community can absolutely support because we want to and make it safer for the people who live there, the families and seniors around there, the women in the recovery center, the people who would live in the building and the children across the street. Please reconsider the size and makeup of this proposal. Please let's go back to the drawing board and let's come up with something that works for everyone in this community. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. You do have questions uh, from Councillor Dejanova. Hi, Jane. Thanks for waiting Councilor? up the line to speak to us. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you, Councillor. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering, I mean, you had mentioned uh, the, the um, I, I think it's the San Sancta Maria home. And I'm wondering, do yeah. you feel that this would make that population more vulnerable and perhaps impede on the work that they're doing right now? Uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, we do. And I would. Um, when we first heard about the subway bus project, we were terrified, quite frankly. The women that we're dealing with, and I, and I don't want to get into too many details, but they are very, um, they're recovering. And many of them are very traumatized. And um, what they want to do is live in a quiet setting and they want to become healthy again and they want their children back. That's why this community works so well for them because they're so enveloped by a community with children all around them. When that subway and bus loop was put into place, 
we were terrified because we know what will come with it. We know that it will mean more people moving up and down the line. And with that comes a lot more issues. And the VPD will back that up with what they deal with at those, in those situations. But then with this massive building also there, we know that this starts to make our recovery center, it puts it in, a, in an untenable position. I mean, we just have to really rethink how this is going to work for those women. One, if you don't mind, I have one more question. Um, one, yeah. one of the questions that I'm going, going to be asking um, our staff, if if they can answer this, is why the applicant has chosen to not include any family housing in this building, considering family housing surrounds the neighborhood. Um, when we talk about the school, we've heard about the park, we've heard about you know the many families in the community. Yet there's no family housing on this site for various number of reasons that I've heard from different applicant or from the speaker. But I'm hoping staff might also mention that. My question for you is. Do you feel that something that allowed family housing would be a better fit with, you know, the neighborhood considering the school, the parks, and the families that live in the neighborhood and Sanctum, Sanctum Maria? Do you think that that would be a better fit? I absolutely do, Counselor. I think that would be the best fit. I think we need to look at protecting families when they're young and vulnerable, women and children, or whoever makes up that family. Um, we need to give them a safe safe, strong place to live. And I certainly know from the women that we deal with in our recovery center, them being in a neighborhood and being in a home-like setting, a small building that doesn't stand out, and being able to integrate into the community is immensely helpful. If it were a mixed building that focused on families, seniors, people with disabilities, yes, people who are near homelessness, people who are homeless, and yes, people who have recovery or in recovery, I think that would be a great fit. But the size of this building as it stands right now it is, is almost unfathomable for that site if you've been there and physically seen the area. So the size is a concern for you, but it's also, I just wanna, I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question. What I'm hearing from you is just to clarify what you're saying, you're not against having low income or social housing or people with complex care needs in the community. You just want that to be a better fit with the community. Is that correct? Like gotcha. to allow family size units to allow children to live in the building. That's absolutely right. If it was more family centric and there were families with children in the building and they fit into that, it will fit into that community so perfectly with children, with a park, with a school, with many schools all around, um, and with the type of services that are in that community, that seems to be the best fit. Thanks for answering my question, Shane. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, that is it for questions. Do appreciate you uh, coming in tonight and sharing your views. Uh, and I'm gonna move on to speaker number 180, who's uh, Jennifer Foster. Hello there. Hello, can you hear me? Sure can, up to five minutes, please. Great, thanks. Hello, Mayor Stewart and City Councillors. My name is Jennifer Foster, and I'm calling to register my opposition to this supportive housing rezoning, and instead advocate for a better model for delivering housing for people who are homeless or at risk of it. I have been a social worker for 19 years, and I have known several individuals who were homeless, one of whom I consider my friend. 15 years ago, I worked with a neighbor in Kitts to help house him and his dog. The only housing available was a downtown SRO. I visited him many times, and every time I entered and exited his building, my heart ached at the gulf between his housing and mine. He was finally given independent housing after living for six years in the SRO. My friend lived with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder and experienced extensive trauma growing up. One time when I visited him, he told me, I'd be better off on the street, but I'm sticking with this housing because my dog is old and needs a soft bed. You may say this example is not relevant to this application because it relates to an SRO, but I disagree. It is relevant because any supportive housing that congregates people for, um, for long-term in large numbers, whether it be SROs or this one being proposed, is abnormal, and I oppose it on that basis. Normalcy in housing requires diversity of tenants. I believe that what individuals need, and in fact is what the research shows they want, is scattered site housing with robust support. 
This is what is meant by independent recovery-oriented housing, and, it's, and it is the current best practice for people who experience homelessness alongside mental illness and addiction. I would like to now enter a point about Dr. Summers' research. Dr. Summers has been conducting research on this issue for 35 plus years. The study you mentioned, Councillor Boyle, which shows, um, shows equivalency out, of out, equivalent outcomes for congregate and independent recovery housing is, as you said, about housing stability as the primary outcome. Housing stability is a measure of time and place. It therefore makes sense um, both settings would be, would be equal. If any council would like to ask me more about this at the end, I would be happy to answer questions to the best of my ability, as I've been working with Dr. Summers on this issue for a long time now. But now back to my speech. So what specifically is independent recovery-oriented housing? Independent housing means the allocation of a small number of suites in regular rental buildings and offering options to someone who is homeless about which building they would want to live in. Giving people choices also gives them dignity. The recovery aspect means an interdisciplinary team which is available 24-7 to provide the care and help the individuals need as and when needed and for as long as needed. With respect to recovery, the research shows that offering individuals the things they say they want assistance with are by far the greatest contributors to recovery because they are powerful motivators. And what most people who are homeless want is help reconnecting with kids and family, with work and with other meaningful roles. I would like to go back to my friend. He has a daughter in the foster care system with whom he longs to have a relationship and he would not be able to reconnect with her in this building. Furthermore, single occupancy suites, which are too small for families, enforce separation from children rather than fostering family reunification. Advocates for supportive housing have argued that it is aligned with, hu with human rights, but enforced separation from one's children is clearly a human rights abuse. Given that we know through the research that being reconnected with kids and opportunities for work and being away from continual exposure to mental illness symptoms among neighbors are what individuals who are homeless say they want and are also what helps them, why would you approve a rezoning to support an intervention that precludes them from having those things? Most countries around the world and most other provinces in Canada don't seek to solve the issue of homelessness by congregating people. Portugal made their internationally renowned turnaround, virtually eradicating street homelessness, because their solution was dedicated to the vision of social reintegration. We need that vision. You, our elected decision makers, need that vision. This is a mind shift, councillors, about what actually benefits the population of people who are homeless in Vancouver. There is no peace without social justice. For me, it is deeply distressing knowing that there is a proven better way and that the barrier to pursuing this is lack of political will or comfort with the status quo at the provincial level. However, your interests, I believe, are what is best for all the people of this city. Please be visionary. When the independent model was implemented in research studies, there was never a lack of vacant suites or landlords or community resources to make it happen. This public forum has shown you how much and how deeply people care about housing the homeless. The will and intellect and passion is clearly in this city. It's about a choice of which model to pursue. Will you say no to this rezoning and force BC housing and city planners to go back to the drawing board and look at a model that is proven to create long-term stability and wellness for both tenants and neighbours? Or will you approve this proposal which the research shows will have tenants and neighbours experiencing crime and chaos? As citizens, we don't have that power that you do as councillors, and we are counting on you to do the right thing. Thank you for listening to me tonight. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Domino. Councillor Domino has questions for you. Go ahead, Councillor Domino. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and thanks, Jennifer, for calling in this evening. Um, I, I'm curious if you could expand on drawing on your professional experience as a, a social worker. Um, and, and the story you told about, uh, you know, uh, helping your friend, getting them into an SRO and I having toured some of them, I, I recognize they're in many cases, um, dilapidated and problematic. And in the context here, we're not talking about an SRO. So I'm curious if you could comment, yeah. have you visited and had experience with some of the successful supportive housing, um, developments and homes that do exist in the city today? And, and could you comment on that if you have visited some of them, um, yeah, maybe I'll pause so that. I haven't, and it's it, it's my understanding that they're not as successful as they as they might appear from the outside at times. It, it, so no, no, but no, I have not. Okay, um, I, I asked the, in the context of having served on a, a couple of boards uh, that deliver non market and supportive housing, and so um, and so from your perspective, uh, more distributed model. You talked about a uh, more independent model, and you referenced a small number of units in rental buildings. Did I hear that correctly? Was that the model yes, you, you referenced? Yep. 
That's right, and that's the model, that's the independent recovery model based in the call to action by Dr. Julian Summers, and it was studied um, here in Vancouver and, and um, across the country um, as being the most successful model. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for calling in today. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, that is it for questions for you. Thanks so much for participating tonight, and I'm going to move to the next speaker who is uh, 181 Charlene North. Hello? Hello? Hi there, up to five minutes. Yeah, up to five minutes, please. Okay, thank you. Hello, Mayor, Councillors, and guests. My name is Charlene North. I was born in Vancouver and lived here for most of my life. And I'm speak on, speaking on behalf of my family and child who attends the school 18 meters from the proposed development. We oppose the proposal in its current form for the following reasons. One, the building design doesn't meet the city's requirements for the Broadway plan. It is not contextual to the neighborhood because of its size and scale. It doesn't meet the shadowing requirements around schools as demonstrated by independent engineer speakers and has no setback from the sidewalk on Arbutus as originally presented. The design alone will stigmatize anyone who lives in it because of its disregard for these rules. It is a domineering tower amongst all the low-rise and residential houses around it. We know who the intended target residents are, and because of the design, they will stare directly into an elementary school courtyard all day long or a women's shelter on the other side. Two, the building is comprised of only one-bedroom units, and the building will not allow any children to live in it. Is that because children would not be safe living inside the building with the intended target residents? If that is the case, then how is this housing project safe for 500 children, 18 meters from the building, or even any children two feet from the building, since there is no setback and the windows on Arbutus open directly on top of the sidewalk below it? Chi Chan tonight said that the setback would be 10 feet or 3 meters, but he did not mean from the property line because that would require a building redesign. He meant from the curb, so that is irrelevant. Residents don't stay in the building. They are expected to integrate with the community, but children aren't allowed in this building. This doesn't sound like the right fit of community for these residents. Three, I'm also a project management professional, and it has become quite apparent just from listening to the public hearings that the proper processes for stakeholder engagement and involvement, particularly for site assessment as it relates to traffic, public safety and emergency response have not been undertaken. Other speakers confirmed that the Vancouver Police Department were not consulted on this project, and the recent Ernst & Young external review on BC Housing confirms that there are no formal reporting requirements for risk mitigation and due diligence activities for project approvals. Four, the Ernst & Young report also confirmed that BC Housing has no formal program review process. If they did, they would have reviewed what has been happening at the Marguerite Ford building and learned from it and developed a better building proposal. They have had the chance to prove that that building could work and that hasn't happened. I used to live in the Northeast False Creek neighborhood and I can corroborate all the same negative comments you've already heard about the Marguerite Ford building. It does not integrate its residents well with the community at all. We moved out of the downtown area so we could have better quality of life. Five, this plan is a short-sighted solution that only focuses on units, not people. The city has an aging demographic with seniors needing care, people with disabilities needing support, along with families with small children. A better proposal would have included the Broadway plan's new requirement that 10% of units have three or more bedrooms, which will have multiple uses now and for the next 60 years, and the city should require this. In light of the BC Housing Board being replaced and the discrepancies in their past decision-making processes, I urge you to reject this proposal. I also think you set a very dangerous precedent if you were to approve this proposal one that allows other buildings to disregard city requirements and proposals that do not keep school or park zones safe. There are too many unknowns and the city will have no power to take further action if this goes through. 
I think it also bears noting that all proposals should fit with the mission of the city. So I would remind the mayor, council, and city, city staff that the mission of the city's government is to create a great city of communities that cares about our people. And people should take priority over the lure of provincial funding or dollars. I just don't see what care has been taken for the children and families in this neighborhood, as well as for the proposed residents fitting into this community. The values of the city include excellence, but we have heard that this is not a plan that would achieve the best results. Fairness. Policies need to take into account concerns from all of society, not just the bottom Thanks, you are. You're fine. percent. The, this application doesn't align with the city's mission or values, right. and for yep. these yep. reasons, I yep. ask you to act with integrity and reject this application. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any questions for you, but uh, thanks for your time tonight. Speaker number uh, 182 is uh, Peter Waltrich. Waltrich. Speaker 182 Speaker is not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Speaker 183, uh, Christine Olmyak. Not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 184, John Albert Cleary. Speaking. Yeah, hi there. Um, we've got a, I just noticed that you haven't listed your, uh, whether or not you are a, uh, a resident of Vancouver. Uh, are you a resident of Vancouver? Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, um, Mayor and Councillors. I am not a resident of Vancouver. I'm a resident of Ladner. Uh, okay. But my, You're still wife able to and, <clears throat> my wife and I, we've always been very concerned about the lack of affordability for young people in Vancouver. And we own and rent out two one-bedroom apartments within three blocks of the proposed building for rent significantly below market rates and have done so for many years. Great. Nope. Hey, feel free to uh, go right ahead. It's just a uh, it's just a formality for us here. Go, go right cool. ahead. Thank you. Uh, I and my wife are closely connected to the Kitsilano neighborhood as I pick up my grandchildren from a local kids' elementary school every week and sit on the strata board of one of the apartments, buildings. I do oppose the rezoning application. I've seen young people and kids struggle for many years to find affordable housing, including my own children. And I support buildings, social housing on this property. I don't, however, understand why council would approve a building that by its design will only ever provide single occupancy housing units. New housing stock ought to provide a mix of unit types so that families of all types can find homes. A mix would reflect the diversity of the kids' neighborhood and be welcomed by neighbors. <clears throat> Before retiring, I worked as a teacher and a principal for 35 years. I know that children are vulnerable and are susceptible to proximity to substance use, substance paraphernalia, and the negative impacts that can accompany untreated addiction and mental health disorders. We can and do certainly teach our children compassion and respect and how to respond and react to issues they may encounter. But as a former educator, father and grandfather, I know that teaching our children these skills only provides one small layer of protection. Just ask my eight-year-old grandson, who, oblivious to his own vulnerability, proudly brought his mom a discarded needle while found, he found while playing in the bushes at Delamont Park, after having been taught on numerous occasions never to touch needles. <clears throat> Will sweeps of the park become more frequent once this building is in operation? Maybe, maybe not. I guess that depends on what council decides to require as a condition of leasing this building to BC Housing. But I'll always put my money on my grandson and his friends to outspark even the most diligent sweeps. 
Many have said, and I agree, that housing is a human right. But safety and security of the person is a human right too. Our children have these rights too. Council knows this because it banned marijuana dispensaries from operating within 300 meters of a school. The proximity of this building, which will use a harm reduction approach to a playground and numerous elementary schools, is shocking enough on its own. When you add that to BC Housing's failure to commit to minimum staffing and support levels and refuse to require criminal record checks for this building, you see the truth of the matter. There is no concern for the impact this building will bring to the neighborhood. Somewhere along the line, someone has decided that safety and security of one group of the population trumps that of another. That's not how neighborhoods flourish. I ask Council to reject this rezoning application and direct the applicant and BC Housing to come to the neighborhood and discuss the best opportunity possible for social housing at this location. Thank you for allowing me to speak, John Cleary. Thanks so much. Uh, appreciate your time this evening. I don't see any questions for you, so I will move on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Anne Gray, speaker number 185, Anne Gray. Hi there, can you hear me? Sure can, up to five minutes, please. Thank you. I am fiercely opposed to this rezoning application. There was not sufficient public cons consultation. Some input was given by St. Augustine's Church. However, their concerns, I believe, were not listened to nor acted upon. There is great need for shelter and supportive housing. However, there needs to be thought on the right location. And in this case, there is an elementary school 18 meters from the proposed site. There is also six days cares within three blocks and five meters from uh, five meters also from another childhood education center. The bus loop is also in close vicinity, as we've heard, as well as the subway terminus all across the street, with adding, of course, a liquor store as well on Broadway Street within close proximity. So there needs to be the right location with the right population being served to suit the environment and the right support and care for the population to ensure successful integration into the community and to ensure the best outcomes for this marginalized population being served. This application is for single room occupancy, as we have heard over and over over the last two days. There is no denying that the population that ends up in these rooms are people with complex medical issues, past trauma, possible PTSD, possible former abuse, possible substance abuse, various mental health diagnoses, and chronic illnesses. A constellation of all of these brings up extremely complex medical issues that requires complex medical intervention. These people themselves have told the medical experts and the supportive agencies that many of them do not want to live in a housing model such as this in fear of relapse poor living conditions, and crime. Why? Because the supportive staff of nurses, psychiatric nurses, outreach workers, addiction specialists, and medical professionals and volunteers are simply not there and available. The ratio of one to two supportive workers or nurses or psych nurses to care for an entire building is simply not possible to ensure the success and safety of integrating this population into the community and promoting healing and health promotion and health prevention. Listen to the medical experts, such as the addiction specialists and psychiatric nurses, the people that have all called in, and as eloquently stated by the last several callers, especially the caller, um, Ms. Galis. 
listen to the and and also our previous call up caller Jennifer who cited some evidence based practices and best practices. Listen to the specialists, the groups such as the Kitsilano Coalition have consulted. As a concerned member of the community, I'm asking you to put serious thought into what the community is asking for. Housing, yes, but not this proposal or model or lack of model of care. It has to be the right housing, the right population at the right time. Am I up? Is, is my five minutes up? Please go ahead. The right housing, the right population, it needs to be family, family oriented, as we have said, not SROs. The right location, families living among families, women and children living in community with other women, children, families, and the community around them. The right support needs to be in place, a model that will lead to the best outcomes with successful integration of a marginalized population in need living in community with the community around them. This means a suitable ratio of support staff for the numbers of people served. Making this housing model a model that other community will make this housing model a model that other communities will want to replicate to its successful integration into the community. Make this model be a magnet model and be an example of, for example, what Jennifer mentioned of a successful model with improved health outcomes, decrease in healthcare dollars, decrease in emergency admissions, decrease in emergency services, and decrease in EHS, ambulance and police calls, decrease in violent incidences, and decrease in possible um, violent situations. Make this model be the magnet model of care for supportive housing. Work and collaborate with the experts is what we're asking you to do. Involve them in the consultative and planning process. We've asked you to do this over and over again. That will give success. Not the current proposal with not much thought and not much concern for the community or population. Moving large groups of people from a vulnerable population to one area of the city sorry, to speaker. another. For I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Speaker. You you are over your five minutes. Um, uh, so just wanted to thank you so thank much for 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 calling in this evening. And I I don't see any questions for you. I'm sorry for the interruption earlier. Oh, that well, okay. Well, I'm not surprised. There's no questions. It seems to have been a pattern. But thank you. Okay, Council, we are on speaker 186. Zachary Tharp. Speaker 186 is uh, not here in person nor on the line. Okay, thanks. Uh, speaker 187, uh, George Krabinski. Right. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Councillors. Um, I'm a long-term resident of Vancouver, and I strongly object to the proposed building, and I will comment on the form, appearance, and density, as well as the negative effect on the immediate neighborhood and particularly upon St. Augustine's Elementary School. I've been a residential developer and builder for 50 years, and with all forms of residential development, and so I do know a little bit about what I'm going to say. As a developer, I understand the need for, and I'm not opposed to judicious increases in density in our city. But this proposal is far too much of a precedent setting density increase in the wrong location and for a flawed building that senselessly overpowers adjacent parks and buildings. And it is 50 feet taller than it should be because of modular construction. Let's talk about density first. The biggest and tallest building in Kitsilano is called Century House. It's on West 2nd at Balsam. It has 13 floors of dwelling units with a total of 90 units. Let's compare the density of Century House with this proposed building. Century House, the tallest building in Kits, has a density equal to 95 dwelling units per acre. The proposed building has 13 floors with 129 units, but because it is crammed onto a small site, 
It has an equivalent density of 290 dwelling units per acre. That's more than three times the density of the biggest, tallest building in Kitsilano. That should shock people. And the potential for this building to set a precedent for future development in Kitsilano is very alarming. This building has literally been crammed onto a small site with no proper setbacks. The physical form of the building is what Bruno Freschi, one of my professors at UBC, would have called a monolithic slab. It's totally devoid of any articulation, visual interest, or architectural merit. <clears throat> this form of wide, monolithic building is certainly not friendly to the immediate neighborhood, blocking views and, more importantly, blocking precious sunlight to many lower buildings and parks in the area. But not only is the proposed building very unfriendly to its present and future neighbors, this building form is not at all friendly for the future residents. Why is that? For one thing, the design features all narrow interior units. It could have featured 52 corner units, ideal for families, by the way, with additional light and ventilation. That didn't occur. Another reason for its unfriendliness is the windows, or lack thereof. Larger windows only let in more natural light, but also make units, small units feel larger, more spacious. This is not fair to the future residents. Another reason for its unfriendliness is the lack of trees, which is quite ironic considering the site. I'm sure you are aware that trees and other landscaping plus abundant natural light have a beneficial calming effect on residents of multi-unit buildings, particularly for those living in small suites with no balconies, patios, or private outdoor space. At-risk individuals need support for, to assist them in recovery, but there appears to be only five or six parking spaces in the proposed building. Where will the parking be for important visitors, medical personnel, relatives, close friends, all vital people to assist in recovery? Lack of parking is another unfriendly characteristic of this building. It has been designed to make it difficult for visitors to park, and that's not right. In my opinion, this building has not been designed for healthy living and recovery. Winston Churchill once said, we shape our buildings, and afterwards, they shape us. That's a very cogent comment, particularly about buildings that house people who have mental health and addiction challenges. Now, a few words about the neighborhood buildings that will be the most adversely affected. And I refer to St. Augustine's Elementary School, which is K-7 to plus day daycare. I'm oh, sorry? Just 10 seconds. Well, other, other more knowledgeable people than me have spoken about the obvious issues of privacy and interaction by young school children with many at-risk persons. And that greatly concerns me. How could this overly dense development housing at-risk individuals be allowed to happen just steps away from the elementary school? This has never happened before and in the city. You. And to my... Thank you so much. Just one that, sentence. That's the five minutes. But, but you do have... Uh, Councillor Hardwick has a question for you. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, interesting to hear about this through the, the uh, eyes of a developer. Um, could you elaborate or finish what you were saying about? No, actually, Councillor Hardwick, this is uh, clarifying questions, not to allow speakers to clarifying, finish. Clarifying. Their... Okay. Well, I was asking him to clarify then on his his uh, analysis of the impact of the building on the uh, adjacent site. Well, uh, as we know, uh, Saint Augustine School has 450 students as young as three to four years old. And uh, it's been serving Vancouver families for over 110 years. Uh, I did not attend that school. My children did not attend it. My grandkids do not attend it. But I consider it to be one, a low-rise treasure in the neighborhood. And it's certainly an educational gem in the city with thousands of families served. And it's just so sad what could be happening. Hopefully not. 
Thank you very much. Councillor Carr, you're up next, up to five minutes. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate you coming in um, tonight. It's nice to see people in chambers. Um, I'm over here. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, you made a number of points, but one thing I just wanted to ask you, um, you're probably familiar if you're a developer with the uh, conditions of approval, in a, they're always in Appendix B, and uh, there are a number of changes that are being required that are not in the rest of the report, but they are, you know, as it moves through its development phase, um, it's going to be required to do a lot more with trees. Um, so I, I don't know if you've read that appendix or read that set the section around uh, the retention of way more trees, um, the planting of, of more trees, uh, but it's something that um, is being paid attention to by staff and required of the developer. Yes, I, I did read okay. that, but of course the most important change would be a change of use to include to be instead social housing, entry-level housing, particularly for families. That's what's needed. Oh, a, a, a different issue. I just wanted to point that out because it's definitely in the report. But thank you. Thank you. For your comments. Thanks so much. Uh, that's it for questions. And we're going to move on to uh, speaker number 188, Everett Stam. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? Sure can. Uh, up to five minutes, please. All right, thank you. Um, I'm Everett Stam. I live in Kitsilano, just off Arbutus, quite close to the proposed location. Um, I'm calling in to say I would be ecstatic to welcome 129 new faces to our neighborhood. I think it's an incredible honor to have this opportunity to give so many people who are in desperate need of housing and supportive services the assistance they need right in my backyard. The addiction, mental health, and homelessness problems in this city is a crisis that should be clear to everyone. What should also be clear to everyone is that the status quo of concentrating these problems in the downtown east side is not working. As a resident of the Kitsilano neighborhood, I believe it is time for us to start pulling our weight on this issue, and this project is a great first step. There are concerns about placing this project next to a school, concerns about the children being exposed to those with addiction. While I sympathize with anyone who has concern for the safety of their children, we must remember, the counterfactual is not that by rejecting these, this project, the potential residents will just disappear or something. These people already exist. The counterfactual is that instead of being housed in a supportive environment, they'll be left on the street where they'll be far more dangerous to themselves and the students of this nearby school. The AIDS and Arbutus area is a great place to live in. A lot of the speakers tonight seem to have this unstated belief that by living in a neighborhood, you get to pick and choose who your neighbors are and what your neighborhood looks like. I wholeheartedly reject this belief. It's shameful that the only people who can live here are those who can afford multi-million dollar homes or forever upwardly spiraling apartment rents. In the context of the Kitsilano neighborhood, the scale and design of this project seem like a great fit and an excellent step forward. It's clear to me that we need more housing for all demographics in this area, and building upward is a very obvious decision. We should take this opportunity to help those at the lowest point in their lives and welcome them into our community. I am wholeheartedly in support of this project, and I hope Council will make a compassionate decision. If you want to say you support supportive housing in Vancouver, you must support this project, even if you take issue with minutiae related to the design. We must be mindful of the opportunity cost here. Getting those without homes and with drug addiction the support they deserve as soon as possible far outweighs concerns about neighborhood context, shadows, or wasting another few months or even years sending this project back for improvements even if there are improvements that could be made. Do not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your comments. You do have questions, Councillor Dejanova. Thanks so much. Um, appreciate your presentation. I'm wondering if, if you can offer some thoughts on, on the idea of sort of congregate housing and, and sort of the back and forth the council over my two terms here. And from my experience working in nonprofit housing, um, looking at the idea of, of, you know, having a standalone building that is serving people with complex care needs or social housing or low income and having, you know, just the fact that they walk through the door um, of that building, people know that they're supported, you know, that they're on some type of assistance. Uh, or they're receiving some type of support. Do you think that's as dignified as 
you know, having a, a smaller scale operation that's within a building that's integrated in market housing where, you know, no one knows what's happening behind that door and the supports, the support services are more discreet to give that person a more dignified, you know, sense of, of their situation so that people aren't pointing out, oh, hey, you live in that building. Kind of like we look at children with playgrounds, you know, we don't want to have a, <clears throat> a social housing playground and a market housing playground, something else I've, we've also debated here on council. So I'm just wondering if you can share some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think giving people housing as soon as possible is much more dignified than wasting even more time trying to come up with the perfect plan. I don't doubt that there are improvements that could be made. I'm not an expert on, you know, the design of social housing. Nothing in life is perfect, but what we could do is approve the housing now rather than waste more time sending it back for, you know, design reviews, delays, et cetera. Um, that's my take on it. Can I ask, do you think it's important that people sort of have that dignity where no one else but them and obviously their provider, you know, or the people that are involved in their care know about, you know, their their living situation or how much they're paying in rent or, you know, what, what their circumstances are? Do you think that's important to a person? I'm confused about your question. Dignity in... Well, I other mean, people knowing what to, their rent is. To know is. that someone walks into a door and if that's the building they live in, that they're receiving assistance, does that concern you? Do you think that we need to also look at it sort of a, a more dignified, you know, way of providing? I think it is more dignified than letting them stay on the street another night. Yes. Thank you for for your presentation and for answering my questions. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you for you. your questions. Thanks so much. That's it for questions for you. Um, Thank you, on to speaker. Thank you very much. Council, I thought I'd try to make it to, let's see, we're nine, well, five to nine now. Um, speaker 189, 190, and 191 have all withdrawn. Um, let's just see how we feel if we need a break when we get to number 200. I've got Jerome Yang, 192. Jerome Yang, 192. Uh, speaker 192 is not on the line. Thanks so much. 193 is Christy Long. Uh, speaker 193 is on the line. Um, maybe just call again. <laughs> Hello. Speaker, speaker 193, Christy Long. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yeah. Please go ahead. Oh. Yep, please go ahead. Thank Up to very, five minutes. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak on this housing project. My name is Christy, and I am a resident of Vancouver. I'm opposed to the current supportive housing proposal for this location. If we are checking boxes, we definitely have the box check that this is a good location for social and supporting housing, supported housing. I will be very sad when the trees in this location come down, but that is the conversation for those people that are in the business of saving trees, which I am not. For, from listening to the presentations from BC Housing, the staff, and the operator, it would seem they are dedicated to making this location supported housing but I got the feeling that their passion for the proposed size of the building, studio-style units, and having 129 hard-to-house gentlemen in this location is not quite there. Reflecting on the speakers I've heard over the past few sessions, it sounds like putting supported housing and or social housing in this location is widely accepted. It is having 129 gentlemen that are hard-to-house, having units that do not offer a home feeling and the size of the building that is the struggle or the issue. The operator has, has not managed a building of this size. In turn, I do not believe that I do not believe we are we will be setting the Senate, the, the tenants, pardon me, the tenants nor the operator up for success if the proposed housing is to move forward. If we are to make the building more in the operator's comfort zone, have the tenants more of a mosaic of the people in our city that need social 
or supportive housing and make the building smaller, then we will have our win-win. In closing, I ask for Council to reject this housing project as proposed. As proposed, pardon me. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you for your time tonight. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so I will move to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, 194, Steve Gallagher. Speaker 194 is withdrawn. Thank you. Uh, Ian Poole is speaker number 195. Yeah. I'm just vibing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congrats. You can do that. Uh, speaker number 195, Ian Poole. No, not on the line. Thanks. Speaker number 196, Mark Werner. Hello, uh, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can. Up to five minutes, please. Okay, great. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Mark Werner. I'm a project management professional, and I live, I've lived in Vancouver, Kitsilano, for the past 22 years. I'd like to state that I'm opposed to the CD1 rezoning project application. It has been poorly planned. There are several issues and flaws with this project proposal that should logically lead to the conclusion that it should be rejected at this time as it is currently proposed. There's a myriad of issues related to this project that have been presented by the many thoughtful and intelligent speakers in the community over the past several public hearing sessions. But I will speak to three key areas that I would like to raise where the current proposal fails to meet requirements and needs for the community and causes further concern. First, <clears throat> I was shocked to see that the artist rendering of this project is categorically false. It is misleading and negligent. The presentation of the proposed new building shows that it is situated to the west, directly adjacent to the St. Augustine School, which is located between 7th and 8th Avenue and to the west of Arbuta Street. When the actual location for this project is east of Arbuta Street, which is across the street on the other side of Arbuta Street from what, it, what is actually pictured in the, in the rendering. The artist's rendering should be redone to represent an accurate depiction of the proposed building and its location as part of the new project proposal. If the planners can't get something as simple as an artist rendering to a correct and accurate representation of the project, the saying that seeing is believing causes concerns about what other details have been overlooked or misrepresented that will impact the potential success of this project. Second, the project proposal is not compliant with current zoning bylaws, hence the request for the CD1 rezoning. My understanding, and please excuse me if I am mistaken, is that there was a previously approved proposal for a project on the site that was or on the table a year or two ago that met the zoning bylaws without exceeding the massing and density requirements according to the existing zoning bylaw that would likely be a better and more complementary fit with the rest of the neighborhood context. This current project proposal does not fit within the existing neighborhood context given the lot size relative to the proposed monolithic massing and height and number of units. As with other recent projects that have been approved against the community's wishes, this will once again set a negative precedent for the rest of the area. While BC Housing states that changes and compromises are being made to improve the design and function of this building, this is still doubling the total number of units that are past the allowable capacity based on initial plans and rezoning. Overdensification of projects like this represent the impression of institutionalizing the housing and living conditions for these folks, and this can be done in a better, safer, and more complementary way to the, for this community and for the city. Lastly, and most importantly, the topic of public safety is a major concern. All within the vicinity of this project, within, the one, within a one to three block radius, there's an elementary school with over 400 plus students, a daycare, two playground areas, a parish, and an adjacent first stage recovery house or supportive housing facility, a multi-story and many multi-story apartment and townhouse units throughout the area. This is in addition to current construction plans for Best Loop and Terminus Skytrain stations located at Broadway and Arbuta Street, and a liquor store across the street from the proposed Skytrain station. There are already traffic and parking issues throughout this neighborhood on an ongoing basis, and this was before construction started on the Arbuta Skytrain station. Does it really make sense to add a 13-story building with 129 units in this area to make these problems even worse over the next several years and after these projects have been completed? and to put children and at-risk individuals in this community at even more risk for a public safe, from a public safety standpoint. Let me be clear, <clears throat> I do personally support increasing density with moderation, affordable rental housing, and social and supportive housing. However, this project, this proposal is, is both misrepresentative in design and, and related details, and it is also opposed by the overwhelming majority of the community's wishes. 
I would personally like to request this project to be replanned to the to as to original zoning and capacity specifications and to seriously consider community feedback to reject this project as currently proposed. I strongly urge City Council members to take the facts and data presented by the community into consideration when planning to decide on this proposal. The best way to deal with situations in conflict is problem solving towards a win-win solution for all stakeholders. Please go back to initially approved zoning for the site, rework the project towards a more suitable and complementary solution within the context of everything else that is in this neighborhood. Thank you for your time and listening to, my, to valid concerns by residents such as myself that either live in or frequently visit this neighborhood community and who would like to see a more thoughtful planning process and a more positive outcome to this project proposal that will also be supported within the neighborhood community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions for you, so we're going to move to speaker 197, who is uh, Shermaine Wu. Hello. Shermaine Wu, speaker number. Hi, Hi. there. Uh, Hi there, please good go evening. ahead. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, up to five Yeah, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Shemin Wu. My family and I live in Kislano and I oppose this rezoning. We settled in Kislano because it finally felt like home and was a neighborhood where we could finally have some peace. I say this because we used to live across from the Margaret Fort Apartments in Olympic Village. But first, I just want to say that my family and I had always been supportive of those less fortunate than us. I grew up in low income social housing in Hong Kong. I understand having a roof can really change your life. My husband and I were in support of the Margaret Fort Housing Development providing homes. However, this quickly changed as reality set in. You already heard the previous speakers talk about the continued problems at Margaret Fort. However, I have real life lived experience that still haunts me to today. During the first few years living in our condo, the residents living across the street negatively impact our lives. There were constant screaming, people tossing items over the unit to the ground level, sirens from police and ambulance every night. This was extremely difficult at night when we were trying to get some sleep, when I was a new mom with my newborn baby, and I could not return to work because I could not get enough rest at night. As a result, my mental health deteriorated and was negatively impacted. Over the years, unresolved problems such as discarded needles everywhere outside the building, in alleys and on the common property of neighboring buildings. The operator was only responsible to clean up human feces that were actually on the project's property. Calls made go unanswered. A traumatic incident was when my toddler aged son witnessed someone ODing on the sidewalk. Residents in my building, especially those with children, had to avoid using the streets and sidewalk adjacent to the Margaret Fort building to avoid the people that were loitering around the building who were dealing and using drugs. Break and entering into our building was a common occurrence. Residents in my building, including myself, made numerous and regular calls to the housing operator, which was Rain City. They offered little help to address the issues. As a matter of fact, there were 720 police calls in the initial 16 months of operation. It took over a year for them to put in one security guard in the back of the building when things got really, really bad and a few other changes like closing the back access to, build, to the building. In 2017, a resident of Margaret Ford died in his suite, and his body was not discovered for 17 days. Is this what they mean when they say supportive housing saves lives? Things never got better. We had gotten used to it and maybe even reported incidents less often because nothing was being done about them anyway. From my experience, I can say that once this project is built, it's up to the neighbors the school, the VPD to take care of the problems. Because BC Housing, the Minister of Housing, the city, the agency responsible will have moved on. The CAC has proven to be ineffective as the data show that the police call only decreased by 12% from the first two years since opening and from the present past two years. 
The CAC is only an advisory committee, and they did nothing to help prevent or to make the problems go away. So I'm one of the neighbors that fled the neighborhood of Olympic Village because of the failed supportive housing project that does not provide the kind of services that people suffering from mental illness and addiction require. I do not want to see the neighborhood of Kislano become destroyed in the same way. I want people to have healthy and successful integration within the neighborhood. Please, make BC housing go back, this time with the neighborhood. Together, we can find a model that works. Thank you. Thanks so much. I, I don't see any questions for you, but appreciate you uh, phoning in this evening. Um, Council, I'm going to move to the next speaker, uh, 198, Ramita Sidhu. Ramita Sidhu. Hi there. Yes, hello. Uh, up, hi there. Up to five minutes, please. Hi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ramita Sidhu, and I'm a resident of Vancouver. And I speak on behalf of my husband and two of my children. And I'm here to oppose the proposal. I don't live in the neighborhood, but my daughter, uh, until recently, used to go to the school and in the neighborhood, so I know the area very well. And um, yeah, as uh, the support of housing is clear, I think, to everyone talking here. But the building, in my opinion, is wrong in many ways, like size, planning, financial, social, and even moral aspects. aspects and all of these were talked about prior to me, so I will not go into that. And the uh, original proposal was 140 units exclusively for the use of the hardest house men suffering from addiction and mental health issues. And finally, after a lot of work of, Kitsa, of the Kitsilano coalition and others opposed, different social groups, different social group, groups have been included in the proposal. It seems to me that the people are adjusting to the developer's need and not the other way around, even after um, changing the proposal. Well, though the city has said that uh, they decided to allow families they have not changed the layout of the unit, and I don't understand why not. Because how a family can spread between two or more bedroom or suites, like apart suites. Yeah, it is looks to me like it's just on paper or for show. And then after cutting 11 apartments to lower the height of the building, what was discussed, and um, the finger was pointed the, uh, at the opposition to say, look how you took away homes for, from people. Um, but it didn't have to be the case. In my opinion, if the building had better planning, and I was thinking why not to reduce the cost, increase occupancy, and lower the tendency for those with mental health or addiction issues to isolate by providing common living areas for multiple residents with one kitchen. This could also serve families in, in need now and in the future. And does this not provide a safer, more efficient, and more healthy approach for those who city and busy housing say they are about, uh, they are targeting to live in this building? And doesn't this would help staff to know that someone needs help, for example? And the tagline has been that we are saving lives by giving homes to people in need. And to me, it looks like there is a big factor missing in saving lives. Providing homes doesn't save lives only on its own. People need the support of professionals and caregivers who help them nurture them to back to health, help with their problems, and deal with the issues of addiction. And addiction was widely been recognized as a disease, like a cancer, for example. There needs to be a proper staff and facilities, not only for security and safety, but for a comfortable environment which encourages healing for all residents, instead of isolation, continued addiction, and fractured society. And I have the impression that even those few speakers who support the project barely know that's being proposed and in some ways are voicing their support for the quality of supporting housing that meets the needs of families and women and single parents and effectively 
this is the same thing that many of supporters are saying that like many opposers uh, saying for this project. And the inefficiency and vagueness are summed up nicely by the recent report by Ernst and Young on the BC Housing Corporation. A report that resulted in the very recent firing of the board that worked with the city on this very project. <clears throat> it says, among other things, that BC Housing Corporation suffers from roles and responsibilities that are unclear, that the BC Housing Corporation is lacking in performance, uh, <clears throat> sorry, performance measures, targets, and defined priorities, and it also states Quote, that BC Housing delivers 80 to 85 percent of services through non-profit housing providers and current oversight processes. For these providers are manual and natural in nature with limited ability to objectively assess providers' performance, financial and non-financial, and manage overall risk. Thank you. You are at your five minutes. So I just want to thank you so much for uh, calling in tonight. And uh, there are no questions, so I will. Uh, Yep, thank you. Move on to the next speaker. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have speaker 199, who's listed as Emily. Yes, hello. Good evening. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Emily. Yeah. David. Hello. I, my name is Emily, and I'm grateful to have this opportunity to express my opinion and participate in this conversation in an honest and respectful uh, manner. I want to share a bit of background about myself. I'm a business professional. Thus, I don't earn my living as an architect or city zoning plant policy maker. However, I know that I can lean on the experts, listen to what they say so that I can make some decisions. And that's what I've been doing for the last three years with respect to both the Broadway plan at the Budas and now this, the rezoning at West 7th and West 8th, the application itself. The conclusion I've come to thus far is this. We need supportive housing. We absolutely do. But this current application needs to be revised and enhanced to ensure the long-term success of all stakeholders involved. So why do I say this? Well, there are three reasons. Reason number one, I've learned from Speaker 16, a licensed architect, that the narrow residential sidewalk and the lack of setbacks run completely opposite to skylines and urban design best practices. Reason number two, I've learned from professional engineer, speaker 20, that there is poor quality of uh, traffic planning and there's a lack of infrastructure to support the expected increases of everything from buses to um, emergency vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And I just am concerned and I feel that it is worrisome because it compromises everyone's safety in the area. Reason number three, I understand from Dr. Summers, who is a distinguished professor with years of research in this area, Dr. Summers' research suggests that smaller models of supportive housing could drive better health outcomes for the individuals involved. So as I've said, I've been listening and learning from these experts, and this rezoning application does not make sense to me. This building needs to be much smaller in order to incorporate these experts' opinions and recommendations. I know just like the recent Ernst & Young report that found that there's room, lots of room for improvement at BC Housing, I too find that there's lots of room for improvement in this rezoning application. I urge you as our city councillors to turn down this rezoning application and encourage a new, revised, and enhanced one so that one could be a better one could be developed for all stakeholders involved. Thank you for listening and thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much. I don't see any questions for you. Uh, Council, we're at 9.15. I'm just gonna give everybody uh, five minutes just to stretch and then we'll, we are carrying on till 10 o'clock. We'll come back at uh, 9.21 and uh, begin with uh, speaker uh, 200. Uh, so Council, we'll see you in five minutes.
think I'll just wait for everybody to Two hundred, Adrian Cavanaugh. Adrian Cavanaugh, speaker number two hundred. Not on the line. Thank you, clerks. Uh, the next speaker is two oh one, Whitney Dunn. Whitney Dunn, Good speaker evening, two. Mayor. Yes. Hi there. Please go ahead. Up to five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor Stewart and Council. I'm a resident of Kitsilano, and just so uh, just so I'm clear, my children att attend St. Augustine. I oppose the plan as currently proposed for two reasons. To start, it's a lack of meaningful consultation, particularly, particularly around safety. I understand Council's concern that it wants to stick to matters within its jurisdiction, yet the history of this project is that BC Housing, on its initial consultation, said concerns about uh, the children's safety were premature, it hadn't even submitted its rezoning application. Yet under the current rezoning, looking at the application book, it's silent on the effect of adding 129 uh, residents in support of housing that they, this will have on the neighbors, and particularly the children, at the neighboring St. Augustine School in Delamont Park. The form of this building cannot be severed from its function. It's not an empty monument, but a building to house 129 souls. Indeed, that is the operating motive behind the rezoning application. The application booklet speaks about the importance and safety, sorry, the importance of safety and community of the residents. I agree. Those matter. And the specific needs of neighboring children merit at least as much attention given to those, those concerns for them as the pages devoted to the shadow studies. Until that is done, I urge Council to reject this proposal. The second is that BC Housing has not meaningfully, meaningfully proposed options that both meet its objectives while addressing its neighbors' concerns. I'm not an expert on the power the city has under its rezoning authority. However, the city is here sitting in a position where it is considering the proposal and has the ability to either approve or deny it. I urge the city, perhaps in consultation with BT Housing, to consider options such as requiring retail at grade or for a diverse mix of units, which could include both larger shared units and perhaps market, market rate ones. Other speakers have spoken more knowledgeably about that, but I simply urge the city in considering rezoning to insist on models that work. Until then, I urge the council uh, to reject the proposal as currently drafted. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Thank you for your time today. I, I don't see any uh, questions for you, but thank you so much for uh, calling in. Uh, Council, we're on to speaker number 202, Bryn Hindman. Bryn Hindman, speaker number 202. Yes. Hi there. Please go ahead, up to five minutes. Okay, good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Bryn Hindman. I'm opposed to the housing proposal in its current form. I'm a family physician and my family has lived in Kitsilano for six years at Fifth and Balsam. The current housing proposal is primarily for men and it excludes women and families, citing safety concerns. 
The housing proposal does not consider the safety of the neighbourhood and the surrounding area. What about the safety of everyone? The proposed residents who qualify for this housing project are often struggling with more than one diagnosis, a mental health disease and an addiction. Like all of us, these individuals need more than four walls and a common laundry area. Time and again, congregate housing has demonstrated that these individuals atrophy and degenerate in a housing proposal such as this one. What that means for them and our community is worse worse health outcomes and little management of their mental health and or addiction diagnosis. In fact, research shows their physical and mental and emotional health can often atrophy. I know we can do better and find long-term solutions and support for some of the most vulnerable of our population. Mayor and Council, I urge you to stop this project in its current format. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, time this evening. Uh, I am going to go to the next speaker, speaker number 203, uh, Ben Hume. Hello. Hi there, up to five minutes, please. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Ben Hume. I'm a Vancouver resident and was born in the VGH 74 years ago. Thank you for the opportunity to provide commentary on the supportive projects proposed for 7th and Arbutus. I'm speaking in opposition to the project as it currently is proposed. My reasons are as follows. The project location is not optimal given the neighborhood. An elementary school 18 minutes, 18 meters west of the building and a public playground 18 meters north of the project along with a women's supportive home, Santa Maria House, immediately next door. Add to this mix a SkyTrain terminus located at Arbutus and Broadway, which history has shown bring their own challenges, seems to me a less than ideal situation. The proposed building is too large for the type of residence it's meant to serve. Anything I have read suggests that five to max six stories is much more appropriate. Reducing the size of the building would have an added, be added benefit of respecting the, uh, respecting the availability of light to the neighbors in the area. The proponents are asking council to approve a very complex project without any operational support commitments that will provide the neighbors and council with assurances that the project will work well in the neighborhood. Added to this is the fact that there is no evidence-based research to support such a project, but there is for but there is for smaller or scattered housing pro approaches. Why would we go down a, a road that has no scientific support? We need supportive housing in our city, but we need projects that actually benefit the proposed resident, based uh, based in the, in the long run. In order for that to happen, the neighborhood has to be supportive. Based on the information received to date, I don't think there's a basis for the neighborhood to get behind the project. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Uh, I don't see any questions for you. Appreciate all you calling in uh, at this late hour. We have uh, next uh, 204 and uh, speaker 204 and Goldman. Speaker 204 has withdrawn. Thank you. Uh, Speaker 205, Jane McCarney is next. Hello. Hi there. Uh, you're a little faint, but you have uh, up to five minutes. Okay, is that better? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Great. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm speaking to you tonight as a 20-year resident of Kitsilano. I live four blocks from the proposed project. My daughter attends a nearby school and attended a nearby preschool before that. We have also spent many hours in Delamont Park. In other words, this is our neighborhood. I'm also a public health professional and understand systemic barriers that result in inequities in society. I understand the importance of and fully support the concepts of housing first, harm reduction, supports for mental health and addiction, and the need for wraparound services. I've also 
understand the ways in which we build our neighborhoods and design our buildings to promote or deter health. I'm strongly opposed to this proposal. Like many speakers you've heard from over the four days of hearings, this is my first time speaking at a council meeting. Like the others, I was motivated to speak because of the potential long-term implications of this 60-year lease. I'm opposed to the proposal for the following three reasons. The impacts on pedestrian safety, the built form that does not fit the space, and the lack of consideration for neighborhood populations who are not able to advocate for themselves. As you have heard from many speakers, this is a busy part of Arbutus with two, two school crosswalks, a bike lane, and a median on 7th. The bus loop is currently under construction and will bring a bus every three minutes at peak times, along with associated rideshare cars and taxis. This coincides with school arrival and departure time. To add this proposed project to this already congested area with the potential for a significant increase in vehicular traffic from service vehicles and first responders does not make sense and, put and puts neighboring populations at risk. Young children do not have the ability to safely navigate complicated intersections. Their small stature makes them less visible to cars. They aren't able to judge the speed of cars like adults can, making them more prone to crossing in front of speeding cars. They also aren't able to take in information from potentially four directions to make a sound judgment on when it is safe to cross. I personally have seen a number of near misses in this area. One of the scariest was witnessing an in impatient driver drive in the opposite lane on Arbutus to pass six cars stopped at the pedestrian crosswalk. He turned left onto seventh, almost missing a pedestrian who rightfully didn't look over their shoulder for a car coming in the wrong direction. One step earlier and that person would have been potentially injured for life. Don't let that be one of our neighborhood children. Consider the cum cumulative impacts of this proposal, along with the current road safety issues and future bus loop. Number two, the built form does not fit the space. It is too imposing in height and width for this small, as others have referred to it as, postage stamp of a property. Nor does it follow good design principles, leaving little room for setbacks. The section of Arbutus has a narrow sidewalk to begin with. This building will feel even more imposing, as one speaker put it, will come crashing, crashing down to the sidewalk. And tonight, city staff indicated that sidewalks would be widened to 10 feet, as is consistent with other SkyTrain locations. Widening the sidewalks will mean narrowing Arbutus Street. Does this make sense? I'm also opposed to the model of construction steel structures which leave no room for adapting the interior of the building in the future, say for example if families were incorporated into the composition. City staff indicated families would have to live in separate rooms. Really? Is this how you would want to live with your family? In a separate room down the hall or on another floor? This is not equity. This is discrimination. Density can be created through other designs. I ask council to, to reject this proposal and have staff go back to the drawing board to design a building that fits the scale of this property and reduces the shadowing. And number three, the needs of vulnerable neighborhood populations who are not able to advocate for themselves have not been taken into consideration. This proposal has the potential to put their safety and health at risk namely from the shadowing causing icing in the winter, which could contribute to falls and to mental health from lack of exposure to sunshine for long periods of time, especially in the winter. To conclude, I ask council to reject this proposal. This model is flawed in its current form and needs to go back to the drawing board with input from all community voices. As you've heard from many speakers over the last uh, four hearings, this community supports supportive housing, but we want it to to fit into the current community and in a composition that we can work with um, so that it is successful for all residents. Thank you. Thank you. That is the five minutes. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I don't see any questions. So I'm going to move uh, on to the next speaker, uh, Council Speaker 206 and Speaker 207 have withdrawn. So we're on Speaker 208 now, Susan Smith. Uh, no, not on the line. Thank you. Uh, we are going to go to Beth Hayward, 209. Speaker uh, 209. 
Uh, speaker 209 has withdrawn. Okay, thank you. Speaker 210 is Aaron Graham. No. Okay, Speaker 211 is just uh, one name, Amy. Uh, no, not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 212 is Cheryl Webster. No, not on the line. Thank you. 213 uh, is Alina Pagosian. A no. Thank you. 214 is uh, Tadana, Tadana uh, Shercat. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that. No, not on the line. Speaker 215 is Kevin Craig. No, not on the line. 216 is Andronic. One name, Andronic. No, not on the line. Oh, no, no, they're on 216, but there's nobody there, so. Sorry, uh, speaker, uh, who's speaking there? Uh, okay, um, that might be the moderator. I'm just going to keep going through the list. We have uh, speaker 217, James Jack. Um, uh, Mayor, sorry, um, it's the clerk here. Can you just pause for one moment? Uh, we're just going to okay. check the, the last person. Okay, great. Thank you very much, clerks. Mayor, it's the clerk again. We, we are yep. just checking on two unidentified callers, so it will just take a moment. Okay, great. Thanks, clerks.
Um, Mayor, it's, um, uh, we've been advised that we can proceed to the next speaker on the list. Okay, we just have uh, about 15 minutes left. So we have, uh, I'm gonna call James Jack again, speaker number 217. No, not on the line. Thank you. 218, Silva Sirwart. No, not on the line. 219, Rita Mitchell. Uh, no, uh, Speaker 219 is not in the chamber okay, or on the line. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have Lauren Arnold, Speaker 220. No, uh, not on the line. Thanks. Speaker 221, Katrina Stein. Yes. Great. Katrina Stein, give up the five minutes whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, I was born and raised in Vancouver, and I'm speaking in opposition to the proposal. I've worked in the neighborhood for the past 16 years, and 10 years ago, I moved into the immediate area. I have a young family, and the neighborhood is our backyard. Um, we've watched it evolve over the years, and we've grown with it. Uh, you know, I met other neighborhood moms at the Delmont Park. We became friends. I've pushed my daughter on the swings. I even taught my daughter how to ride her bike on the Greenway. And the neighborhood is an extension of our home, a necessity as we live in an apartment. So it, I consider this immediate area our home. And I walk my daughter to and from school daily, and sometimes I need to walk by the proposed site multiple times a day. My daughter plays at the park at least five times a week. This building is going to directly impact our family. I've listened throughout all of the public hearings, and I've rewritten my comments numerous times now. You know, new information has come to light, and I'm unsure of really what to, to talk on, but I have three main concerns that I like to share in regards to the proposal because it's going to impact this future state will impact my family, our community, but most importantly, it's my daughter. My first concern is how the proposal is going to affect the meeting immediate surroundings regarding congestion and safety because kids are unpredictable. The current state, which we are currently dealing with, um, there's a tremendous amount of volume for a small neighborhood with a two-lane traffic. People from the neighborhood go to and from work, live their lives, and they go to school. Then you have commuters using West Broadway and Arbutus to navigate the city. Then there's the families that are driving or walking for drop-off and pickup of their kids to the elementary school and the preschool. People walking their dogs, bike commuters, people on e-scooters on the Greenway. These are just some of like the everyday daily users of the streets and surrounding areas. And when traffic is bad at busy times or guess what, a truck needs to stop to back up uh, or to turn or an emergency vehicle uh, is required to navigate the tight corridor, everything comes to a standstill. And I have seen road rage manifest from, you know, just yelling out of the car to a confrontation. And it's, can be overwhelming. Traffic is really bad there. I stand at that, you know, pedestrian crosswalk on a daily basis, and I need to navigate it myself and with my daughter. Um, and I can see the frustration that builds with the drivers, especially during school days, um, if they're coming during the busy time. Uh, and now consider the deluge of people who are going to be unloading from the Terminus Skytrain station to trek across the street to catch their bus at the bus loop or make their way into the neighborhood. And looking at the rendering of the proposed building, the main access point of the building is on 7th. And like I just mentioned, I've stood at that cross section right in front of where those doors likely will be. I can tell you at peak times, it's stressful walking there, especially with a child who's unpredictable. And she may want to run out to go see a friend to say hi, or she wants to run back home for whatever reason, um, or she just wants to play tag, and or she wants to run across the street to the park. And frankly, even my best intentions, I have to also, um, you know, keep my hand on her and just make sure we're always holding hands because kids are unpredictable. But then I also look at 
the renderings, I see that the driveway for the building to the garage entrance is going to be on our Judas Street. So, like, is this where the service vehicles are going to come, you know, for the garbage and recycling? You know, are they going to have to sit on the street to pull out the bins and drivers going to get more upset? You know, there's no laneway. There's no alley. And if we look at data from comparable housing, we can expect a similar pattern of increased police ambulance. This proposal is going to exasperate the traffic congestion we already have. I don't know how emergency vehicles are going to make it to that front entrance. There's like a median or a meridian in between um, when you cross the street at 7. So I'm not sure. Are they going to have to come through the neighborhood? Are they going to go down Arbutus? You know, I'm unsure. The next concern I have is reviewing the shadow studies um, and to see what's going on. You're just at five minutes. I know it goes quick, uh, but did want to thank you uh, for calling in tonight. I don't, uh, I, I don't see any questions for you, so I just will thank you for calling in. And, uh, and I am going to move to the next speaker. Council, we're at uh, 9.48, so maybe we have enough time for two more. Uh, we have Edmund Hensel, speaker 222. No, not on the line. We have J Chu two twenty three. J two, sorry, J Chu two twenty three. Uh, speaker two twenty three is indicated to be here in person. They are not here, not and they're not on the line either. Okay, thank you. Uh, speaker two twenty four has withdrawn. Speaker two twenty five is Cheryl Stein. Sorry, Steen. I'm Cheryl here. Steen. Hi there. Up to five minutes, please. Hi, my name is Cheryl Stein. Uh, you said it right. First, I have an important question before I begin of Mayor Stewart. Is this school across the site Christian St. Augustine? Uh, this isn't um, this isn't a question and answer format at this stage in the uh, in the process. Uh, we are just listening to your statements at this at this point. Okay, I just wondered if it was Christian because with caller zero to up till now, it hasn't sounded very Christian so far. And just well, to be not, clear, uh, let's not comment I'm on. Let, let's not comment on 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 folks and their dispositions. Let's just focus on the uh, on the project at hand. Okay. Also, before I begin, I speak for the vulnerable, which for obvious reasons are very underrepresented here with this topic. Can I please get 10 minutes to say all I need to say in their defense? If not, can I please field questions at the end by council so I can be an example and thorough representation of the vulnerable? This housing is for making this Dudley somewhat imbalanced process a little more equal. One lady had 20 minutes overall who represented the school. You just have the five minutes uh, this evening. Okay. Okay, I will begin. My name is Cheryl and I am vulnerable. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for your time and consideration, especially your time. This application should be a non-issue in chambers. I voted Green Party and voted for Kennedy Stewart. I am a voter. Yes, I voted for Gregor, too. I strongly, strongly support this application and the applicant MPA, who is a superstar at doing what they do, and BC Housing and the city. For example, um, just P.S. EB knows what he talks about, will be the next premier of BC. Adrian, I just wish to say you are a superstar as you show up for work every day and work. You set an example of service and you put your heart and mind into things. Thank you. So why are we here today and so invested with our time and resources? Why ask the community? Why is this one so special? One word, stigma, rich kits. Also about liability from the hack lawyer. It doesn't have to be a perfect system. Just that you did try to avoid negligence, so no liability, city. I think okay, the clear okay, solution. Just, actually, yeah, I'm just going to caution you on on using terms like hack lawyer. That is kind of a comment, you know, a personal affront. So I would just just try to stay, okay. uh, you know, neutral in when you're talking about folks. Okay, I'll try to be neutral. Not that they've been. Um, I think the clear solution after listening to everybody, first off and first and foremost, and is the solution is to have MPA, who, as I say, is a superstar, screen as best they can with the tool, which is called VAT. 
And I agree with Adrian that this could be the solution and an amendment for this to resolve this this issue um, where um, they could screen for drug use and have this as a stipulation being so close to the school. And I think this would resolve a lot of issues and a lot of the bullying that have been happening towards uh, mental health people being criminals and whatnot. We need this housing, and not all mental people use drugs. I speak today for the vulnerable. And um, I also implore MPA to also make 80 to 90 one-bedrooms with allowing pets and just for mental without drug use and for no drug use outside the perimeter. And I think this would be a big solution. I speak today for the vulnerable. People are in the gallery clapping and complaining, but they have never been homeless. I've been homeless. Who am I? I am brave along with anyone who has slept on the street. We are survivors, not demons or criminals like the Kitts Gallery has made out. I have put my face on cold, hard, cold, hard cement when I was homeless. Have you? This building is better than a cold, hard cement sidewalk as a home. I am a professional international cardiac tech with pre-med from UBC, and I have bipolar. And I put people like you kids, residents, on treadmills to see if you have a heart attack. My job is to prevent this happening. This is me and my job, and I am vulnerable, and I've been homeless twice. Most recently, this past summer, because of an illegal lockout. I live on $10,000 a year for 20 years now. I must emphasize I am not a threat nor a criminal, just low income and disabled. And no, I don't do drugs. And there's lots of me like this. I represent the voiceless, the vulnerable. Well, half of the kids' neighborhood living on eighty to 120000 a year signed up to speak. I represent thousands who cannot get to their computer, too busy surviving on the streets during a drug-induced state. I represent thousands, thousands. I've been patiently waiting to be Speaker 225 too, listening to all the stigma and hate speech from parents beforehand, drilled into my sensitive head and others listening, and further furthering cementing stigma, which we work so hard to undo. We work hard like the gays and indigenous to undo stereotypes and hate. The stigma hate out there is still huge. We must be strengthened numbers like West End was for days. MPA screens people, and no one with criminal records of children will be allowed. I can almost guarantee it. I live in a private building on 13th and Birch, 18, year now, 18 years now, near VGH. My landlord is Stilton Management, an Asian owner hiring Pacific Asset Management Company who has been trying to evict me the past 10 years because of my mental disability. Not my fibromyalgia, but because of my bipolar, which bipolar means I'm just a little up and a little down. Mike, the maintenance guy, threatened my life recently, and the landlord purposely killed my beloved rescue cat of 14 years last summer with an illegal lockout, still going to RTB this summer, this September. This people is criminal and knows he does not suffer mentally. Remember, I gave Gregor Robertson his platform for homelessness in 2008. He did nothing. We must move on it now. We need these 10 or 20 of these buildings in around Vancouver, especially as downtown east side experience gentrification. Most importantly, I speak for all homeless and vulnerable. They are not able to speak today and wait two to four weeks to speak and open like myself who has nothing to lose. This housing works and so does BC Housing and MPA is stellar, the best non nonprofit in Vancouver to help the homeless. I have now created and redesigned a bra with world patents and I'm a billionaire in the waiting. This is thanks to housing and MPA. If you'd like to invest, call me. You will remember from the other callers as I struggle, but I am successful. It is simply because MPA has supported me. I went by this. Hey, I am going to stop you. I, I am. I am going to stop you there because you are over time. But you do have a question from uh, Councillor Dejanova. Councillor Dejanova, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thanks for the presentation. I'm wondering, do you feel that it would be more appropriate to be more inclusive and have? family housing here like what we've heard from others in the community is that they're not against having low-income uh, housing or people living at shelter rates and I mean I kind of understand that I worked in non-market housing for over a decade and have housed people at 375 so I, I get what you're saying I'm just wondering do you think that that should also be expanded to include families so the parents aren't losing their children or choosing to give them up to go into this type of housing? Well, um, I thank you for the question. I appreciate that. I think the first focus is getting homelessness, like the, um, 
Gregor Robertson was supposed to tackle in 2008, like I gave him a platform for. Um, its its focus is for the mental and people. I I, I don't want to see people doing drugs on that property for sure. Um, but I would think it's for the mental first and foremost. If they have families, I would like to see them housed. Number one. But is it for family or low income? That's not the focus. The focus is a mix. Yes. Okay. But- can I ask, so if there are parents struggling, and as a city councillor, I've had a mom come to me who is terrified and said to me, and I, I hooked her up through our city staff, kudos to them, who said to me, I am, am completely uh, freaked yep. out and concerned that me and my small children, and I met her small children, were homeless. Just need a question. So uh, we, that is Mayor, I'm leading up, and I have up to five yeah. minutes. Thank you so yeah, much. We only have two minutes. It's yeah, two I'm minutes to ten. So, so I'm just wondering so if what I what I do need to extend uh, to hear from this speaker and questions. If you'd like that, yeah. would, that would be great. Thank you. Extend here. Seconder. I heard for Hardwick. All in favor? Yay. 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 Opposed? Nay. Thank you. Continue, uh, Councillor Dejanova. Thanks so much, and thanks, Mayor. I understand we we're getting close, but. I'm just wondering, I'm giving you that story for a little bit of context because I, in my experience as a counselor and understanding that we're a quasi-judicial body, I've seen, you know, people who are invisible, who are homeless, that are families because they're afraid to come forward. They're afraid they will lose their children if they admit their homelessness. So do you think that it's important that we also give families an opportunity, especially if parents are struggling with mental health, the opportunity you know, to live in family size units with those supports. I understand your question and thank you. Um, I think it's fair to give um, precedence first to the mental people who are single, but also to include the families, yes. Um, But you know what, let's leave it in MPA's capable hands. They have a roster of clients that they would be placing. And I really think there should be a few one bedrooms, if not all one bedrooms to fit situations like a family. Um, one or two bedrooms, and I think it needs to be rethought out and maybe 90 units of one bedroom, allowing pets and kids. But you got to think about, do do parents want to live with their kids in such a building? And I say such a building without stigma. It's not warehousing people, and it's not a band-aid solution by any stretch. It's giving homes to people who are without homes, and it's giving support because there's lots of support in the building, lots of support for crises that these people are worried about. Lots of support in the building to give to people who live in the building. So do I see families in it? I would like them to have families, but I would leave it in MPA and BC Housing's capable hands of picking the families and the right people for it being so close to a school. Is it close to a school? Yes. Does that concern everybody? Yes. So let's tackle that situation. Let's make some rules. Let's make some rules around drug use around the perimeter. Let's not let so many drug users in. Um, Let's focus on mental people who are clean and don't do drugs like myself who need a place to live. I live in private housing right now, and they can't wait to get me out. It's not it's not La La Land because there's stigma out there in the private community. And when they discover you're a mental person in a regular building, they want you evicted, and it's hell. It's pure I'm hell. I've been fighting for 10 years. I'm sorry you've had to go through that, and thanks for answering my questions, and I appreciate that you came with some solutions tonight. So I'll leave it there. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Carr has you, questions Mary. for – sorry, uh, quite, Councillor Carr has questions as well. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for, um, for speaking to us and speaking from experience. It really makes a difference to hear that. Um, so I'm I'm interested in what you were saying. I know drug use around the perimeter, and 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 I know that you said clearly too that um, uh, that it would be maybe better to not. Um, maybe you should need to clarify this, but better not to have as many people with drug use issues. My question, though, around the drug use, um, do you know if it would be, or in your experience, do you think it would be better if there was? Um, if there were people with uh, drug addiction issues, if there was a safe supply within the building so that um, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be people pushing drugs on the outside. Yes, I understand your question thoroughly that um, 
this may exist, and we have to tackle that with a solution rather than screaming about it. And I believe probably wholeheartedly if there was a safe supply within the building, like an on-site, um, that it would be monitored closely and it wouldn't be out in the open and these people could still get their fix and the help they need. My understanding is people who are, have drug use and drug problems, when they get housing, they get cleaned up pretty quick because there's called stability. And they realize, I mean, every drug person wants to get off drugs, let's face it. It's just that your body withdraws, you get sick, it's a hard process. So if there was a safe drug supply within the building, which could be monitored and looked after, I think, um, Adrian and I applaud you on that. I think that's also a solution. We want to find solutions because this will never be perfect. It's just that we need this housing like 10 years ago and we can't wait on it. And yes, the money will go away if it's not spent. Okay. okay. Thank you. Really appreciate your insight. Thank yeah, you so much I, for I, your... yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your time this evening. I don't see any more questions for you, but really appreciate you, uh, you providing your perspective tonight. That's uh, very important. Uh, thanks again, uh, Council. We're going to stop there. Uh, we have uh, we are on speaker number two twenty six, and uh, we will we will be recessing this evening, and uh, we'll be returning to this item. Just make sure I get this right. A little punch drunk here. Um, we'll be returning this item on. Where are we? Uh, July twenty fifth at three p.m. Uh, clerks, hey, Mayor. anything else? Uh, sorry, Speaker, we're we're just uh, we're just concluding here this evening. Uh, clerks, is there anything else I, that we need to do? Uh, Mayor, no, there's uh, nothing more to be done. We've recessed the meeting to reconvene on Great. July 25th. Great at 3 p.m. Thank you so much, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon. Good night. Thanks, staff. Thanks, Mayor.